Tune in to nostalgia. Tune in to now. Golden Radio Hour. WDAF, Kansas City. Dan Henry, WDAF Local News at 11. The outlook for Kansas City, mild. The Missouri House and Senate are meeting in extra sessions tonight in order to attempt to find agreement on the state's $2 billion budget. And there's talk that budgetary committees could be working all night. If Kansas City's area construction is to be stopped tomorrow by a full-scale strike, no one is saying so. Representatives of ten major construction unions met behind closed doors today but made no mention of an intended strike at the close of the meeting. Today, pickets were posted at several construction sites, stopping work on the Crosby Kemper Memorial Arena and the new convention center complex in downtown Kansas City. School teacher strike talks continue under the auspices of federal mediator Beryl Carlew. Today, teacher union president Norman Hudson was escorted from the Jackson County Jail to a negotiating session, then returned to his cell. The strike will be 38 days old tomorrow with no immediate end in sight. On the hour from American Information Radio. This is Merrill Muller in Los Angeles, and at this hour, the Miami Herald Tuesday edition reports that President Nixon will risk impeachment and refuse to meet the House Judiciary Committee subpoena for 42 tapes and documents. The Miami Herald quotes an unnamed Republican source as saying the President is ignoring the advice of Republican leaders because he's confident of winning a Senate trial. The deadline on the committee's subpoena is Thursday. Meantime, the committee has sent a new message to the White House asking for other information. Chairman Peter Odino told us in Washington there's even more to come. I can say that it's not unlikely that requests will be going out. I instructed our counsel to uh, specify what those requests are, and uh, those requests would cover the areas that are within the general scope of our inquiry. But Chairman Rodino also emphasized that future requests on the White House will have to be approved by the entire House Judiciary Committee. Democratic governors and congressmen talk of tax cuts. That story coming up. This is Joan Crawford speaking for USO, United Service Organization. Do we as civilians know what it's like to be far from home in a foreign land? Listen to this real-life documentary about one of our servicemen over there. Do you speak English? Nein, ich spreche kein Englisch. Uh-oh. Excuse me, ma'am. I wonder if you could help me. Nein, es tut mir leid. Excuse me, miss. Can you help me? Leider nicht. Bitte schön. Yes, sir. Uh, do, you, do you speak English? Nein, nein. Excuse me. Can you help me? Nein, nein. Excuse me. Can anybody help me? Hi, we sure can. This is the USO. We have all kinds of help. That's why I support USO, and you should too. USO makes a man feel closer to home while he's serving his country for you. Isn't money the least you can give? Please support USO. Fifteen Democratic governors meeting in Chicago have urged Congress to write a tax relief plan for low- and middle-income families, despite any objections by the administration. Correspondent Bob Clark has more on the talk of tax cuts in Washington. It may just be spring fever, but sentiment for cutting taxes was bursting out all over on Capitol Hill today. During their Easter vacation, many members of Congress found the folks at home on the brink of rebellion over the combination of high taxes and runaway inflation. With the growing fear of recession adding to the gloomy economic picture, there's a sudden groundswell of support in Congress for tax relief to stimulate the economy. The Senate's Democratic leader, Mike Mansfield, says he's all for it. A proposal by Democratic Senators Mondale and Kennedy to raise the personal exemption and thus reduce everybody's income taxes is drawing sudden support from other members of Congress, including some key Republicans. Bob Clark, ABC News, Washington. Veterans Administrator Donald Johnson has announced he will submit his resignation in the near future. Congressional leaders said after a White House meeting today, Johnson had already lost some authority in a department reorganization. American Telephone and Telegraph Board Chairman John DeButts has revealed in Atlanta that AT&T is seeking a 20-cent rate for paid telephones and a 10-cent charge for information in all states where it has not yet been approved. 
Indonesia's Minister of Communications has announced some survivors have been found at the site of a Pan American Airlines crash on the island of Bali. No numbers are announced. The plane reportedly fell with 107 persons aboard on its landing approach to Bali on Flight 812 from Hong Kong to Australia. Postal service to Canada has been halted at the request of the Ottawa government because of the strike by Canadian postal workers. This is Information Radio News. Senator Henry Jackson in a New York speech has urged the Nixon administration to seek a new agreement with the Soviet Union, sharply reducing nuclear missiles. Senator Jackson charged that U.S. security is endangered by administration efforts to reach what he called a cosmetic arms agreement this June. The head of the Petroleum Exporters Association has announced at the United Nations that oil prices will remain fairly stable until October, and then if inflation is worse, oil prices will go up again. From the Kurt Murr Sports Desk, the Kansas City Royals lost to the Boston Red Sox 4-1 to tonight. They'll try again tomorrow. The St. Louis Cardinals were idle today. They'll host Houston tomorrow. The Milwaukee Bucks play Chicago, and the Bucks uh, leading the best of seven series 3-1. to And the Kansas City Omaha Kings forward Ron Behagen has been named to the NBA All-Rookie Team for 1974. The Kansas City outlook fair and cool tonight with a low around 45, then mostly fair and warmer tomorrow with a high in the middle to upper 70s. Dan Henry. WDAF News. The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. Welcome to the world of terrifying imagination. The fear you can hear. Somebody said it, I believe, or if he didn't, he should have. The world is neither good nor bad. Tis wishing makes it so. Our story is about a fey, elfin young woman who made her own world and who had a disturbing and fateful capacity to make her dreams come true. Not always in exactly the fashion or the dimension she wished for. I'm warning you, you stop hanging on to me, Marge. I got to, Tom. You just can't do it to us anymore. Just lay off of me. Tom, you can't do this again. Then I got the lock tonight. I can feel it all going for me. The way you always feel. Please. Marge, let go. You want to put the whammy on me? I said... Tom, you let go. <laughs> I didn't mean to push it. Oh, Lord. Ma? Ma? Ma! Pa, you killed her, Pa! You killed her dead! Our mystery drama, The Wishing Stone, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Ian Martin and stars Clarice Blackburn and William Prince. It is sponsored in part by the Kellogg Company, makers of Kellogg's Special K cereal, and by new sugar-free diet 7-Up. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Hello, Ms. Goldilocks here, and welcome to my professional taste-testing laboratory. Oh, Papa Bear, mm -hmm. could you bring that case of sugar-free Diet 7-Up over here? Another case? Ms. Goldilocks, you're drinking this sugar-free Diet 7-Up like there's no tomorrow. You can't still be taste-testing it. Oh, no, Papa Bear. Sugar-free Diet 7-Up has already earned my seal of approval. It's fresh, light, natural. Delicious. I drink it because I love its taste. Now hurry up. Okay, okay, here. Mm-hmm. This sugar-free diet 7-Up really tastes delicious. Ladies, if you're tired of switching from one diet drink to another, take some advice from Ms. Goldilocks. Try sugar-free diet 7-Up and you'll say, Yes, this one's just Right. I'll bear witness to that, Goldie. <laughs> <laughs> 
Project Hope is reaching out, bringing hope to more countries around the world this year than ever before. Newest addition to Hope's international programs is Ethiopia, where Project Hope's doctors, nurses, and other medical specialists will be working side by side with Ethiopians, teaching while they treat. Since 1960, Hope has trained more than 7,000 physicians, dentists, nurses, and other health care personnel has helped establish new schools of nursing, dentistry, and physical therapy in several countries and assisted in the development of hospitals, teaching institutions, and public health services. Hope's work has been heralded by heads of many nations. Its services requested by many, many more. Hope is training and sharing. Hope is treating and caring. Health is what hope's all about. Help Project Hope reach out. Hope Reach Out. Right. Project Hope, Room A, Washington, D.C. We are such stuff as dreams are made on, and our little life is rounded with a sleep. That quote is definitely Mr. Shakespeare's. But our little life is equally founded, and sometimes confounded, on dreams. Like the bad one Jenny Coulter had a few moments ago, and for which, fortunately, there is present comfort in the person of her mother, and in turn, her brother Judd. Jenny, you all right? It's you, Ma. You. Oh, you all right? Well, I'm fine, honey. Would you have a bad dream? I suppose. Oh, now that I see you. Oh, Ma, it was so real. I saw you lying there at the bottom of the stairs, and and your head, oh, it was turned to the side like, oh, like... Oh, well, now, oh. now, don't let it upset you. Here I am, right as rain, and it was only a dream. But it was just like I saw it happen. He pulled his arm away from him while you were hanging on, and you went tumbling down. Oh. He? Who's he? I... I don't want to talk about it. Oh, was it your father? Yes. Who else would it be? Judd, wh what are you doing up? I heard Jenny Lou cry out. Oh, it was just a bad dream is all. You woke cases? I'm just fine now. You go on back to bed now, son. What did you dream the old man did to Ma, Jenny? Ma was trying to stop him from going out gambling again. And he sort of pushed her off him like... And she tumbled all the way downstairs. Oh, that's enough fussing about nothing now. You get back to bed, Judd. Okay. Good night, Jenny. Good night, Judd. Uh, you, you want I should close the door, Ma? No, I'm coming back to bed myself right away. You're not scared no more, are you, honey? No. As long as I know you and Judd are close by. But I sure was scared. No. Oh. My baby, you're just so sensitive. Everything touches you close like a little old butterfly sitting on a leaf with your feelers reaching out all a tremble. I like being butterfly. That's a pretty sort of thing to think on. So you just keep thinking on it and hustle yourself back to sleep. Good night, Jenny. Good night, Ma. I love you. And I love you. Sleep tight. Ma? <gasps> Sakes alive, Judd. You like to startle me out of my wits. Come away from Jenny's door. I thought I told you to go on back to bed. Was you and Pa having an argument again tonight? When? Well, right now. That that she might have heard. Your father isn't even here. He went on out after you kids went to bed. Yeah, I bet he's over to stove is playing poker. Oh, Tom don't mean what he does. He's sick. Yeah, and so am I. I'm sick of him. <laughs> here in the kitchen, uh, Dr. Luther. How's Jenny? Jenny Lou's just fine, Marge. She's getting dressed, and I'm going to drop her off at school on my way into town. It ain't the encephalitis again. You got to stop worrying about that, Marge. It's not so easy. After last year, getting put back one grade after missing all her classes. It won't take her long to jump back where she belongs. That's a right smart little girl. She used to be before. Uh, that's what I want to talk to you about. If I've told you once, I've told you half a dozen times that Jenny was one of the lucky ones. 
she came through it without a scratch, physical or mental. But such a long time. It was a very mild case, even if it was stubborn and protracted. It's just I worry so that she... She was somehow held back. Now, I want you to get that clean out of your mind, once and for all. But sometimes she seems so... so young. <laughs> Lord, what do you want her to be at 16? I don't know of anyone fresher and lovelier and more unspoiled than your little girl. She wants to cling to childhood a little longer. Leave her be. Well, just so you're sure last year didn't hurt her none. There's only one thing I worry about with Jenny. What? Your husband. Lord knows why, but she thinks the sun rises and sets in her father. Once she settles for being a woman, she'll have to open her eyes as to what he really is. Oh, Tom doesn't mean to hurt anyone, Doctor. You told me yourself that he's sick. Yeah, I think it is a kind of sickness. But not one a doctor can treat. What am I going to do? I don't know, Marge. Oh, uh, one thing I do know is I've got to go. People waiting at the office, but... Tom is hurting all of you. Bad. Worse, maybe, than any of you realize. And in the end, Jenny will lose the one he'll hurt most of all. <laughs> Judd, that you? Oh, yeah, Ma. Is Jenny with you? Well, no, Ma. Oh, where you been? Baseball practice. Well, why'd you think Jenny was with me? Because she didn't come home after school. Judd, it isn't like her to just take off. You don't suppose she... Well, she what, Ma? That dream shook her up. And Tom and me had another bad set to this morning. She wouldn't run away. Jenny? From us? Uh, no way. Well, she was sort of strange when she left this morning with Dr. Luther. Kind of, I don't know, excited as if she had some secret plan. You know how she gets. Uh, secret? Yeah. I bet I know where she is. Where? Well, I, I, I can't tell you. I mean, it's her own secret place. Only, well, the only reason I know about it is I was out rabbit hunting one day and I stumbled across it. She goes there to bird watch and, well, just to be alone, I guess. Now, she made me promise I, I'd never tell just where. I'll bring her home. Jenny? Jenny? Jenny, what, what are you doing hiding out here? I wasn't hiding. I just came here to... to say a little prayer. But for who? Pa. Oh? And the sun was shining in like a big splinter of light, the way it does through the hole in the tree up there. Remember how I always used to think when we was little kids that it was God stretching down his hand to touch us? <laughs> yeah. It was a long time ago. Don't say that. Because he is there. He was here today. Leastways, one of his angels was. What? I was kneeling and looking up into the sun... And all of a sudden, the birds was all still. And the whole hidey hole here filled up with golden light that sparkled and spun. And right over there, he was standing. Who? Him. The angel of the Lord. And I could feel him all around me, in me, warm and kind. So kind. Then he touched my hand and smiled and just faded away. And then I looked in my hand and I saw it. Oh, wait, I didn't lose it. Oh, no, here. This is what I found in my hand. Well, let's see. Well, what is it? It's a conjure stone, all gold and shiny. A stone I can wish on. The angel said that? He didn't have to. I heard the words inside me. You can wish on this, Jenny. You can have anything you want in the whole wide world. You just don't believe this is a wishing stone, Ma, do you? 
Jenny, right to the moment, I just got to say I'm so fussed and fumed about dinner being ready and you kids not and your father ain't home. I can't hardly think straight about... Oh, Lordy, if my biscuits have risen, we're just going to have to sit and eat without Tom. Jenny, don't bother my right now. I just want to try my wishing stone. Wish something nice for her. Well, let's just hold up for a, a better time. I could wish Pa to hurry home. So we wouldn't have to wait. I don't want to wait none at all. I got a math test tomorrow. I just got to pass or I don't make the ball team, and I need every minute to study. <laughs> Except who am I kidding? If I stayed up all night, I wouldn't be ready for tomorrow. If you had a few more days, could you make it? Well, even just one, I'd stand a chance. Okay, here goes. No, 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 hold up a minute. Too late. Shh. I just wished there'd be no school tomorrow. No school tomorrow? What nonsense is that? Jenny, go bring them biscuits. Judge, you sit down. Ain't we going to wait for Pa? We ain't waiting for nothing, not even wishes to come true. We're going to eat our dinner before it spoils. Yes, Ma. I'll get the biscuits. You didn't have to be so rough on her, Ma. Play her game. I know, Judd. It's just I have no sense of humor left or fun. The way it is with us... If we had a wish in stone, we could use it for a lot better things than no school tomorrow. <laughs> Ain't that crazy? The two of you have had me half believe in there is a power in that stone. Hi, March. Tom? Huh? Where are the kids? As if you care. Gone to bed. Where have you been? What was the action tonight? Bingo? Horses? <laughs> pool? Nope. Tonight I got a pretty fair excuse. The only thing I was gambling was my life. What's that supposed to mean? I've been a volunteer helper at a fire. <laughs> now it's finally out. I couldn't hardly wait to get home and tell the kids the good news. What good news? That the school burned down. Good news for the kids everywhere tonight. No school tomorrow. Is there any other catastrophe in the world that carries with it an equal amount of joy than a school burning down? But this time, is it chance or is some supernatural force, sinister or benign, at play? We're going to find out that this simple phenomenon, or happenstance, is a great deal more than sheer coincidence when we return in a few moments with Act Two. Some research experts say you can't taste the difference between beers. Well, if they're right, then Anheuser-Busch wastes a barrel of time beechwood aging Budweiser. Only they don't think so. Brewing beer right does make a difference. And they're betting a bundle that you can taste the difference in Bud. When it comes to brewing Budweiser, the Anheuser-Busch choice is to go all the way because they still care about quality. Look at it this way. If the Bud people have a choice between what some experts say and what beer drinkers say... Well, you'd better believe they'll go with you beer drinkers every time. When you say Budweiser, you've said it all. Anheuser-Busch, St. Louis. Don't let anyone con you into thinking it's wrong to turn in a heroin pusher. You're not ratting. You're doing your part to wipe out one of the most insidious epidemics racking our country today. So don't let anyone kid you. If you really care about the quality of life, if you really care about improving society, you'll do everything you can to get the heroin pusher off the street and into jail where he belongs. If you have information about a drug pusher, use the heroin hotline. The number is 800-368-5363. That's toll free from anywhere in the country. The number again is 800 368 
5363, a trained operator will answer your call, take your information, and pass it on to experienced federal agents who will investigate. You'll make your own special contribution toward helping us wipe out what President Nixon has called public enemy number one. Call 800-368-5363. So Jenny Liu, our 16-year-old who is determined to cling to childhood and all its happiest dreams, has made her first wish upon the conjure stone, the magic piece of shiny gold that came to her, she believes, at the hand of an angel, a wish that came true. Well, this one was a harmless enough request, although the manner of its granting has been destructive enough, if indeed it was actually granted. If this is a wishing stone, it is potentially as dangerous as a nuclear bomb. Did you say the school burned down, Pa? <laughs> it sure as Tucker did, Judd. Ain't that good news, Jenny? I reckon. I guess uh, I didn't mean to do it that way. Eh? You didn't mean to do what? To burn it down. I, I just didn't want it to be. That's all I wished on. Hey, what was she talking about, Mark? Oh, it's just Jenny found Don't you tell him, Mark. But don't, you, don't you tell me why? Oh, don't pay any mind to the young un's nonsense. Just tell us about the schoolhouse and what happened. <laughs> well, sir, I, I, I just about finished trimming up Mayor Saget's hedge, and I just started to get all my tools together to put back in a pickup. When the fire horn went off. I heard that old horn go just a couple of minutes Gosh, after. Shut up, yeah, yeah, I run straight over to the firehouse, being being that close, and we took off. By the time we got there, she was past all saving. And it's funny, you know, you come to think of it, a brick building like that, you wouldn't figure it'd turn into a regular torch. Well, how'd the fire start, Pa? Yeah, yeah you wouldn't believe this. And neither does nobody else credit it. But according to old Sam Wallace... All of a sudden, a flaming arrow comes straight out of the sky and cut right through the brick walls and everything and hit the oil tank and blew her wide open. Oh, that drunken old no good. Some custodian. I'll bet he was drinking and dropped one of those foul old stogies he smokes and all that rubbish he's too lazy to clean out of the cellar. Yeah, it could be. It's, it's, it's what most everyone thinks. Still... Still what? Mm, it's hard to tell someone who wasn't there. But damn if the way he told that story didn't make you stop at least once to sink on it. What do you mean? Well, it's the first time I ever seen that old booze hound with his eyes put together like he really was seeing what he talked about. Anyways, uh, we talked enough. Hey, something to eat around here. I got it warm and I'll serve it right away. Pa? Yes, sugar. That flame and lightning bolt, you said. How long before the fire horn sounded did it come? Oh, well, according to Sam's story, he, he lit out next door to the gas station and called the fire department. It was, couldn't have been more than a couple of minutes. See, Judd? It did so work. Okay, if you want to believe it. What are you kids talking about? Well, forget it, Pa. Just kid talk. Oh. Oh, I'm too old to share. Oh, no, if you want to. Oh, well, sure I do. Well, Pa, it's, it, it's just for no mind. Uh, Jenny and me's got to be getting to bed. <laughs> With no school to worry about tomorrow? If there's no school, there's plenty of chores they can catch up on in the morning. Scoot now, both of you. I'm serving your Pa dinner. Good night, Pa. Uh, let's go, Jen. But I wanted to You get on upstairs. It's past your bedtime. Yes, Ma. Good night, Pa. Good night, kids. You have to chase him off the bed. Little enough chance I get to see him. It's little enough chance you make to see him. Oh, lay off, will you, Marge? I'm not even laying on. If you stuck a little closer to home than to the other woman, maybe you'd know what goes on around your own house. Now, what other woman? Now, dang well, I'm it. talking about Lady Luck, or whatever name you want to call her. My rival. Oh, Lady Luck. Whatever makes you gamble, Tom, one way or another, it's going to be the end of us. You ever going to see that before it's too late? Why wouldn't you let me tell Pa about the wishing stone? Because. Because what? Because first thing you know, he'll take it off of you, that's why. Why would he? 
because it's real gold? Jenny, that stone ain't gold. Then what is it? It's pyrite. What's pyrite? Oh, it's just what everybody calls... Well, it, uh, it... It's a sort of metal. Well, anyways, whatever it is, it's real precious to me. It's my lucky charm. Well, that's why you better not let Pa know what you think about it. Why? Well, you know what he's like. He, he cares about gambling more than he cares about anything, and all gamblers are real superstitious. Now, if he knew you had a lucky piece, especially if he heard the crazy story about you and the school burning down, he'd have it off of you so fast that it'd set your head to spinning. It isn't crazy. You heard me wish on the stone for no school, and now there is no school. That was just happenstance. You don't think it happened just because I wished it? Of course it didn't. Then I'm going to prove it to you. What do you want me to wish for? I don't want you to wish for nothing. I got to show you. Look here now. I'm going to wish... Jenny! What, Judd? Oh, you sound so funny. Well, maybe it's because I feel like that. I... What way? Well, I sort of... Well, you know, superstitious, like... It sort of gives you goosebumps if you think on it. What does? Well, now, look, Jenny, supposing... Now, 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 I'm not saying it did fall out this way, but... Supposing you did get what you wished for. You were the one yourself said you didn't mean to get it the way you did. No, that's for sure I didn't. I didn't want the schoolhouse to go on fire. <gasps> Gosh, Judd. Oh, supposing... Just supposing someone had been in there and got caught in the fire. Or a whole lot of folks. That's kind of what I'm saying. And my wish could have burned them all up. But the angel gave it to me. For sure, he couldn't have meant nothing bad to happen. I don't have to throw it away, do I, Judd? I can keep it. Well, that won't do no harm. So long as you don't wish on it. I guess I'll just put it away for my keepsakes. And, and I'll never use it unless... Unless what? Unless the angel comes and tells me to. Well, that's a right good idea, Jenny. And remember, don't let Pa get wind of that there stone. There would nothing hold him back from using it, even if he didn't believe in it. <laughs> It's going to seem funny going to school in the courthouse. Mm, you think with only a Friday left in the week that I wait until Monday to start up again. I'm glad they did. I don't want to miss any more school ever. Then you better look out the things you go around wishing, Missy. Oh, she's took... I'm sorry, Ma. She's taking a pledge. What does that mean? I'm not going to wish on the stone anymore, because the wish you get might turn out bad for other folks. I think that's a very good pledge. Yes, only... <laughs> only what? I'll have to whisper. Well, don't mind me. I'm all finished. I gotta get my books from upstairs. What's this you have to whisper? I was just going to say that with Judd's... With Judd's birthday tomorrow, I wanted to wish him a bicycle. He sure has his heart set on one. Well, you won't have to worry because he's already got one. Leastways, he will by later this morning. How? You see this flower tin? Yes. Watch this. Down under the flower, there in this old glass salt cellar, is the money I've been saving up for most a year to get your brother the bike he wants. How come you kept it there? Your father, what he is, it had to be some real safe place to keep his hands off it. Who's that? Oh, it's your Uncle Al. He's driving me to work this morning. Get the door, honey, will you? My hands are all flour. Sure thing, Ma. You sure are as pretty as a picture. Getting to look more like your mother every day. <laughs> and they don't come any prettier than that. Oh, you and your honey talk. You should have been on a TV instead of behind a cage. <laughs> Thank God the bank don't keep its tellers there anymore. You make me sound like an ape. Uh, me, Tarzan. You, Jane? <laughs> no, me, Jenny. <laughs> well, some guy here laughing. I know you must be around, Uncle Al. Hi. Hi, Gabe. Give me some skin. Well, here's five. I'll match it. 
Ooh, ooh. Uh, say, that's some grip. You want to Indian wrestle? Oh, I'm going to be ready pretty soon to take you on. I think you're ready already. No, oh, i got no time this morning. i got to catch a school bus. Come on, Jenny. we got to scoot. Goodbye, Ma. Oh, have a good day, son. Bye, Ma. And get a real swell you-know-what. I will. Be happy, Jenny. I am. Bye, Uncle Al. Hey, it's great to see you. We'll make it longer next time. Bye, Uncle Al. Bye, Bye. Jenny. Mm. Make next time soon. You can count on it real soon. Oh, that's swell kids, Marge. I envy you. Yeah, they're what I live for these days. Uh, Tom left already? No, he's upstairs, dead to the world. He rolled in this morning around three, smelling like a brewery. That brother of mine, I'd like to knock his head off. The way he'll be feeling time he gets up this morning, you won't have to. It'll fall off all by itself. I got to talk some business to him. Like what? I don't want to get you involved in it, Marge. Well, if it's about money, I will be anyway. It is about money. Then there's no use asking him. I... I went through his pockets last night, and he doesn't have one red cent. But he's got to. What for, Al? Jim Kenny called me at home late last night. The insurance agent? Yeah. Last payment on Tom's life insurance hasn't been made, and tomorrow's the last day of the grace period. But I gave him the money for that a month ago. You gave him the money? I was a fool, I know, but things had been going well for a while, like they sometimes do, or anyways, I thought they were. And he asked me to trust him, and oh, Lord, what am I going to do now, Al? I don't know, Marge. This time, I... I just haven't got it. What do you mean, this time? Marge, Tom is hopeless. I've been carrying him for years, or thought I was. I gave him the $60 for that same payment. When I found out last night it hadn't been made, I was mad enough to kill him. One reason I waited till this morning is to cool off. I'd help you out, Marge, but I can't. I had to take out a new loan to raise the cash for Tom. I can't let the insurance go. He'd have a tough time getting a new policy written if this one lapses, but how... Nearly a year I've been saving it for a bike for Judd's birthday tomorrow. Instead... I'm going upstairs to beat the... No, no, take me downtown, Al. I just can't face Tom this morning. I'll have it out with him tonight. After what you made me have to do today, how could you steal money out of my purse and leave to go gambling again? Well, all I want to do is run it up till it's enough to pay you back. You're sick. I'm not going to let you take the money I broke my back making today. I'll bring you back five times this. And, and you're not stopping me. Oh, yes, I will. I'm warning you. You, you, you stop hanging on to me. I got to, Tom. You just can't do this to us anymore. Just, just lay off of me. Tom, you can't do this to us again. I got the luck tonight. I can feel it all going for me. The way you always feel. Please. Let go of me. You want to put the whammy on me? I said, Tom. Let go. Oh! March. I didn't mean to push. Oh, my God. Ma, what happened? Ma! Oh, Judd! It's just like my dream! He killed her! Pa killed her dead! The terror of addiction. Step by step, it grows to envelop the addict till it becomes his whole world, shutting out everything else. But the greater terror is the destruction of all who love him, dragged down with him, and eventually engulfed in a tragedy not of their making. I'll return in a moment with Act Three. And now another story of the ball and chain, as Kellogg's Special K presents Veronica and Jeff. Oh, Jeffrey, isn't this romantic? 
out in a quiet lake at night with you rowing the boat. Yes, Veronica, it's really neat. Jeffrey, what was that? Uh, frogs. Frogs that go bong? Uh, they're pretty weird frogs. Oh, Jeffrey, you're such a car. You have a ball and chain, like the ones they use in those special K commercials. Yes, Veronica, it symbolizes my few pounds of extra weight. But I'm going to get rid of it. How? Uh, by exercising. You know, like rowing this boat and eating smart at every meal, starting with a special K breakfast. You mean a one-ounce bowl of high-protein Special K, four ounces of skim milk, orange juice, and coffee? Uh, precisely. It's less than 240 calories, and it tastes delicious. It'll help me get rid of this ball and chain. I'll help, too, Jeff. After all, we're all in the same boat. <gasps> you have a ball and chain, too. <laughs> Your happy ending could begin with a Special K breakfast from Kellogg's. People can reach. People can touch. Paul Newman speaking. Ever been close to a family struck by cancer? Naturally, your feelings go out to them and you ask if there's anything you can do. And they say no thanks and you feel so helpless. Well, there is something you can do. You can tell someone in the family to get in touch with the American Cancer Society. Volunteers there are helping people every day with services and information and counseling about local community resources. That can mean arranging transportation or homemaking help or informing them about existing rehabilitation programs. When your cancer crusader calls, join the people who care about people. Give generously. We want to wipe out cancer in your lifetime. endless moment in time. A few dreadful seconds ticked away, with every heart crying out to take them back again, to make this just a bad dream and not reality. Three people frozen in horror. The fourth sprawled at the bottom of the stairs, her neck bent at an impossible angle, frozen in what? Unconsciousness or death? Now, at last, the man brings himself to move. Marge. Marge. Don't you touch your pa or I'll kill you dead. Oh, son. I'm not your son. I'm your enemy. Jenny, call the police. Emergency. We got to get him out of the hospital fast. Ma. 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 Okay, kid. Just take it easy. She's not going to die. You're not going to let her die, Doctor. Just hang in tough, kid. We'll do our best. I should have gone with the ambulance. Ah, oh, you're sticking right with me, brother. We see how your wife makes out. No, no, no. Look, officer, you... You don't think she's... Well, for the sake of your own skin, you better hope she isn't. But, but it was an accident. Well, the way that boy of yours reacted looked like he wasn't so sure. Now, we got to get moving. Now, what happened to your daughter? Hmm? Oh, oh, Jenny, uh... Oh, she went back to get something. Uh, where are you taking us? Well, the hospital. First, anyways. Now, oh, here she comes. Come on, shake her leg, kiddo. I... I had to get something very important. Okay, okay. Hop in the front with my buddy, Officer Franks. <laughs> Okay, Harry. Straight to X-ray. You, uh, you got a family doctor, kid? Uh, yeah, Dr. Luther. Oh, you, you know his number? No, but I can look it up. Okay. Tell your doctor to get here as fast as he can. It, it's that bad? I wouldn't want to fake you out, son. It's not good. And I phoned Dr. Luther. He's on his way here. Is Ma going to die, Judd? I don't know. I'm, I'm... I'm scared. Real scared. So am I. Judd? What? I'm going to break my pledge. You forgive me? What, what, what pledge? I brought the wishing stone. I'm going to wish on it. I'm going to wish that Ma's going to be all right. Just like it never happened. If you want to, Jenny, go ahead. Can't do no harm. What can't do no harm? For me to use my wishing stone? 
You're what? Shh, quiet. I'm wishing right now. Are you the intern brought the cold case in? He is, officer. Well, how is she? I'm waiting for x-rays right now. I'd say she has one chance in a thousand. For certain, sure, her neck is broken. And the way it's broken and other signs indicate to me her spinal cord is badly damaged. If it isn't severed altogether. I just can't understand it, Dr. Luther. When I brought Mrs. Calder in, I'd have sworn she was in deep coma. I was sure her neck was broken, spinal cord severed. There's no indication of that from my examination of her. Not the slightest in these x-rays. I know, but not in this second set. Was there a first? Yes. And that's a funny thing. When we developed them, everyone was fogged. And we don't know why. Well, these are perfectly clear. So is my patient's condition. I see no reason why she shouldn't go home. <laughs> Cheer up, son. All interns make mistakes. I made a few buttes in my time. And I'll say this for you. If you have to make one, make it on the gloomy side. They're the ones that don't hurt anyone or anything. <laughs> Except maybe your pride. But I can't understand it. That cop said it flat out that Marge was a goner. Well, maybe he was just trying to put the fear of God into you. Well, if he was, he sure succeeded. If it'll do any good. Well, you think I made a stone, Judd? You think I don't blame myself for what might have happened? You think I wasn't ready to kill myself if anything happened to Marge? I, 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 I don't know, Pa. I... Pa wasn't trying to hurt Ma, Judd. It was an accident. An accident that wouldn't have happened if... I wasn't sick with gambling fever. Well, I've learned my lesson this time. I'll never gamble again. Oh, Pa. Oh, that makes me so happy. I'm glad, honey. And it means I won't have to use the stone again. Mm hmm I can save up what's maybe the last wish for something special for all of us. Instead of having it to use it to stop you from gambling. Well, well, what stone? The wishing stone. The one I used at the hospital to wish Ma well again. Oh, oh, that's right. I forgot. Listen, Duchess. Let me see that stone. Don't show it to him. Why not? I don't know. It's just a sort of hunch that... Wait a minute. Here comes the doctor. How's, how's my Dr. Luther? She's fine, more's the wonder. Oh, a few scrapes and a bruise or two and a lump on the head. Nothing a good night's rest won't take care of. Thank God. You should. It's a miracle she didn't break her neck in a fall like that. That intern at the hospital was sure she did. But she didn't. No, Judd, I told you she'll be as right as rain. Well, can, can I go up and see her now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. She was asking for you. And the kids. She uh, wants to see you alone a moment first. I I'll go right up. Yeah, just to put your mind at rest, or maybe more hers, she doesn't want to prefer any charges against you. So you can tell her my report to the police will call it just an accident. She slipped and fell. I'll, I'll tell her, Doc. You got off mighty lucky this time, Tom. You better not tempt fate again. Well, I won't. No, I mean it, Marge. Just, just give me another chance. I didn't see how I could, Tom. I never meant to throw you down those stairs. Oh, not because of that. The last straw for me was taking a chance away from Judd to have something he wanted more than anything in the world, his bicycle. You should just have let the insurance go. How could I, Tom? With two kids to bring up, if anything happened to you, I... Not that I want anything to happen to you. You gonna take me back, Marsh? I don't know, Tom. It's hard for me to feel for you what what I once felt. But if you're going to promise me you'll quit the gambling for the children's sake, we'll try to make a go of it. You won't be sorry, Marge. I hope not. I just wish I knew how to make it up to Judd tomorrow. 
If there was something I could pawn. You haven't left anything in this house that you could. Except the one thing you could never get your hands on. Well, what's that? My wedding ring. Do you... Do you think I could get enough on that? Well, not enough to pay for it all. But for a down payment, then... I'll take that night job cleaning sewers. You made me turn down to pay it off. I don't want you working in any sewers. Anyway, you can't work day and night. Well, I, I can't till, till I get Judd his bike. Well, we'll see. I'll take the ring down in the morning. No, no, no sir, no, sir. Dr. Lewis doesn't want you out of bed. Just, I'll, I'll take it down. You? I, can't you trust me, Marge? Well, if you can't trust me now, then what the hope do I have or any of us I, I can ever be trusted? Well, you got to. Oh, I swear to God, I'd just as soon be dead. All right, Tom. I'll trust you. Did what? You ran out of the money? Look, Benny. You've got to do an old customer a favor, huh? You gotta cover me for the fifth. Headlonger. Now, Benny, Benny, you gotta. That fifteen I laid out on the first was money I got for pawning my wife's wedding ring. I got to get it back. And I got a hot tip. The headlongers are sure. Benny, for, for God's sake. Oh, just, just this once. Please. Benny. Benny. What am I going to do? I wish to God... Wish. Oh, that wishing stone. Yeah. Where's Jenny, Judd? Oh, I left her down by the pond. We were skipping stones. I just came up to see how you were feeling. Fine. I'm going to get up. Your pa didn't get back yet, did he? No, ma'am. I ain't seen him since early morning when he pulled out in the pickup. Well, you go on back down and keep Jenny company. I'm going to make me a cake so we can have a real birthday celebration. Oh, it's all right, Ma. I, I don't need a cake. You're going to get a lot more than you bargained for. Now, go on. I don't like Jenny down by that pond alone. You know she can't swim. What are you doing up on top of the rock here? Oh, just sunning myself and listening to the birds. Jenny, you, you know that wishing stone you talked about? Yes. Is it gold? You want to see? Yeah, yeah. Here. Oh, damn. It's nothing but pyrite. Isn't that a kind of gold? Yeah, yeah, yeah. fool's gold and even worth as much as a piece of charcoal. No, Pa. No. Don't throw it away. It's still good for one wish. <laughs> you think this makes any wishes come true? It made the school burn down, and Ma got her neck unbroken. You're a Ma. Why did you grow up and stop your daydreaming? Don't you know nobody ever got nothing by wishing? I've been doing a kind of wishing all my life. Look at where I end up now. Well, I'm going to wake up your little Miss Bright Eyes to show just how tough a world this is. Pa! Please, please don't get mad. If this was a wishing stone... Well, nobody ever needed it more than me right this moment. So look at this. I'm going to make a wish. I need money. I need it bad. So I'm going to wish that old Nick himself comes climbing up out of the middle of this pond with a sack of gold on his back for me. And I ain't going to be greedy. And I ain't going to ask for much. Just just say like a, a ten. No, 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 make it twenty thousand dollars. Okay. Now... I'll rub the stone, and I wish. <laughs> you see? It ain't no wishing stone. It don't make dreams come true. It's a nothing. Ah! Oh, ah! Jimmy! Jimmy, help oh, me! No! Oh, no! I'm 
going to tell the kids, Al? They're not really children anymore, Marge. They know. I guess I do baby them. I won't anymore. In a lot of ways, they're better off. Tom... Well, Tom had a cancer that he just couldn't cut out. (laughs) Even my wedding ring, he... Oh, I didn't want him dead, though. Well, he is. And it was of his own making. Kind of queer, isn't it? What? Him trying to show Jenny Lou her wishing stone wasn't worth a darn, and he ended up having his wish come true? Not quite. The policy's only for 10000 There's double indemnity for accidental death, Marge. Tom got everything he wished for. The full 20000 <laughs> Three wishes, and they all came true. Whether by some supernatural force or sheer coincidence, it doesn't really matter. For in the end, everyone was better off except the one who didn't deserve to be. This was the gambler's last plunge. One he should never have taken with the odds so stacked against him. Like Jenny, Tom Coulter had never learned to swim either. I'll be back shortly. Mm. Hey, we're the Action Corps. See, we contribute more. Tees for the teamwork of our crew. Aye, our ideals are high. Oh, oughtn't you apply? <laughs> Means it's now that we need you. A, C, T, I. We could go on all day. Action is Vista, the Peace Corps, RSVP, SCORE, and other volunteer programs that are helping people to help themselves. If you're trained in a skill or just have a little love to share, Action needs you. Yeah, baby. Action real needs you. Don't crawl under a rock. Get into action. Oh, yeah. This is a public service of this station and the Advertising Council. As for the wishing stone itself, since it lies buried deep somewhere in the mud at the bottom of the pond, no one will ever know if it had the power to grant wishes. For Jenny, like all of us, had no escape from a common fate that soon befell her. She grew up and inherited a mantle that only Peter Pan seems to have escaped. She stopped believing in magic. Our cast included William Prince, Clarice Blackburn, Anne Costello, Jack Grimes, and Robert Dryden. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. Your husband? You dreamed? It was no dream. Oh, it was my husband. His ghost. Oh, for the love. Rory, Rory. He stood at the foot of my bed. And he begged my forgiveness for leaving me a pauper and breaking my heart. And he said, Jessica, I promise you'll live in Gormley House again. And then he he vanished. The very next night, the Putnams crashed through the bridge over Gormley Gorge. Well, accidents do happen. It was no accident. No, the real estate man didn't tell you the whole story. Mrs. Putnam lived long enough to tell just what had happened. The Putnams didn't go off the bridge by accident. They were driven off it. Forced to swerve off it by an oncoming car. A car driven by a skeleton. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Anheuser-Busch Incorporated. Brewers of Budweiser. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams.
Kansas City. Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. Welcome to our world of mystery and the macabre. Sit back and lend us your fears. Have you ever seen a ghost? It is an experience of such horror as to turn your blood to ice. Oh, I know, I know, there are those who scoff. But they have never met a ghost. Our mystery drama... The Ghost Driver was written especially for the Mystery Theater by George Lothar and stars Augusta Dabney and Mason Adams. It is sponsored in part by Anheuser Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser, and by the Kellogg Company, makers of Kellogg's Special K cereal. I'll be back shortly with Act One. This is Jerry Crawford for Kellogg's Special K. We've been having some fun in our television and radio commercials by using a ball and chain to symbolize the slight overweight problem common to so many of us. We point out that being a few pounds overweight is just a little more difficult for you. Climbing stairs, just walking around, even sitting down can feel, well, like you're wearing a ball and chain. In case you missed the message, it's this. If you really want to get rid of that extra weight, you really have to work at it by exercising and with sensible meals like the Special K breakfast. A one-ounce bowl of Special K, America's favorite high-protein cereal, four ounces of skim milk, tomato juice, and coffee, less than 240 calories, nutritious, and by the way, delicious. So why not begin each day with a Special K breakfast and then keep up the good work? Special K can't help you lose weight all by itself, but it really is a good start. <laughs> Suburban Savings Suburban Suburban Savings offers you an easy way to borrow without touching a penny in your regular savings passbook account. Just let Suburban loan you the money. It's called Suburban Savings Passbook Loan. You can borrow up to 90% of the total amount you have on deposit at reasonable rates, and you can pay off your loan at your convenience. When your loan is repaid, you still have all of your savings intact, plus interest. So if you need money, why not take a loan from Suburban without touching your savings? Suburban Savings Passbook Loan in New Jersey at Bayonne, Edgewater, Elmwood Park, Emerson, Hackettstown, Morris Plains, Nutley, Paramus, and Sparta. exist? Mel Stout doesn't think so. But his wife, Liz, feels differently. If it had been up to Liz, they'd never have bought Gormley Lodge on top of Manitou Mountain in Colorado. Why? Because according to a local legend, the former owners, the Putnams, had been sent crashing to their death by a ghost driver who came at them head on. Now, in the living room of the lodge... Liz, I've had it up to here with that brother of yours. Oh, now, Mel. I mean, he promised to help finish painting his living room before the Duncans arrived tonight, and where is he? Mel? I'll tell you where he is. He is out on the slope skiing, enjoying himself, as usual. Well, d do you just be reasonable now. If we didn't have Rory, where would we get a ski instructor, I'd like to know? We certainly can't afford to hire one any more than we could afford to have this place painted. Oh, I'm sorry. It's just that I've, I've got so darn much on my mind. Liz, I... I just hope that I haven't made the mistake of my life and yours. We'll make a go of the lodge. We're off to a pretty good start. The Duncans arrive tonight and they're booked for a full week. And the Todds and the Morgans arrive next week. Yeah, and after that? Well, darling, our newspaper ads ought to get us more customers. Just ask yourself, darling, what would you rather be doing now? Painting the living room of your own ski lodge with paying guests arriving tonight? Or slaving away at your old accounting job in Aspen. Well, at least that brought a check in every week. Oh, Mel, you've wanted to be your own boss for years. 
And so we bought this old mansion on top of Manitou Mountain to start our own ski lodge, the old Gormley Mansion. And we're going to keep at it until we make a success of it. <laughs> Where's your marbles? Oh, there's somebody at the front door. I'll get it. Oh. Oh, Mrs. Gormley. I'm coming to pay you a visit, Miss Stout. My first formal visit. Well, that's very good of you, Mrs. Gormley. Uh, well, won't you come in? All right, Jason. You heard the lady. Wheel me in. Yes, Mother. You know my son, Jason, who you've met? Yes, yes, briefly. Mel, the Gormleys have come to pay a visit. I see you, Mrs. Gormley, Jason. I uh, hope you don't mind if I finish this painting. Oh, go right ahead. I'd give you a hand, old as I am, but my arthritis keeps me in this wheelchair. Jason, why no, don't you... No, thanks. I couldn't think of asking a fine arts painter to fine do... Fine arts? You hear that, Jason? Mr. Stout complimented you. Call the mountain scenes you paint fine art. Well, they are. Why, I saw some of them in the ski shop in town. They're very good. Do you sell many? A few. Oh, just enough to cover the cost of the paint and canvas. Oh, yes, and a quart of whiskey now and then. Mother, please. Well, now, they, if they don't hear it from me, Jason, they'll hear it from others. Well, the drink now and then. Now and then. Oh, tell the Stouts how you play Russian roulette. With that old revolver of your father's when you're drunk. Stop it, Mother. Stop it. Uh, perhaps you'd like some coffee, Mrs. Gormley, or, or tea. It won't take a minute. No, 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 thank you. We won't be here that long. Now, I've come to do for you what I did for the Putnams. Them that bought my house out from under me three years ago. Out from under you? Mrs. Gormley, are you saying that, that we have done that? Forced you out of your house? Well, haven't you? Oh, it's not your fault. Jason's father left us destitute, left me destitute, I should say, with a son too lazy to support his old mother. So I had to sell this beautiful place. Mother, the Stouts aren't interested in all this past history. Well, they'd better be, if they value their lives. Value our lives? Well, Mr. Halliday didn't tell you. Of course. Tell us what? About how the Putnams met their death. Why, yes. The real estate man told us about the accident. That was no accident. No more than my husband's death was an accident. He died in the same way? His car crashed off the bridge into the gorge? Right. 800 feet down into the gorge. To the rocks 800 feet below. But no accident. Suicide. The Putnams didn't commit suicide. Not them. My husband, Jason Sr., Raving, drunk, and suicidal. But theirs was no accident either, the Putnams. He drove them off that bridge. Who? My husband. Now, wait a minute, Mrs. Gormley. If your husband was dead... Hi. I am back. Oh, sure. Naturally, Rory. Now, the painting job is nearly done. Oh, now, don't get up tight, Mel. I, I just didn't remember it till I was out on the slopes. Hi, Mrs. Gormley. Jason. Uh, paying a little social call? It's anything but social. Mrs. Gormley, are you saying that your husband, even though he was dead, somehow killed the Putnams? Liz, come on now. All right, I'll tell you. After my husband's death, when I realized I'd been left penniless, that I'd have to sell this place, I fell into a state of depression. When the Putnams bought Gormley Lodge... Oh, they were going to use it as a winter home, not turn it into a ski resort like you... When they bought it, and I had to move into the little guest house, I was so sad I thought I'd die. For days and days I sat and wept, and and then, and one night, my husband come to me. Your husband? You dreamed? It was no dream. Oh, it was my husband. His ghost. Oh, for the love. Rory, Rory. I stood at the foot of my bed. And he begged my forgiveness for leaving me a pauper and breaking my heart. And he said, Jessica, I promise you'll live in Gormley House again. And then he, he vanished. The very next night, the Putnams crashed through the bridge over Gormley Gorge. Well, accidents do happen. It was no accident. Now, the real estate man didn't tell you the whole story. Mrs. Putnam lived long enough to tell just what had happened. Well, you can ask the sheriff. The Putnams didn't go off the bridge by accident. They were driven off it. 
forced to swerve off it by an oncoming car. A car driven by a skeleton. Good heavens. That's what I wanted to tell you. And now you know. Good day. Well, what kind of a put-on is this? She's trying to scare us out of here. I'm trying to save your lives. You're trying to get back into this house. That's what you're doing. Just the way you moved back after the Putnams got killed and lived here a full three years until now. Well, I have some respect, respect for that. No way. She may be old, but she's as shrewd as they come. She frightens you off, then moves back in again and stays until some other sucker comes I along. I warn you, Just you're... let us know when your husband's ghost shows up again. It did. What? Last night. Oh, man, this is the neatest ripoff oh, I've Shut ever... up, Roy. Will you... Your husband's ghost... Last night? Yes. And he used the same words. Jessica, I promise you'll live in Gormley Lodge again. Oh, I beg you, listen to me. The Putnams wouldn't and went to their death. Oh, Mrs. Gormley, you're really out of sight. You know... You, so smart. You're so sure of yourself. You think he isn't watching and listening, my husband? Do you think he doesn't know how you insulted me? Do you think he'll not repay you? Oh, yes, if people are to die this time, too, you will be the first. Now, be warned. Jason, wheel me back. Be warned. Rory, you shouldn't have talked to Mrs. Gormley like that. You didn't spring for that crazy story, did you? I don't know. I wonder. What, Liz? Mel, call the sheriff. Find out if Mrs. Gormley's telling the truth. Oh, come on, Liz. I look like a fool. Anyhow, I've got to finish this paint job. What? Liz, you're not... I must find out. Suit yourself. You always do. Sheriff Harper speaking. Oh, Sheriff. Uh, this is Elizabeth Stout calling... We're the new owners of Gormley House. Oh, oh, yes. What can I do for you, Mrs. Stout? Well, we just had a visit from Mrs. Gormley. Oh. What do you mean, oh? Oh, nothing, Mrs. Stout, only <laughs> she can be a little hard to take, getting on in years. Yes, well, what I wanted to ask you, of course you remember the accident to the Putnams three years ago, crashing off the bridge over Gormley Gorge. Yes, yes, I remember. Well, according to Mrs. Gormley... Mrs. Putnam lived long enough to tell you what had caused the accident. Is that so? Uh, yes, it is. And what did she tell you? Well, now, Mrs. Stout, she was near death. Maybe out of her head with pain and shock. What did she tell you, Sheriff? Did she tell you that they had been forced to swerve off the bridge because of another car that came straight at them? A car with a skeleton driving it? Well, as I said, she was out of her Did head. she? Yes, that's the story she told me. Thank you. Goodbye. So? Mrs. Gormley told the truth. Oh, the Putnam woman was dying. Anybody in that condition is liable to say anything. I suppose. Now, look, just, just, just get off it, Liz. We put our life savings, every cent we've got in this place, and I'm not leaving, ghost or no ghost. Well, speaking of leaving, I'd better get on down into Manitou and pick up the Duncans at the airport. Well, it's a bit early, isn't it? Or have you got some cute chick in town that you'd like to spend an hour or so with? <laughs> Mel, you put me away. Don't give me any ideas, Rory. Well, it's a bit early, isn't it? Or have you got some cute chick in town that you'd like to spend an hour or so with? <laughs> Mel, you put me away. Don't give me any ideas, Rory. This is some road, Rory. You drive it often? In the dark, I mean? A few times, Mr. Duncan. Well, it's frightfully steep and curvy. Now, don't push the panic button, Mrs. Duncan. I'll get you to the top of Manitou Mountain safe enough. You'll be enjoying a hot toddy in front of the fireplace at Gormley Lodge before you know it. Uh, maybe, uh, maybe you better slow down a little. Ah, it's okay. That was just a patch of loose shale. 
you much of a skier, Mr. Duncan? Oh, I do okay. My wife will need some lessons, though. I uh, take it Gormley Lodge has a pro. Oh, the best. Me. Oh. <laughs> well, fine, fine. Uh, say, this road is steep and curvy. Must be pretty spectacular. Views, I mean, in the daytime. It's spectacular enough right now, what I can see in the headlights. We've got some views, all right. Here's one. It's real cool. From the bridge over Gormley Gorge. Steep? 800 feet straight down. Mm. Mm. Yeah, it's too bad there isn't a moon tonight. I'd stop on the bridge and let you have a look. What's that sound? We're crossing the bridge now. A wooden bridge over Gormley Gorge. About 500 feet across. Hey, what's the lights of a car coming fast? That damn fool is coming straight at us. Get over! A skeleton driving that car. Hey, we're going off the bridge! I'll be back shortly with Act Two. If you have the nerve to return, that is. Hello, Fox. It seems like only yesterday that I was a little girl tasting porridge. You know, this one's too hot. This one's too cold. And now I conduct taste tests on diet drinks. And there's one I must tell you about. Sugar-Free Diet 7-Up. It has a fresh, natural, delicious taste. It drives my taster meter crazy. Sugar-Free Diet 7-Up. <gasps> this one's just right. Hey, ma'am, what's for dinner? Hey, ma'am, what you got? How about a no-cook dinner for a change? Serve a delicious spread of sliced meat, cheeses, salads, and crisp rolls from ShopRite's appetizer counter. You'll love the freshness, the fine quality, and the pleasing variety. This week's best buys are ShopRite freshly sliced chicken roll, half pound, 69 cents. Imported Switzerland Swiss cheese, half pound, 89 cents. ShopRite liverwurst, 99 cents a pound. Fresh macaroni salad, 39 cents a pound. So relax. Pick up a ready-to-eat dinner at the ShopRite appetizer counter. She loves the family. She wants the best. She does all that she can do. She lets ShopRite do the rest. Hey, Ma, what's for dinner? ShopRite has the answer. Hello, Am Cow. My automatic transmission just got the automatic in. I was wondering, do you service Chevrolets? Do we service those sensational Chevrolets? Ma'am, Amco has serviced over 3 million automatic transmissions of all kinds. Ah. Nearly 900,000 Chevrolets alone. Ooh. Do we service Chevrolets? George, pitch pipe, please. Chevy Nova and Impala and the Bel Air and Camaro and the Chevy too. Oh, my. Yep, we know them. Every Chevrolet automatic make and model on the road today, from the oldest Biscayne to a bright, spanky Caprice. Uh, by the way, what sort of Chevy did you say you had? A Chevy Mustang. Well, no matter. Nobody knows your automatic transmission better than Amco. Double A. MCO. There are over 500 Amco centers coast to coast. Consult your yellow pages for the Amco center nearest you. Double A. MCO. AMCO. This is WOR New York and RKO General Station. Terror, unless you have experienced it, is only a word. I could employ all the art at my command, my voice, the words I choose, to convey to you the full impact of terror. Yet, I know I should fail even as Michael Duncan fails now in telling his story to Sheriff Harper on the bridge over Gormley Gorge the next morning. Terror? You say you experience terror? What would you experience, Sheriff? The light? Mr. Duncan, I'm only trying to get at what happened here last night. Excuse me, Sheriff. Yes, Mr. Stout, what is it? <sighs> Will it be much longer before they get the, the bodies up? Hard to say. Why? I'd like to get back to the lodge. My wife is alone, and you can imagine her condition after hearing of her brother's death. Say nothing of how it happened. Sure, sure. You go ahead. I'll let you know when you're needed to identify the bodies. I'm sorry about your brother-in-law, Mr. Stout. And the publicity. Publicity? 
Yeah, this is the second time the ghost driver has struck. Ghost driver? And the news has got out. I hear they're sending reporters over from Aspen. That's great. That's just what I need. That'll end my ski resort business for good. Not that it ever got started. Uh, wait a few minutes and I'll ride back up with you. Nothing I can do either till I recover Jill's body. Oh, yes, sir, is, Mr. Duncan. You can give me a full account. Now, look, Sheriff, I've told you all I know. We were driving across this bridge when we saw this other car coming straight at us. Stout's brother-in-law was driving. He swerved to avoid the oncoming car and went through the guardrail. In the split second between swerving and going through the rail, I leapt clear and saved myself. I wish I could say the same for that boy and, and Jill, my wife. About the skeleton at the wheel of the other car. Why do you keep harping on that? Because it's something to harp on. If you saw a skeleton driving that car... I didn't. You said... I know what I said, but... Well, I've got to be wrong. I couldn't have seen what I thought I did. Why not? Because I don't believe in skeletons driving cars. I don't believe in ghosts. Now, take it easy, Mr. Duncan. All I'm after is a complete report. The fact. All you're after is the publicity you're going to get out of this. Put you on the map, won't it, Sheriff? Why, you might even get a job in one of the big Colorado ski resorts like Aspen or Vail. That'll be enough, Mr. Duncan. You can go. I'll phone the lodge when I need you. This is Gormley. Well, invite me in, Miss Stout. Oh, y yes, of, of course. Uh, yeah, I'm well, I'm surprised to see that you're not in a wheelchair. Oh, it depends on how bad my arthritis kicks up. Sometimes I can walk with a cane, like now. I see. Is your husband home? No. He's down at the bridge with Mr. Duncan. Oh, the fellow whose wife got killed, huh? Yes. Well, I'm sorry about that. Sorry about your brother, too. Even though he asked for Mrs. it. Mrs. Gormley, I, I, I... Your I brother's just can't talk dead about because it. he wouldn't listen. He wouldn't heed my warning. Now you listen, child. You heed my warning. Make your husband listen and take warning, too. You leave this place. Leave it today. Don't think I wouldn't. We wouldn't if we could. But we can't. Oh, our savings are tied up at Gormley oh, Lodge. listen to me, listen. Now, my dead husband came to me again last night. And he promised me again I'd return to this house. You love this old house, don't you? Well, it was my life. You're a woman. You understand how that is. Yes. I came here a bride 40 years ago. Jason, senior, that is. He was just starting his career as a painter. Jason, my son, was born here. There was another child, a little girl. She died here. No, oh, this house isn't made of wood and stone. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. Oh. Oh, I think they've come back. Yes. My husband and Mr. Duncan are back. Well, I'll go then. Oh, well, Mrs. Gormley, I'm going to put some coffee on. You stay. Have a cup. No. I can't bear to go on looking at people who I know are going to die. What's this? Die? Who, who, who's going to die now? You are, Mr. Stout. You and your wife. If you don't heed my warning and leave... As soon as possible. Now, what's all this, Stout? Who is this woman? Jessica Gormley used to own this place. Oh, the woman you told me about. The one who claims her husband's ghost visits her. I don't just claim it. It's true. Who are you? My name's Michael Duncan. Ah, oh, yes, yes. The one whose wife went to her death in the gorge last night. Well, you take my advice, too. You leave here. Leave as fast as you can. How about a drink, Stout? Oh, so you two won't listen. The ghost driver killed your wife last night, and yet you won't listen. Well, let me warn you once and for all. You... What was that? A, a shot. It was a gunshot. Jason! Oh, it's happened. He's killed him, sorry. Oh. She's fallen. Liz, help her up and keep her here. Duncan, you come with me. <laughs> Oh, 
Carney. Yeah, Mr. Stout. What do you want? Oh, uh, you're okay, Jason. We heard a gunshot. What of it? Well, we've heard of you and your little games, like Russian roulette, and we thought that, that you... That I'd shot myself? No such luck. Come in, if you want to. Oh, the, uh, the gunshot we heard. I fired it. Deliberately. You fired that shot deliberately? You ask a lot of questions for someone I haven't even met. It's Mike Duncan. He and his wife are to be my first guests. It was his wife who got killed last night. Oh. I'm sorry. How did you escape? Flung myself from the car just before it went through the guardrail. Well, you'd better keep an eye out for the old man's ghost. He'll be after you. Uh, Mr. Gormley, I don't believe in ghosts. Now, why did you fire that revolver? What business is it? All right. I'll tell you. You'll think it's nutty. I'm sure. I've been playing Russian roulette with this gun for years. Ever since my father died. And I always win. Or lose. Depending on how you look at it. And how do you look at it, Jason? I give it to you straight, Mr. Stout. I want to lose. For years now, I've picked up the gun... Like this. Oh, no. Not every day. Maybe once a week. Once every other week. Whenever the mood comes on me. And I put it to my temple. Like this. Wait a minute. <laughs> Don't worry. Gun's empty. I haven't put in a fresh bullet yet. You see, the reason I deliberately fired that bullet I had in this gun was to find out if the thing was a dud. It wasn't. Too bad. May I shake your hand, Mr. Duncan? You're the first man I've ever met who says what he thinks. You want to kill yourself? Go ahead. <laughs> I like you. You do speak your mind. And now, gentlemen, if you'll excuse me, I've got to get back to this painting of mine. By the way, what do you think of it? Pretty lurid, isn't it? <laughs> That's just the right word for it, Mr. Stout. See? There's the car swerving and crashing through the bridge. The oncoming ghost car with the skeleton at the wheel. All in flaming color. I knock out one an hour. I slap a frame on it and I sell it in Manitou for 20 bucks. So excuse me, will you? Business is going to pick up. Thanks to last night. And I want to be ready to supply the demand. <laughs> It's been a rough 24 hours, Miss Stout. It's a nice chair. Just right for sitting in front of a fire. Uh, cost you plenty, I'll bet. Yes, plenty. But that isn't what I'm thinking about. You're thinking about your brother and my wife lying in their coffins at the Undertaker's in Manitou. Yes, and also that even a small village like Manitou has an Undertaker. Birth, death, Taxes. The only sureties in life, Mrs. Stout. Liz. Mike. I, uh, I like your husband. Me too. He told me about everything. About what getting this ski resort means to you. Your life savings invested, all that. All down the drain, I'm afraid. The publicity? What else? Every reservation's canceled. Well, all except one. But... That'll come in, too. It has, Liz. Yes? There it is. Please cancel my reservation for next week, Frank Norton. As a family of four, telegram phoned in from Aspen. Anybody got a sponge? A sponge? So I can throw it in. I'm through, Mike. You always give up this easy? What do you mean, easy? Just that. Do you always fade when the going gets tough? Well, this is the time to start fighting. Does it make good sense to let all this go down the drain because somebody's playing a trick on you? A murderous trick? Do you think it's a trick? What else could it be? A skeleton driving a ghost car? What else but a trick? Well, what else? You were in that car last night. You saw. And it was a skeleton behind the wheel of the oncoming car. You told the sheriff that. You can still say that... That it was a trick, yes. What kind of trick? Damn it, Mike, you admit you saw a skeleton driving a car, but you can still call it a trick? Yeah, see, I see you don't answer. Uh, look, Mel, I'm a practical man, a businessman. 
You think being a businessman is simple? Oh, no. I've had troubles that would make yours look like, like nothing. Today you won't find anybody more successful than me. But I've been bankrupt twice. Yes, and paid off every cent. How? Well, not by running away the way you want to, but by standing up and fighting. And that's what you've got to do right now. How? You tell me how and I'll do it. Look, we'll, we'll do it together. I've got a stake in this too, you know. My wife is dead. Murdered. Yes, murdered. Not by a ghost, but by a trick. And if it's the last thing I do, I'm going to find out who played that trick and make him pay. Then you don't think it's a ghost. Do you? Answer me. Do you believe in ghosts? Did you believe before you came here and ran into this mess you're in? Well, no, I didn't. Then why start believing now? Ha! Ghosts, my foot. Now, this is a trick. Somebody wants to stop you from turning Gormley Lodge into a ski resort. And if you ask me, it's the Gormleys. One or the other or both is behind all this. Or that sheriff down in Manitou. The sheriff? Oh, Mike, you don't really think that the sheriff... I don't know what to think, Liz. All I know is that somebody's behind this. And those are the three likeliest suspects. Now, look, I'm, I'm no Sherlock Holmes, but I've got a brain. And I've got guts. And, and... Well, my wife is dead, my, my Jill. Well, I, I'm just going to find out who killed her, that's all. The tougher they are. You like a drink, Mike? No, no, no thanks. I'll be okay. Especially when I nail that murderer. What, what have you got in mind? Well, it'll be dark in about an hour. We take the car, Mel, you and me. We take the car, and we drive up and down that road, all night if necessary, to meet up with this so-called ghost driver... And when and if we meet up with him. Yes. If and when you meet up with him, what? We don't turn aside. We don't swerve out of his path and off the bridge. We drive straight at him and keep driving at him. If he's a ghost in a ghost car, we'll drive through him. And if he isn't? If he isn't? <laughs> well, if he isn't, it'll be one hell of a crash. <laughs> You out there listening, what would you do? If you were Mel Stout, would you accept Mike Duncan's challenge? I'll be back shortly with Act Three. Ever see a beer drinker pour his beer real easy down the side of the glass? Maybe you do it yourself. If so, the Budweiser Brewmaster thinks you're missing something, especially if you're a Budweiser drinker. You see, Bud is brewed, so it will kick up a healthy head of foam. Exclusive beechwood aging and natural carbonation make it a lively brew. Well, anyway, pouring Bud plunk down the middle of the glass helps bring out the best in that clean white Budweiser foam and real beer aroma. It also helps you get the full benefit of a taste, smoothness, and drinkability you'll find in no other beer at any price. Remember, brewing beer right does make a difference. Next time, pour that Budweiser right down the middle and see for yourself. Anheuser-Busch, St. Louis. couldn't afford to fly to California this summer, TWA has some good news for you. You can. Thanks to TWA's demand schedule service, you can fly to California for only $125. Just make your reservations 90 days before you want to go and put down a $20 deposit for each way. For all the details, call your travel agent. TWA's demand schedule service. Now you can afford to fly to California. Now driving the twisting, precipitous mountain road 
that leads to Gormley Lodge. One, Mike Duncan, believes that the ghost driver they hope to meet is nothing but a trick. Mel Stout, his life savings, every penny at stake, has had no choice but to go along. Mike, I'm bushed. Let's make this the last trip. Uh-uh. We're going to drive up and down this road till dawn. Yes, and night after night if we have to. Until we meet up with our so-called ghost driver. This is the sixth time we've been up and down this mountain road. Okay. Pull over. I'll drive. Get out to your side. I'll slip behind the wheel. Yeah. Hey. The car coming up behind us. Red light flash. That must be the sheriff. Yeah, it's the sheriff, all right. And Mr. Stout. Oh, and you, Mr. Duncan. What are you doing here, Sheriff? Well, that's what I want to ask you. I got a report from Mountain View House across the valley there that they were seeing headlights going up and down this road. Guess I don't have to tell you everybody around here is on edge after what happened last night. Now, what are you up to? We're not up to anything, Sheriff. We're driving this road in hopes of meeting up with whoever or whatever killed my wife and Mr. Stout's brother-in-law. Get yourselves killed in the bargain? Oh, no. You drive on up to Gormley Lodge, and when you get there, stay there. You make that sound like an order, Sheriff. That's what it is, Mr. Stout. Well, I, I guess we better do like he says, Mike. I don't think so. Oh, you don't? No, I don't. This is a public road. We've got a right to be on it. Unless we're doing something that breaks the law, and we're not. You're a kind of troublemaker, Mr. Duncan, aren't you? Sheriff, I never go looking for trouble, but I know how to handle it when it comes my way. Now, either you arrest us for breaking some law or other, in which case you'd better be prepared to back it up or I'll sue the town of Manitou and you for false arrest, or get off our backs. I'm not on your backs. I'm trying to save your lives. Take my advice Advice, and... huh? I thought it was an order. All right, wise guy. Have it your way. Go ahead and get killed and and be damned to you. Uh, let's go, Mel. You can sure sound tough, Mike. Well, no small town sheriff pushes me around. Well, he's only trying to do his job. Maybe. And maybe not. What do you mean? I don't know. But that's what we're going to find out. Tonight, tomorrow night, or whenever. Now, there's the bridge ahead. Yeah, maybe you better slow down. No. If it's a ghost, we'll go through it. If it isn't... Mike, headlights coming toward us. Now, look, don't lose your nerve. Coming closer. We're going to crash if you don't... Mike! Driving that car, it's roaring! Your brother-in-law, my God! I... I can't believe it. Can't believe it myself, Liz. Not only what we saw, but getting out of it with our lives. The fates were with us, Mel. I I lost my nerve. I have to admit that. I just couldn't keep driving straight at that... that awful thing coming toward us. I I couldn't help myself. I I swerved at the last second. Well, thank God we hit that stanchion instead of going off the bridge. Rory driving the other car, it's impossible. Rory's dead. We're burying him tomorrow. Rory's dead, that's for sure. But it was Rory driving that car, that's for sure, too. Then then ghosts do exist? Mel? Yes, what? After the funeral tomorrow, let's get out of here. Let's go away from this place as fast as we can. And go where? Oh, back to Aspen, of course. Liz, we're broke. We haven't enough dough left for a motel room. Where would we stay? How would we live? Uh, Mel, I, I, I didn't know things were that bad for you. Putting this place back in shape cost me just about every penny I had. Well, look, uh, would a loan help? You, you'd you be willing to... Well, sure. I like you two, and, well, the way things turned out, we've gotten to know each other real fast. Practically friends. So... Well, if you can use a loan... That's generous of you, Mike. Uh, it, is, it is generous of you, Mike, and I appreciate it, but... No, thanks. What'll you do? Do what you said I ought to do. Fight this thing. Uh, 
Liz. Mike, if you ever come east, be sure to look me up. We will, Mike. Yes, of course. You, you won't change your mind about the loan? I can't. We'll only be putting off what's bound to happen. Unless... Unless what? Unless I can find the answer to what goes on here. There's something bothering me, something I feel that I saw somewhere but didn't pay much attention to at the time. Well, what about it, this this something? It's just something that's bothering me is all. Something that just could give me the answer to all of this. Hmm. Well, good luck. You deserve it. Oh, there's the taxi that's going to take me to the airport. Goodbye, Liz. Goodbye, Mike. Bye-bye, Bye-bye, Bye-bye Mike, Bye. and thanks. Well, we'd, we'd better get on back, Liz. Liz, you coming? Yes. Mel, you better know it now. No matter what you intend to do, I won't be staying. Mel, we've got to face the facts. Buying this place was a big mistake. I admit it now. But there's no sense in crying over spilt milk. What's done is done. So, darling, let's just turn our backs on it, walk away from it, and start again. Start what again? The treadmill of office work? The dreary day-to-day monotony of auditing accounts, toting up figures? I can't bear to go back to that kind of life. I have got to make a go of this. I don't have any other choice. But is it worth your life? Ghost or no ghost, Mel, it's killed four people. It would have been six if you and Mike Duncan hadn't been lucky enough to hit that stanchion. And it will be six if you insist on driving that road again tonight. Six? How, how, how do you make it six? Well, you don't think I'm going to let you do it alone, do you? But at the funeral, you said that... You said that, that you weren't even going to stay. Because I hope that would change your mind. But it hasn't. So, you see, I have no choice either. <laughs> Just like last night with Mike. From the top of the mountain down to Manitou, then back up again and again, and no sign of him. But he did show, finally. And Mike lost his nerve, swerved aside at the last second. Let's hope I don't lose mine. Will it matter? What do you mean? Well, if you lose your nerve, we'll go off the bridge. If you don't, and the ghost car isn't a ghost car, we'll be killed in a crash. If there is a crash, but there won't be. I'm awfully sure of that. I am. You remember at the cemetery I told Mike there was something I had seen but hadn't paid any attention to? Yes. And that if I could only remember what it was, I'd have the answer to all of this? Yes. Well, it's come to me. Driving up and down the mountain tonight, it suddenly came to me. See, it wasn't something I'd seen. It was something I'd heard and paid no attention to. Something I knew but didn't realize what it meant. And if I'm right, Liz, if I'm right... What is it? What did you remember? We're on the bridge now. Let me concentrate on driving. Mel? Mel! Mel, there it is. The ghost car is coming straight for us. Yes. And behind the wheel, driving him. It's Roy! Oh, my God, it's Roy! Oh, we buried Roy! But then it's his ghost, Mel! Get your hands off the wheel. Don't try to turn the wheel. We're going to crash! Mel! Mel! This time he swerved and he went off the bridge, just as I knew he would. How? How did you know? Later, Liz. Right now, we better get up to the lodge and phone the sheriff. Oh. Oh. Come in, Mrs. Gormley. Mel? Mrs. Gormley's here. Please, won't you sit down? Yeah, thank you. Hello, Mrs. Gormley. I'm sorry about last night. I'm not. Mrs. Gormley, Jason was your son. Oh, he was the torment of my life. Every day I lived. Of course, I'm sorry he's dead, but... Uh, I can only be glad it's over for me. Did you know that your son was the ghost driver? I suspected... But I was never sure. You see, it was Jason who wanted to go on living here in this house far more than I did. 
Oh, you can understand. He was born here. He grew up here. Started his painting career here in a fine, big studio upstairs. Tragic. Just tragic. Even more tragic if it hadn't been for you. How did you come to know? What made you realize that my son was the ghost driver? A gunshot. A gunshot? The shot he fired to see whether the bullet he used for playing Russian roulette was live or not. Well, I don't, I don't follow you. You see, something kept bugging me, Mrs. Gormley, but I, I couldn't nail it down because I kept thinking it was something that I'd seen. But then suddenly I realized it wasn't something I'd seen, but something I'd heard. That gunshot. I, I still don't... See, it, it, it got me to thinking about Jason playing Russian roulette, playing with life and death. And that got me to thinking a step further. Sure, Russian roulette, only a fool or a would-be suicide would play it. But the fact remains that the odds are in his favor. Every time Jason spun the barrel of that gun and pulled the trigger, the chances were five to one against firing the bullet. Oh, but, but what was the connection between that and, and the ghost driver? Driving a car straight at another car is just another form of Russian roulette. Ah, yes, I see. Well, Sheriff Harper came to see me, and he said Jason was wearing a mask, mm. a paper mache mask of your brother's face. Yes, and it wasn't a very good likeness of my brother, but it didn't have to be. It looked enough like him to fool you when you saw it under those awful conditions. The night and the headlights and, and the car coming straight at you. Fear did the rest. There must be another mask, the skeleton face. Oh, there is. We, we, we searched the studio and we found it, Sheriff Harper and me. Yeah, well, it's all over. Jason's at peace at last. God knows I soon shall be. Well, good day. Funny, though. What, Mrs. Gormley? Well, we've searched and we've searched... But we couldn't find a mask of my husband's face. What made you think there was one? Well, you see, when I heard about the masks, I thought it must have been Jason who came and stood at the foot of my bed. Not my husband's ghost. But if it wasn't Jason, who was it? What was it? An interesting question. What was it indeed? I'll be back shortly. Hi, Ms. Goldilocks here. Professionally taste testing diet drinks can be very difficult, but I just had to bear with it. Then I found sugar-free diet 7-Up. It doesn't taste like other diet drinks. It's fresh, light, natural, delicious. Sugar-free diet 7-Up tastes so good that I've taste tested it hundreds of times. And each time I've given it my seal of approval. Yes, this one's just right. Introducing the greatest taste to come out of your toaster since Samuel Bath Thomas baked his original English muffins in 1880. Thomas's new onion English muffins. Little bits of real onion blended into Thomas's original English muffin recipe create a tangy taste that makes everything fantastic, like burgers and cream cheese and cold cuts. Even butter tastes better. Thomas's new onion English muffins. The greatest new taste since 1880. Thomas's promises. Hey, Pat, how tall do you think she is? 300 feet if she's an inch, Luigi, and a fine lady she is. The year 1886. While most New Yorkers were enjoying their first look at the Statue of Liberty, a few were enjoying their first taste of Thomas's bread and discovering it was every bit as delicious as Thomas's English muffins. Today, there's still never been a lady to equal the lady or a bread to equal Thomas's protein, whole wheat, and white bread. Thomas's promises. Here's news from Queen Elizabeth II. Now you can sail to Europe on Queen Elizabeth II and fly home free. I'll repeat that. Sail to Europe on Queen Elizabeth II and fly back to New York free. She reaches Europe in five luxurious days. You have ample time for touring because you fly back. 
Meals and entertainment on board are included. A whole new crowd of people are discovering Queen Elizabeth II because she's affordable and she's fun. She has nine bars, four swimming pools, three nightclubs, a discotheque, a gymnasium, a sauna, a casino, and three of the finest restaurants in the world. Sail first class grades A to H and fly home free. Sail tourists grades L to Q and S to U and fly home half fare. Flights are British Airways economy. You can stay in Europe up to 16 days. Call your travel agent or Cunard at 212-983-2510. Sail to Europe on Queen Elizabeth II and fly home free. Great ships of British registry since 1840. Our cast included Augusta Dabney, Mason Adams, Mary Jane Higby, Norman Rose, Nick Pryor, and Leon Janney. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by New Sugar-Free Diet 7-Up. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. The preceding mystery theater program is furnished by the CBS Radio Network. This is WOR New York. Colton Lewis in the Mutual Broadcasting System studios in Washington, D.C. Now, my commentary. The chairman of the House Judiciary Committee said today he expects his panel to go along with President Nixon's request of today, a request for an additional five days to reply to a subpoena for 42 Watergate tapes. New Jersey Democrat Representative Peter Rodino said that he and the ranking Republican member of the committee had agreed to the postponement. And in Rodino's words, I am quite confident the members of the committee will go along with it, too. He told a news conference the matter will be taken up formally by his committee on Thursday. That's the day the response to the committee subpoena was due. The delay requested by the White House today would put off the response until next Tuesday. At the White House, Deputy Press Secretary Gerald Warren attributed the White House request to the pressure of business at the White House and the demands on the President's time. Chairman Rodino said that the delay was requested by James St. Clair, the President's chief Watergate attorney. It was requested in a telephone call yesterday to John Doerr, the chief counsel of the impeachment inquiry. The chairman said that he and Representative Edward Hutchinson of Michigan, the ranking Republican member of the committee, instructed Doerr to ask St. Clair why at least some of the subpoenaed material could not be furnished on Thursday. St. Clair told Doerr that the president wanted to review all of the material at once before sending it to Capitol Hill. Rodino said St. Clair, though, gave no assurance that all of the subpoenaed material would be given to the committee. Asked about reports of the White House plan to give the panel transcripts rather than tapes, Chairman Rodino replied transcripts would not be satisfactory. White House Deputy Press Secretary Warren said a lot of work has, has been and is being done to compile the material necessary to prepare a response. The president himself has spent many, many hours reviewing the response and has determined that he would like some extra time to review the response in its entirety. Warren would give no clue as to the likely nature of the eventual reply to the subpoena. He said only the president has not finally decided on the form and content of the response. Asked if the request for a delay might not be considered inconsistent with repeated White House calls for a speedy resolution of the impeachment question, Warren said, quote, It is consistent with our position and with the president's position to deal responsibly with the House Judiciary Committee, and that is what we are doing. Back on April 11th, the committee voted 33 to 3 to subpoena the tapes that it had been seeking since fe February. The president also faces a second subpoena. That one has a May 2nd deadline. That one is for additional tapes and other materials that are being sought by Special Watergate Prosecutor Leon Jaworski. Asked if the president might not also seek an extension of the May 2nd deadline, Warren said today, I know of no such requests. Now, this. What has Sheraton done for you lately? What has Sheraton done for you now? Next time you travel to Canada for business or pleasure, you'll find 20 sparkling Sheraton hotels and motor inns coast to coast, from Quebec to British Columbia. What has Sheraton done for you lately?
In Toronto, the new Four Seasons Sheraton has a five-story waterfall right in the lobby. In Vancouver, there are two new Sheratons. And for a reservation at any Sheraton, call 800-325-3535 or have your travel agent call. That's 800-325-3535. That's what Sheraton Sheraton Hotels and Motor Inns Worldwide. White House officials say privately that they're not really sure how they should interpret Vice President Gerald Ford's remarks to 1,300 newspaper and broadcast industry leaders yesterday. One school of thought is that he was not taking any pot shots at the president. Others, however, read into his comments a significant break from Mr. Nixon on the Watergate tapes issue. The vice president said that the president might have tried harder to get the story of Watergate out sooner and that he should begin cooperating as fully as possible to clear the issue up now. A committee subpoena for tapes and documents, of course, was due Thursday, but the request has been made now to postpone that till Tuesday. Ford, in his speech yesterday, said, It's pretty hard to put yourself back into the shoes of somebody else in a situation like this. I do read the newspapers very extensively. I could not have been oblivious to some of the things that were going on that has taken place or has transpired. It would be my technique, he said, if I were in those shoes, which I hope and trust does not take place. But it would be my technique to want to find out as quickly as possible. I assume that the president did. In fact, I have good reason to believe that he did. Unfortunately, the vice president added... Unfortunately, some of the people who should have known obviously did not give him the full story. Now, whether there should have been a more vigorous prosecution of all the details, that's a matter of judgment. And in my case, I think I could have tried to nudge some of my employees about as hard as I possibly could. Ford went on to say that the president knew nothing in advance about the burglary and bugging of the Democratic Party headquarters in Washington's Watergate complex during the 1972 presidential campaign... The vice president also said that he is confident that the president had not committed any impeachable offense under the Constitution. But he nonetheless urged the president to make every effort to settle the issue once and for all. The vice president said, I have indicated to him on a number of occasions that I thought he should do anything reasonable in order to clear up the problems that have developed subsequent to Watergate itself. I have consistently said the sooner any and all relevant evidence was made available the better the Congress could consider and the American people evaluate whether or not the president was involved prior to, at the time of, or subsequent to, the Watergate break-in. The vice president added, I hope and trust that sometime in the next 48 or 72 hours, the White House will cooperate to the maximum in making available to the House Committee on the Judiciary the relevant material that the committee has requested. He drew applause from his audience when he added, I strongly believe that to be the right course of action, and I hope and trust the decision follows that pattern. Welcome to the world of eerie imagination. The fear you can hear. Vendetta. The very word itself invokes dread and strikes the mood of brooding terror. But to live on the island of Corsica, home of the Vendetta, is to be steeped in the tradition of violent massacres and the fatalistic expectation of ferocious vengeance as a way of life. At least it would have been so just a hundred years ago when these famous words were first written. It was a hand. A man's hand. Not a skeleton hand all bright and clean, but a hand black and desiccated with the yellow nails, the naked muscles, and traces of blood upon the bones at the point where they had been severed as with the blow of an axe about the middle of the forearm. The fingers, extraordinarily long, were attached to enormous tendons. 
still held in their places here and there by strips of skin. That hand was something hideous. It made one think involuntarily of savage vengeance. And in spite of the putrescent look of death and dissolution, it seemed to have a life of its own. Our mystery drama, The Hand, was especially adapted from the Guy de Maupassant classic for the Mystery Theater by Ian Martin and stars Alexander Scorby. I'll be back shortly with Act One. At the time of the bizarre and terrifying affair of the hand, Ari Donet was a police magistrate in Ayacho, a charming little white city nestled on the edge of a beautiful gulf shut in by lofty mountains. Most of the cases he had to investigate or prosecute there were cases of vendetta. But these were Corsican against Corsican. This affair of the hand was alien against what? Something far more alien, perhaps supernatural. That was not until later, of course. For now, the only alien presence was a neighbor of Henri's, a Sir John Rowell lately come to the island to settle down and an object of great speculation among the native population. Well, there goes my new neighbor again. <laughs> Does he go hunting at twilight? No, Bernard. At least there's a magistrate. I hope not. Well, what's he shooting at then? I don't know, Marguerite. We have no sharks. The wolves and other predators stay in the mountains and uh, he's not been here long enough to start a vendetta. <laughs> Oh, I am not sure. Listen to that. Oh, no call for alarm, Doctor. I'm quite sure your services will not be needed. It is the same pattern, night and morning. Well, Henri, then what is he shooting at? A target, I suppose. He's keeping his eye sharp. But for what? Ah, now, that is the question. Have you seen him? He is immense and very powerful. And he doesn't encourage visitors. He has two huge Alsatian hounds that look ready for the kill at a word. You are chief magistrate, and in a far better position to judge him than any Henri. What do you make of him? I don't know. His papers are in order. I have no reason to have any professional interest in him. Well, has he no one to share his loneliness? Mm, he has a manservant he brought with him from Marseille. Mm, no one else. There was a woman listed on the ship's manifest as his wife. Oh, his wife? Mm. Well, I never knew... Well, then, but no one seems to know that. In the months he's been here, no one has seen hide nor hair of her. I've watched these evenings myself, and I've never seen her move from the house. If, indeed, she is inside it. So, you see, Marguerite, very soon, both as friend and policeman, I'm going to have to satisfy your curiosity, oh. and my own, about the mysterious Sir John Rowell. For a while, however, I had to content myself with having a close watch set over the man. None of my people could find anything suspicious enough in his actions for us to make any move. But as the strange rumors about him continued and increased, I resolved to see the stranger face to face for myself. I made a point of going hunting every day in the neighborhood of his place. It took me a little while, but at last, one day... So, bien, Fernand, hold the point. You flushed him, ah! Got him right under the Englishman's nose. Go fetch him, Fernand. Fernand, hold. Hold him. Whiskey! Down, boy, down! That's it. Good dog, hold. Here, Whiskey, here. My apologies, sir. You're a bird, I believe? No, no, not at all. I shot him right from under you. Sorry. I didn't know you were there. <laughs> Nor I, you. Uh, oh, allow me. I'm John Rowell. Yes, I know, Sir John. I am your neighbor up there on the hill, Henri Donnet. Pleasure. Damn fine shot. Sir John, will you accept the game as an apology for shooting over your field? Uh, that's very generous. I'll accept on one condition. <laughs> What's that, Sir John? That you let me return the compliment and ask you to join me in a glass of ale. Good. I will be only too glad to accept. <laughs> It was 
less the heat of the day than my professional interest that prompted me to accept the invitation from the tall man with the red hair and beard. Very tall indeed. And also very broad, a sort of placid and polite Hercules. I was most anxious to be able to question him about his life and his projects. Joseph, out here on the veranda. Change your mind and have something stronger? Oh, no, 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 no. Ale will be perfect. Are you called, Sir John? Uh, yes, two glasses of ale for Monsieur Donnet and myself. Uh, very well, sir. And uh, bring a cut of Stilton and some water biscuits. Uh, you like our English cheeses? Oh, yes, I do. We are quite insular enough here on Corsica. It's a rare pleasure to indulge in a foreign taste. <laughs> I know what you mean. Still, I can't feel that Corsica, or for that matter, anything French is any way foreign to me. Ah, Joseph, splendid. Thank you. Uh, put the tray on the table here. Uh, yes, sir. You can loose the dogs again. We'll be quite safe while I'm with Monsieur Donnet. Very well, sir. Oh, those are the big Alsatians I see occasionally, huh? Mm, two of them. Yes, yes. They look quite uh, savage and fierce. Do you think perhaps my dog will... Oh, uh, have no fear. Castor and Pollux are as docile as kittens where other animals are concerned. They're trained as man-killers. Huh? And then, only at my command. Uh, your health, Monsieur Donnet. To yours. Mmm. Delicious. So refreshing. Mm. As the view of the sun setting across that blue Mediterranean water. Yes, yes. Uh, does Madame Rowell also share your enthusiasm for your adopted island? Lady Rowell is uh, an invalid. I hope to nurse her back to health here. Oh, if I could suggest the offices of my good friend, Dr. Forestier. If a doctor should be needed. Oh, forgive me, I, I had no desire well, there's to There's nothing pry. to pry into. Natural curiosity. I must admit, I, I do find it hard to cast you in the category of a, a recluse. Oh, yes. I've traveled a great deal. Africa, India, even America. And as for adventures, yes, I've had plenty of adventures. Oh, yes. Big game hunting, huh? What? Oh, of course. I've hunted them all. Tiger, elephant, rhinoceros, gorilla... The name's a legion. Oh, all very dangerous animals. Terribly so. Not really. When you compare them to the worst of all. Oh, what? <laughs> what else, Monsieur Donnet? In your profession, you must know him too. Man. Man himself. Hey! Hey, Sir, Sir John, hey! Come quickly! What's on earth? Hey! Hey, Sir John! Oh, forgive me. No, no, no. I followed Sir John down the front steps of the veranda as he took them two at a time and disappeared around the corner of the house. I would have followed him further, ex except as chance had it, I, I, I turned my ankle quite severely on a loose stone after the bottom step. Stopping in momentary pain, the yelp and snarl of the dog suddenly quieted, and I was conscious of the, the squeak of the front door of the house. Arrested, I looked up, to see, framed in the doorway, a tall, emaciated woman with great, bruised half-circles underlining her eyes that, that stared with a feverish gleam. She wore a long, loose, trailing peignoir, and with one hand, she beckoned towards me while clutching something in the other close beneath her breast. Painfully, I limped back up the steps. Help me. Whoever you are, help me. Lady Rowell. Whoever I am, this side of the grave, help me. But how? By sending this letter. Both days, oh, but please, please, I beg of you on all our lives. Don't. Don't tell such a... Oh, I'm afraid, madame, oh, I... Please, don't, don't refuse me. You are my last, best hope. Hope for what? I did not stay in case... He returns, but please, I beg of you, send my letter. She was gone, like a wraith, as though she'd never been. But the letter in my hand was real enough. Before I had time to read the person to whom it was addressed, I found myself involuntarily concealing it in my pocket before Sir John returning could see it. 
Nor could I stop to ponder why my impulse had been to accept the lady's part rather than that of my charming and seemingly outgoing host. Why I chose to conceal its existence rather than reveal it. My dear Monsieur Donnet, pray forgive me. I'm most sorry we had to be interrupted. Oh, forgive me for not following you, but I turned my ankle. What happened? Oh, the curse of trying to maintain privacy. The curiosity seeker. A farmer from back in the hills named Deschamps, who passes by here on his daily route, for some unearthly reason came skulking round the back of the house and was cornered by the dogs. But uh, what would he have expected to find here? Heaven knows. I've no secrets worth anyone's concern but my own. Uh, as I hope you believe. Or is your presence here today more than just a seeming accident? Are you concealing something from me, sir? For the first time, I was aware that he wore about his loins an American-style gun belt. And that low on each hip, concealed by the flare of his coattails, were two matched pistols with mother-of-pearl handles, on one of which his right hand rested lightly. The letter in my pocket seemed to burn through the lining as I tried to judge whether it caressed that handle by accident or design. These were only the hands of Sir John, neither of which is the one in the title of our story. To meet that special hand, you must return with me shortly for Act Two. red-haired and bearded Englishman towers over the small, dapper Frenchman. They are as widely disparate men as you can imagine. One all muscle and vital force, the other elastic, supple, poised always for the counterstroke, like a rapier. Antagonists? No. Only in a sense. But whatever their relationship, mutually admiring of each other. Why should you imagine I have anything to conceal? Why, indeed. Come, let's go inside. I'll show you some of the trophies of a roving life, uh, if you'd be interested. But very, of course. Uh, can you stand on your ankle all right? Is it uh, sprained? No, 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 no. Just a slight twist. From the hall, he led me into his parlor, which ran the length and breadth of the whole house across the back in a great L. His parlor was all hung in black. Black silk, embroidered in gold. The fabric is Japanese work. Yes, yes, but... But the rest is yours. Uh, not the panels. What's mounted on them? Yes, tiger, lion, black panther. Those I recognize. And elephant tusks, I see. The hippo and he and the rhino are a little large for mounting. The rhinoceros is the most dangerous of all, I suppose. Except, as I told you before. <laughs> now, you're not honestly going to tell a policeman that you're a manhunter. <laughs> not within the confines of civilization, I hope. But I've uh, done a good deal of manhunting, too, in my time. Uh, as a soldier? That's a profession, not a sport. I've saved a mount in the center for the ultimate trophy. But uh, never had, shall we say, the courage to make the necessary bag to mount it. I was following the direction of his gaze to a gapingly empty panel in this bizarre and gory collection from the hunt. A panel conspicuous from all the others since it was lined in red velvet, as if in expectance of framing the pièce de résistance. What would you hope to put there? Once, I would have been tempted. Now, nothing. I keep it there to remind me that it could be my own head that poetic justice could have easily decided to frame. Oh, Gad, it's suddenly getting dark. Yes, then I must be off for home. I mustn't hold up your dinner. I've enjoyed our meeting thoroughly. Please, come again. You're always welcome. Well, I'm not quite so sure of your Alsatians. Oh, you need have no worry... From now on, they'll treat you as a friend, as I hope I can. 
as I want to be. We shook hands, mine disappearing inside his huge one. My conscience stinging at me as I fought a battle between Donay the man and Donay the policeman. Climbing the hill back to my villa with Fernand frisking along beside me, I tried to tell myself I was only being practical, that I was giving myself time to make my decision. A decision that was tipped by the testimony I received from Michel Deschamps as I questioned him at the barracks the following morning. Michel, why did you go so near to his house? Well, everybody is curious about him, and... Everybody doesn't go near enough to have two dogs attack him. Well, everybody does not have a milk coat which takes him twice a day by the Englishman's house to see her. To see her? Well, it is at dawn, you know. Just before the sun comes up in the half-light and I am passing by in my car. Naturally, I I am looking at the house when I pass. Naturally, I would myself. So, you see, at that hour, nobody is stirring. Even the dogs are not yet awake. And then I see by the upstairs window a woman. The first few days, I'm not sure. I, I cost myself she is not some witch or somebody who wants to steal my soul. Why would she be a witch? Because... Well, at any rate, in that light, she looked so... I, I was afraid to answer. Hmm? To answer what? Her signal to come near to her. She kept beckoning as if there was something she must ask me to do. And finally, yesterday morning, I, I could stand it no longer. I had to go see what she wanted to ask. Was that so wrong? No, of course not, Michel. I would have done the same. But the dog stopped you, huh? Y- yes. In a way, I, I'm sorry. Don't feel that you let her down. But from now on, mind your own business. Oh, I, I accept your instruction. I, I will follow what you advocate. What I advocate, by all means. Not what I do. I, I, I don't understand you. Sometimes, even a magistrate has to admit... I do not understand myself. But that is not for you to worry about. That very morning, there was a mail packet sailing. And I sent off the letter. Quickly, almost surreptitiously, without looking at the address. Except for the fact that it was to the United States of America. And I forgot it, I imagined. And the months went by. Oh, I do think it's very tedious of you, Henri. <laughs> Madame Forestier. Oh, well, either for reasons of your own, you are protecting our most famous visitor from the rest of us, or, well, <laughs> he has some hold over you to protect his precious privacy. <laughs> he has no hold over me. Oh. Quite the contrary. But if he wishes to be private, I would be the first to protect his right. Well, on, on a small island like this, why should he have it any more than the rest of us? <laughs> Touché. But if he can, why shouldn't he? Oh, huh? Henri, you know I don't know how to answer that. All I want to know is, do I have any hope that they might attend my garden set next month? They? Well, there is a Madame Roel. Yes, but she is... Uh... Sickly. Ah, well, is there some hope that at least uh, Sir John might be coaxed to appear? No, I have no reason to suppose that he would refuse. Now, Lady Rowell, I would find it hard to answer for. Well, then, all I want for you is to issue the invitation. Please, may I count on you for that? Marguerite. <laughs> We're all old friends. Did you ask? <laughs> my doubts about Sir John and more particularly his lady attending any local garden fete. But I could scarcely in my wildest imaginings have foreseen how extravagantly and tragically it would be impossible. As I approached the house in the hollow below me, I was in a first class mood because in addition to a packet from the mail ship for my host, I also bought a bottle of sherry to share with him that in my opinion was one of a kind. He met me at the veranda. 
Well, this is an unexpected pleasure. We had a mail ship in today. I brought you a parcel. Me? Yes. And I thought I'd outstrip the mail. Vain hope. A parcel, you say? This. What on earth? It might be a gun from its shape, but it scarcely weighs enough. Uh, Shall we go to the parlor while I open my surprise parcel? As we moved into that parlor, I was super conscious of my host's reaction to the parcel he bore in his hands. Although there was no superscription from the sender, I had an infallible feeling that he sensed exactly where it had come from. That somehow I was accidentally part of a climax in the life of this strange and vital man. We've talked about my trophies, Monsieur Donnet. Yes. The ones I've mounted, the others too clumsy and large to render that way. Yes. And the third and different class, so far I've had no right nor courage to mount. What are you saying, Sir John? There is no reason for my receiving this parcel that I can conceive, except one. That I've found no refuge here. I've been betrayed. Only my wife could have done that. And who else is there to have aided her determination to destroy me? You're asking me? Yes. You're the only link we have to the world beyond this house. Sir John, I... Believe me, I had no wish to betray you. I'm sure of that. The day we met, your wife, while you were calming the dogs, your wife asked me to send a letter for her. To Richard Roll? Well, I must admit I did not read the address. I did notice that it was to the United States of America. I meant no harm. He meant no harm. Like Pandora, who naively opened a chest to loose pestilence and all the evils of the world to plague mankind, he meant no harm. It seemed a simple and reasonable request. So you exceeded. No doubt she also asked you to conceal the fact of the letter from me. Yes, I am afraid she did. Were you sorry for her ravaged looks, her haunted eyes? Did you picture me as some monstrous jailer, condemning her to a life of solitary confinement? Sir John, I can only defend my action by telling you that at the time she did engage my sympathy. I told you, I believe, that my wife was not in the best of health. Yes, but... uh, The fault, perhaps, was all mine. I should have told you that she is insane... Oh, I, I'm so sorry. A little late for that. Done. You may have sealed her death warrant. Perhaps even mine. Good God, what do you mean? This parcel from America. Would you like to see what evil out of hell you're acceding to that simple and reasonable request has set loose? Sir John, You I... have involved yourself in this on a personal level. Now I want to involve you on a professional one. As police magistrate, I want you as witness when I open this gift from America. The outer wrapping. Now what do you see? A box. And within it? Uh, Something wrapped in in canvas. You wrinkle your nose against the smell? Yes, it's it's very strong. And uh, very familiar? Yes, formaldehyde which is used to preserve flesh from mortifying. There's a drawstring on the canvas, which I'm opening. And I'm about to show you my present from the other side of the world. You sound as if you know what it is. I only wish to God I thought I didn't. I echoed the same wish. But it didn't change the contents. It was a hand. A man's hand. Not a skeleton hand, all bright and clean. But a hand... black and desiccated. With traces of blood upon the bones at the point where they had been severed as with the blow of an axe about the middle of the forearm. The fingers, extraordinarily long, were attached to enormous tendons still held in their places by strips of skin. Flayed as it was... That hand was something hideous. It made one think involuntarily of savage vengeance. 
And in spite of the putrescent look of death and dissolution it had, it seemed to have a life of its own. So now we see the embodiment of the title of our story. A poor choice of words, since nothing can be more disembodied than a severed hand. Whose hand? And why? And are these nerveless fingers really capable of writing a death warrant? I'll return shortly with Act Three. In sick horror, his stomach churning with revulsion, Monsieur Denet looks at the loathsome object spilled on the desk between him and Sir John. In macabre fascination, his eyes seem riveted to the severed hand. It is only by a supreme effort of will that he is at last able to drag them away and up to Sir John's grim and haunted face. What is it? The hand of a thief. But why? What? Why is it sent to you? So that there'll be no mistake in my mind who sends it. You said before, Richard Roll. A relation? My twin brother. Younger by less than an hour. As the firstborn, I acceded to the title. The barony was mine, and the living that went with it. Richard had nothing except my bounty. Our whole life was a gigantic struggle for supremacy. He, because I denied it him, I... Because I had to hold it. If you had everything and he had nothing, what chance did he stand against you? Well, I'm English, and I believe in fair play. I couldn't share the title, but I made sure the living was shared equally. I'm not ill-favored, and I'm exceptionally powerful and large. But Richard was taller by two inches, stronger by far, and a wild and darkly handsome man that stirred women to a passion beyond their senses. Until Claire. Madame Rowell? My wife, yes. Whatever her true name should be now. When we were married, my brother Richard emigrated to the States. And you have never seen him since? Oh, yes. I have seen him. I'd hoped for the last time. Will you forgive me now? There's been too much talk. And I must find a place to hang my latest trophy. To hang it? You can't do I think I've had quite enough interference from you in my affairs, Monsieur Donnet. I must ask you to leave my house. You're no longer welcome. It seemed a long journey up the hill that night. For I did not climb it alone. On the way back to my house, I was haunted by a hundred thoughts. Had I done wrong to send the letter? Whose was the severed hand? What was the mystery of Sir John's retirement? And what motivated the vendetta of his brother against him? Old jealousies? Or was it all as simple as chercher la femme? Certainly, she would not be hard to find. It must be the lady role. If a woman was at the heart of it all. Only one thing I could be sure of now. That I should not be seeing him again. But I was badly mistaken about that. Well, Joseph, what brings you here? Uh, begging your honor's pardon, but Sir John asks if it would be convenient for you to wait on him this evening. Of course, when? If it would suit your honor, now would be fine. It suits me. After my churlishness on your last visit, I am more than touched that you do me this honor, Monsieur Denis. Since I am still concerned that I may have done you more harm than honor, I couldn't have hesitated. I have some papers here on my desk that I wish to leave in your charge after asking you and Joseph to witness them. What kind of papers, Sir John? My last will and testament. Some property assignments. The legal debris that follows sudden death. Uh, Joseph? Yes, Sir John. Will you sign here? 
And here... Yes, sir. Is there all this immediacy, sir? In the midst of life, are we not all equally in the midst of death? Thank you, Joseph. You may go. Yes, sir, John. Now, you, Monsieur Donnet, if you want me to, but I see no reason why. Whatever polite disclaimer was on my lips, it was frozen at that moment as my eyes fell on a blood-chilling sight. A black object in the midst of the empty panel lined with red velvet. Empty no longer. It was the hand, mounted now as the chief of all trophies. But different from all the others in one respect. They were mounted. This was imprisoned. Round the wrist, an enormous chain of iron had been riven about the foul relic, and this chain fastened the hand to the wall by a great ring, solid enough to hold an elephant in leash. Good God! Ah, yes, the hand. Well, better than my own head, if I can keep it. Will you sign? Well, yes, of course. Is it? That hand. That was part of my best enemy. It was cut off with a saber. Good thing for me, I can tell you. It's huge. Enormously powerful. The man must have been very strong. And so far, I've proved stronger. I put the chain on the hand to hold it. The chain is no use now. The hand can't get away. The chain is necessary. This hand always tries to get away. nightmare. I dreamt I saw the hand, the horrible hand, running like a scorpion or a spider along the curtains and up and down the walls of my room. Three times I woke up, three times I went to sleep again, three times I saw the ghastly thing running all over my room and using its fingers like so many legs. I was awakened by the news that Sir John Rowell had been murdered during the night. For God's sake, Bernard, act like a doctor instead of some frightened schoolgirl. No, you... You have not seen him yet, old friend. Well, is it the first corpse either of us has had the misfortune to look at? The first like this. Oh, how did he die? The cause of death was strangling, but... Under what shocking conditions. I tell you, Henri, in 30 years as a physician, I have never seen anything like it. In what way? We found him lying on his back in the middle of the room. His coat was torn, one shirt sleeve half pulled off was hanging down. There was every indication that a fearsome struggle had taken place. His face was black and swollen, frightfully distorted. But... The most noticeable and terrifying thing was his expression. His expression? Absolute, hideous fear. And small wonder. For in the welter of blood that was coagulated about his throat, five separate wounds pierced through it as though driven by points of iron. Only five? It was as if he had been strangled by a skeleton who... But that is odd. What? What you just said. Hmm? Only five. Well, of course, how stupid of me. There was only evidence of one hand having done the strangling. That makes it even more bizarre. Is there anything even faintly normal about this whole affair? Now, Joseph... You heard no unusual noise during the night. Oh, no, Monsieur the Magistrate. You sleep where? Well, here in that, that little room off the kitchen there. And there was no sound from the dogs all night long? Oh, no, sir. Yet if a stranger had approached the house... Oh, those dogs would have torn him apart if, if he was a stranger. But they were quiet. You would have heard them if they had not been, huh? Well, I'm a very light sleeper. 
Did you sleep late this morning? No, no. I'm awake before cocks crow, you see. So many things to be done. Water to be drawn, the fire to be laid. And that's what you were busy with when Lady Rowell left the house? I I was already preparing breakfast for Sir John and a tray to bring up to... uh, You see, that's why I was so surprised when she walked into the kitchen fully dressed. And what did you say to that? Well, it's not my place to ask. I, I, I just said, what do you want? And? and? Well, she said she, she didn't want anything. Just that she was feeling better. And if Sir John should ask about her, she was off for a little walk along the beach. Oh, that didn't strike you as peculiar? Oh, it most certainly did. And did she go towards the beach? Well, I would have thought so. I didn't actually check on it. Why? You're not aware that that she's disappeared. Dis- oh, no, sir. Well, we'll leave that for a moment. All right, then what did you do then? Well, once I had everything simmering like for breakfast, I went up to Sir John's room to assist him in his toilet. You were in this habit? Every morning, regular as clockwork. Continue. Well, he wasn't there, sir. His bed hadn't been slept in. Turned down just the way I left it the night before. So I became alarmed. Everything was out of sorts, you see. I see. And and then you came downstairs and found him. That's right. Oh, covered with blood from head to foot. It, it, it just don't signify. Now, what does that mean? Well, you knew, Sir John, sir. If ever there was a man built and ready to take care of himself, it was he. Why, he never slept without having loaded pistols or revolvers within arm's reach. And he knew how to use them. Yes, yes. Have you any idea who killed him? Oh, no, sir. Could it have been Lady Rowe? Not a chance, sir. I met her once. She was a tall woman. Oh, but wasted away, Your Honor, and weak as a kitten. Then who? I don't know, sir. I... I don't even want to know. Neither did I. Or at least to check on what was in my mind. But I had a duty to my position. And I must admit, a morbid drive to support my supposition. He was lying, just as he is now, on this carpet here. That's right, sir. His feet pointed in the same direction. Uh, Toward the door. And uh, his head? As it is, uh, towards the panel directly ahead of you. I felt a, a creeping sensation that lifted the hackles on my neck. I knew, before I looked, what I was going to say. The sight that I had fought against making a reality. At last, involuntarily, I lifted my eyes to the wall, to the panel where the horrible flayed hand used to be. It was no longer there. The chain, broken, was dangling from the ring. But even that horror was to be succeeded by another. As I bent again over the dead man, between his clenched teeth, I found one of the fingers of the vanished hand, severed or rather sawed off by the teeth about the middle of the second joint. Henri, forgive us for violating the sacred precincts of your police office, but the axle of my carriage is broken and we are here to beg you to carry us home. If you are ready to go. I am always at your service. And tonight, since it grows dark early these evenings, I will welcome company. But surely you're, you're not still brooding over Sir John and his vanished lady? The missing Lady Rowell I can accept. Our gulf is beautiful, but the tides are treacherous, and her hold on life at best was tenuous. Perhaps she wanted to end it. The mystery of Sir John is something else again. Uh... Something best forgotten, I think. Yes. But it doesn't seem to want to be. Let me show you. Marguerite, forgive me. If you feel faint, close your eyes. Yes. Bernard, you remember you said he might have been strangled by a skeleton? Yes. Yes. 
Might he have been strangled by this? <gasps> Good Lord. Oh. So that is the famous hand. Yes, yes, if it were possible, such a hand could have made the wounds on his throat, but... Where did you find this? It was discovered last night in the cemetery on the tomb of Sir John Rawl. And mark one thing well. What? The index finger is missing. <gasps> the one we found in the corpse's mouth. The hand of a thief, Sir John Rawl said. His brother Richard? What is so? What did he steal? His wealth? His reputation? His wife? And if his brother, in some gargantuan and titanic duel, struck off his hand, and Richard sought vengeance, which of his hands was the instrument that brought an end to the intense and private vendetta? De Maupassant doesn't tell us. Wisely, he leaves that to us to decide for ourselves. I'll be back shortly. I won't easily close my eyes tonight for fear that my mind's eye will conjure up a vision of the black and desiccated hand with the yellow nails scrabbling like some loathsome crab across the floor up and over my bed and scuttling around the walls. It's four good fingers moving like spider legs, the mutilated stump of the fifth like a head. Our cast included Alexander Scorby, Ian Martin, Mildred Clinton, and Guy Sorrell. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. You will be haunted by the magnet that drew you to me. The weapon with which I ruined your life and will destroy you. My smile, Ernest. My smile. No. Look at me. Sensuous lips bearing milk white. Perfectly matched teeth. Look. Oh, Here, let me. She's falling across the table. I think. Yes. She's gone. Berenice is dead. No. Ernest, don't. Her mouth. She is staring at me with her teeth. Anthony. In heaven's name, close her mouth. Close her mouth! This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. I'm E.G. Marshall. Welcome to another adventure into the incomprehensible. I like to think of myself as a thinking person, a reflective man, someone not given to fanciful imaginings. That's the way I like to think of myself. But is that the way I am? Because I must admit that my thinking has not solved many problems for me. My reflections have not carried me very far. So now and again I find it extremely salutary to indulge in fanciful imaginings, 
to take a short walk into the world of obscurantism. For, as you will hear one of our characters say, the mind makes so many mistakes. Our mystery drama, Sunset to Sunrise, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Elspeth Eric and stars Marion Seldes. It is sponsored in part by the Kellogg Company, makers of Kellogg Special K Cereal, and by Anheuser-Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Oh, sure. You can talk about good-tasting diet drinks, but I know. I'm Goldilocks, and here at my taste-testing laboratory, I taste-test them all. And nobody's been drinking my diet drinks. Until I tested sugar-free Diet 7-Up. And then, kabloomy, every bear wanted some. Diet 7-Up is fresh, natural, delicious. Sugar-free Diet 7-Up. This one's just right. AMCO Transmissions, Chuck speaking. How may we help you? Oh, boy, have I got problems. I got a really fantastic 58 Pontiac with a busted automatic transmission and a mother-in-law that's been visiting me for ten days. <laughs> well, well, we can help you with the Pontiac. No, don't get a desperate man. Now, look, can you really fix up a car that old? Oh, sure. AMCO serviced over three million automatic transmissions and over 400,000 of them were Pontiacs. We know Pontiacs cold. Pontiac, Ventura, and the Firebirds, and the Bonneville... Carolina, and also Grand Prix. Terrific. Okay, now look, you send the tow truck and I'll help her pack. Oh, you yeah, mean... Yeah, but the 58 Pontiac belongs to my mother-in-law. Aw, oh, nobody knows her automatic transmission better than AMCO. Double A. MCO. There are over 500 AMCO centers coast-to-coast. Coast. Consult your yellow pages for the AMCO center near you. Double A, MCO, AMCO. It's over. I've done it. And the mutilated body lies silent and still at my feet. Let her release come soon. Let me try to explain how I came to do this awful thing. It will be necessary to go back. Far back, even to the day I was born. Or farther than that. To the hour when, awash in her warm blood, I felt myself pushed down that dark canal into the chilling light. Oh, yes. The woman who lies before me is my mother. But I shall content myself with reverting to the day of her funeral. A gray and dismal day. A long line of villagers passed by the open coffin. I waited with my father until the last of them should have finished viewing the corpse. Marie isn't here. She will be, Father. And and Peter? Oh, I'm not so sure about Peter. His own mother? Not to be here? He's drowning his sorrow, I think. Oh, oh you were right about Marie. Here she comes. But how strange she looks, how quite distraught. I wouldn't know why. She never had any affection for her mother-in-law. Hello, Marie. We we were worried. We Oh, I, I'm not too late, am I? No, the funeral hasn't even started. I mean, they haven't closed the coffin. Not yet. Good. I suppose Peter's... Oh, and... Where does your brother go when, when he's needed somewhere? To a bar. I know. At least today, Marie, try... Try to think kindly of your husband. You think kindly of him? He's your son. Shh, shh, shh. We can move up now. Marie, you go first. No, no. Let your father go first. Father? Uh, oh, all right. How sad. How small he looks. Yes. Small. You go next, Marie. Marie stood for a second or two by the open coffin, then moved on. Now it was my turn. My eyes filled suddenly with tears. And when I looked down at the quiet body, the expressionless face of my mother, 
I could scarcely make out her features. I shook the tears away and I, I made an effort to see her clearly. Across her breast lay a long spray of wild roses. Without conscious thought, I did what I had never done while she lived. I leaned over and kissed her on the lips. funeral was over, I sat dry-eyed through it all, and I saw the tears stream down my father's face. After it was over, he said to me, Would you walk home with me, Una? Of course I will, Father. Do you think you could stay and, and talk for a while? I, m- m- maybe I could fix you a little supper. Oh, I'd like that very much. Uh, I- Ilya won't mind? Oh, it doesn't matter about Ilya. I took his hand. He let me have it like a trusting child. And we started down the road. The familiar landscape had embraced me all my life. And now it brought back sights and sounds from long ago. And on this day, most particularly, the sight and sound of my mother as I had known her. I saw her handsome, flushed face. I heard her voice. How sharper than a serpent's tooth to have a thankless child. What have I done that was so wrong? Why am I being punished to be given a daughter with no shame, no morals, no no sense of decency? My father trudged on beside me without speaking. His tears had dried. He looked as he'd always looked. Very sweet, very simple. She had been the single love of his life. I had never heard him speak of any other woman. He'd fallen in love with her when she was 16 and waited five years to marry her. It was my mother who got me to marry him. But he wasn't really of my world. Nothing intellectual about him. What could you expect of a farmer? But marry him, she did. And he never asked for anything else. The two children she bore him... First my brother Peter, and then me. Well, we were simply two minor gifts she added to the supreme one of herself. And Peter always belonged more to her than to him. It's hell to be poor, Peter. Never let it happen to you. Oh, the stories I could tell you about what poverty can do to the ardent soul. It took Peter a while to get started. But once he got his foot on the ladder, he climbed steadily to the top. And along the way, he married the prettiest girl in town, the dark-eyed Marie. We're here, you know. What? <laughs> you, you were dreaming. We're, we're at the house. Oh. Yeah, I, I must have been dreaming. Oh, it's a long time. Very long time since you've been in the old house. Two years. You're, uh... You're happy living with Elia? I don't ask to be happy. But you, well, you're, you're pleased with the arrangement? It pleases us both. Go on in. It looks the same. Well, nothing's changed. Can I get you something? A, a hot drink? No, no. You sit down and I'll get you something. Oh, take off your coat. Let me help you. Uh, yes, thank you. What's uh, this? What's inside your coat? What? Oh, 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 oh that I, I... I forgot. Well, it's sewn in. Did you do that? What is it? Well, it... it, it it's a sprig of blackthorn. Well, that's what I thought. Why is it sewn inside your coat? Marie put it there. Well, what on earth for? Una, sit down. I... You know, Marie's a strange girl. She she came here from another country and... where they believe strange things. Such as what? Well, you must know. Ilya must have told you. Ilya's parents were gypsies, but he's not. But he hasn't forgotten, has he? What they believe, the gypsies... You don't mean that you... They believe... 
in the living dead. The dead who refuse to die. You mean vampires? That is what you mean, isn't it? I, 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 I never said I believe. But you let her sew the blackthorn into your coat. But I couldn't stop her. But why now? Why to death? You don't mean... Mother? Marie believes your mother has become a vampire. I wanted to laugh. We were sober, hard-working, God-fearing people. We were not superstitious, given to odd beliefs. But I looked into my father's face, and I could not laugh. I I've never believed... But... But what? I have heard that people of... of great energy, enormous will, with a... a surpassing belief in themselves, these are the people who will not die. They refuse to die. When death is upon them, they are so angry that they will not submit. You know, Una, what... what energy your mother had, what... A dominating person she was. How, how much she believed in herself. She never believed in us. Only in herself. That's the way she was. And they say that people like that would rather live the evil life of a vampire than not live at all. Well, I can't believe it. It's horrible. Well, I don't want to believe it, but Marie seems so sure. Well, I'm going to talk to her right now. I, I won't stay for supper, but forgive me. I have to get this terrible notion out of Marie's head before she infects anyone else with it. I walk to the village, to the affluent section of the village where Marie and Peter lived. Their house sat on a beautiful green lawn surrounded by an iron fence with a big gate. I pushed it open. And I, I went inside. And up the long gravel path. Una, don't come any nearer. Uh, don't be absurd, Marie. I don't want you in my house. We have to talk about this crazy idea you have, Marie. Your father told you. I found the blackthorn you sewed into his coat. It may protect him. And it was you who put the wild roses on her body, wasn't it? To keep her in her coffin. I, I had to do what I could. Oh, but this is all a great foolishness, Marie. Whatever gave you such a crazy idea about your mother-in-law? It's not a crazy idea. I felt it even before she died. I, I sensed that she'd never leave us alone. She'd rather turn into something loathsome and feed off us, drain our strength, drink our blood. And it's happening. It's happening. You want to come in the house? Come. I want you to come in. I want you to see your brother. Is Peter all right? All right? I don't know what you call all right. But look at him. There on the sofa. Oh, Peter. Well, he's been that way since your mother died. And a good deal of the time before that. Do you think I've had a husband? Do you think that... Bloated Hulk has been a man ever. Oh, what has that to do with what? Don't you know? Don't you know that vampires have such power over young married people? Don't you know that? No. No. I... Well, ask Elia. He knows. Elia's not a gypsy. No, not anymore. Ask his mother. Ask his father. Ask old Wanda Beresti. Ask oh, it's him. all fable and myth. It's not real. Do you know that... I may never have a child. Or you. Do you know that? No. If she decides, we'll be barren forever. That's the kind of power they have. Oh, you'll never make me believe it. You've got to believe. You of all people. Why me? Because you are a damn fire. What's that? What is a damn fire? Oh, one born of a vampire... Only a damn fire can see a vampire. But, but, but I, I can't see my mother. I, 
I'm not a damn fire. Oh, go home. Go home, Una. One of these nights, between sunset and sunrise, you will see her. <laughs> We'll be back shortly with Act Two. When you say Budweiser, when you say Bud, you've said a lot of things nobody else can say. When you say Bud, you've gone as far as you can go to get the very best. When you say Bud, you've said the word that means you like to do it all. When you say Bud. It means you want the beer that's got a taste that's number one. When you say that, you tell the world you know what makes it all the way. When you say that, you say you care enough to only want the king of beers. There is no other one. There's only something less. Because the king of beers is leading all the rest. When you say that, You've said it all. Anheuser Bush, St. Louis. Hey, ma'am, what's for dinner? Hey, ma'am, what you got? How about a no-cook dinner for a change? Serve a delicious spread of sliced meats, cheeses, salads, and crisp rolls from ShopRite's appetizer counter. You'll love the freshness, the fine quality, and the pleasing variety. This week's bit supplies are ShopRite freshly sliced chicken roll, half pound, 69 cents. Imported Switzerland Swiss cheese, half pound, 89 cents. ShopRite Leverwurst, 99 cents a pound. Fresh macaroni salad, 39 cents a pound. So relax. Pick up a ready-to-eat dinner at the ShopRite appetizer counter. She loves the family. She wants the best. She does all that she can do. She lets ShopRite do the rest. Hey, ma, what's for dinner? ShopRite has the answer. This is WOR New York, an RKO General Station, your station for Mystery Theater. But they're all superstition, Una. Handed down from generation to generation. You don't believe them. I used to when I was very young. You see, the stories were always about very, very powerful people. I think they couldn't get used to the idea that very powerful people could actually die. My mother was a very powerful woman. Ah, but she died, like everybody else, sooner or later. You never really knew my mother. Oh, I wasn't welcome in her house. I think I only came here to live with you to... to spite her. All my life she told me how immoral I was, how wicked, how filled with wild desires. And you were? Yes. And you knew where to take those wild desires, didn't you? Yes. And what man to give them to? Yes. Well, lucky me. It was to show her, to say yes to her. Yes, I am like that. Yes, I'm what you say. Yes, I'm loose and immoral and wicked and all those things. And yes, you're right not to love me because I'm not lovable. I'm hateful and vile. No, yes. no, 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 no. You are not hateful. Oh, you don't know. I know enough. Lie still now. Let me... Let me hold you. Yes. Hold me. Ah. Huh? Huh? What's that? What's what? I thought I heard something. I don't hear anything. Don't you hear it? Listen. You don't... I... It's a bat. Turn on the light. No, no, please. I don't want to see it. Ilya, get rid of it. I won't touch it. What are you doing? I, I, I put it on my clothes. Why? What, it's why? your mother. It's your mother, Una. She's back. It's not. You said you didn't Never believe. mind what I said. I was wrong. It's a bat in the rafters. It's not my mother. How do you know? How do you know for Couldn't sure? Be. The old women were right. They come back, you see. No. They come back to live off the living and suck our blood. Ilya, where are you going? To my mother's house. Father? All night long, I lay in the dark, listening to the bats swoop and chatter in the rafters. 
sunset to sunrise, I lay awake and listened. For as the warning light of the sun started to glow in the east, the bat was suddenly quiet. Hadn't Marie told me that the old stories all agreed that vampires could only venture out between sunset and sunrise? The bat was gone. And I was alone. Then came a pounding at the door. I got out of bed and I went to answer it. Had Ilya come back? Had he felt better of his foolish fears and come back? Ilya? I... Oh, Peter. Let me in, Una. Yes, come in. I have to talk to you. You're very drunk. Never mind. Never mind about that. I have to ask you something important. Well, first tell me why you didn't come to our mother's funeral. Never mind about that either. Marie was there. Marie was not there. Not for the funeral. She went to the church to put some wild roses on the body. She didn't stay to see her buried. Huh. Not that she's really buried. Not that she'll ever be really buried. She'll be around for a long time till she's drained us all dry. And long after that, maybe forever, who knows? Do vampires ever really die? Peter, stop that. Our mother is not a vampire. Is it true? Marie says it's true. Is what true, Peter? Did you... Did you kiss her? When she was lying in her coffin, did you really kiss her? Yes, I did. Oh. Oh, no. Why did you do that? I don't know quite. I... I think it was because I'd never kissed her before, and and I was sorry that I hadn't. Don't you know what you've done? I haven't done anything. You've put your lips to her poison. You've made yourself like her. I haven't done anything. I said goodbye to her. I kissed her goodbye, that's all. Don't you know that vampires spread their foul contagion on the living? Isn't it bad enough that you and I are damn fires just because she gave us birth? Stop it, stop it. I don't want you to talk this way. You and I can see her. Have you seen her? Of course I haven't. (laughs) I have. Shall I tell you why I didn't come to the funeral? I was with her, that's why. She came to my room and stood in the door. She was very beautiful. She had on her white lace dress. And she smiled at me. You were drunk. Uh, She didn't mind. She just smiled. But then her smile grew wider and wider till the whole room was filled with her smile. It it took away... It took away the sunshine. I tell you, Una... Peter! Peter, oh, Lord! Come in. Peter, are you all right? Come in. The door's not locked. Oh, Marie. Yes. I thought he'd be here. Don't try to move him. Let him sleep it off. He's just... just drunk. He's been drunk for days. Let him lie there. Just before you got here, he was... he was trying to tell me that he saw our mother. That she came to his room. Only the damp fires can see a vampire. You made him believe it. Because it's true. And Una, there's something else that's true. And you'd best know it. Only a damp fire can kill a vampire... Kill? The best we others can do is try to protect ourselves with the blackthorn and the wild roses and all Marie, that. I will not listen. There is something you can do. You could help us to protect ourselves. Marie, I just don't believe in this superstition. You don't. Uh, uh, but we do. Nobody's slept a wink since the day she died. Oh, they know she'll go after us first, but no one in the village is really safe. Well, what do you want me to do? Move the body across the river. What for, in God's name? Wanda Beresti says it's very difficult for a vampire to cross over water. I don't believe any of this. I don't believe it's happening. Well, it's happening, all right. And everyone believes it but you. You can't make the rest of us live in this torment because you refuse to believe. Perhaps you could be right. You... You will... Move the body across the river? Oh, I'll have to talk to Father. Oh, talk to him. Talk to him now. Before it's too late. I left Marie to get Peter home the best way she could. And I started off for my father's house. How could I ask him to disinter the body of his beloved wife? 
only two days after she'd been laid to rest. What kind of daughter would nourish the horrid thought in her father's mind that his wife might be a vampire? Oh, how I needed someone to tell me what to do. Una. Hello, Father. May I come in? Of course you may come in. Oh, I, I'm so glad to see you. You're all right, aren't oh, you? Oh, yes, yes, I, I'm all right. Una, can you stay for a little while? As long as you like. Oh, good, good. I could make a little supper if you could stay that long. Father, Peter came to see me today. Oh, uh-huh. How was he? Drunk. But not so drunk that he couldn't say what he came to say. And what was that? That I had contaminated myself when I kissed my mother's mouth as she lay in her coffin. Oh, my dear girl. Do you believe that, Father? Oh, my dear. I'm so confused. You do believe it? I don't know what to believe anymore. And Marie came to see me, too. Oh, yes? Well, well, what did she want? Marie wants Mother's coffin moved to the other side of the river. Oh. Your mother is buried in the family plot. I, I promised her. I... Why does she want the body moved? Marie says that to to cross water is... is very hard for... for vampires. I could hardly bear the torment in my father's face. It's so hard when everyone around you believes one thing to stand alone and believe another. I kissed my father gratefully. Grateful for his kindness, his patience. He asked me to stay the night. There was still my old room. I lay down on the narrow bed, but my eyes would not close. I stared at the black square I knew to be the window. Beyond the door, I could hear my father washing the supper dishes. Then I heard it. Very faint. Very faint, but unmistakable. Someone tapping on the window pane. I lay rigid in the narrow bed. And then I heard... Is that how a vampire sounds? I don't know, or I tell you. Half a century ago, a vampire was actually tried in a London court. A gentleman, it was, by the name of George Haig. Unhappily, we have no record of the gentleman's voice, and it all happened so long ago, I've no idea whether or not he was ever convicted. I'll be back shortly with Act Three. Great taste in the morning. Kellogg's, Kellogg's has that wholesome taste to get you up and grinning. This is Jerry Coffer for Kellogg's Special K. You know, for years we've been talking about the Special K breakfast, a great way to start the day if you have a weight problem. You may have seen or heard our latest commercials, which symbolize the problem of being a few pounds overweight by using this ball and chain. That's the sound effect. But so many people have come to know the Special K breakfast that can help solve weight problems, they sometimes forget that Special K is America's favorite high-protein cereal. It has eight essential vitamins and iron, and so delicious that lots of folks, kids as well as adults, eat Special K just for the sheer good taste of it. So we don't want you to think that you have to wear a ball and chain to eat Special K. All you need is an appreciation for the finer things of life, a one-ounce bowl of Special K, four ounces of skim milk, tomato juice, coffee, and maybe a little sugar. The Special K breakfast can help you lose weight all by itself, but it really is a good start. Here's news from Queen Elizabeth II. Now you can sail to Europe on Queen Elizabeth II and fly home free. I'll repeat that. Sail to Europe on Queen Elizabeth II and fly back to New York free. She reaches Europe in five luxurious days. 
You have ample time for touring because you fly back. Meals and entertainment on board are included. A whole new crowd of people are discovering Queen Elizabeth II because she's affordable. And she's four swimming pools, three nightclubs, a discotheque, a gymnasium, a sauna, a casino, and three of the finest restaurants in the world. Sail first class, grades A to H, and fly home free. Sail tourist, grades L to Q and S to U, and fly home half fare. Flights are British Airways economy. You can stay in Europe up to 16 days. Call your travel agent or Cunard at 212-983-2510. Sail to Europe on Queen Elizabeth II and fly home free. Great ships of British registry since 1840. No matter what you say before, that's what suburban savings for suburban. Suburban Savings offers you an easy way to borrow without touching a penny in your regular savings passbook account. Just let Suburban loan you the money. It's called Suburban Savings Passbook Loan. You can borrow up to 90% of the total amount you have on deposit at reasonable rates, and you can pay off your loan at your convenience. When your loan is repaid, you still have all of your savings intact, plus interest. So if you need money, why not take a loan from Suburban without touching your savings? Suburban Savings Passbook Loan in New Jersey at Bayonne, Edgewater, Elmwood Park, Emerson, Hackettstown, Morris Plains, Nutley, Paramus, and Sparta. I jumped from the bed and ran to the window. There was no moon but the stars were very bright. Bright enough so that the trees cast wavering shadows on the grass. Oh, no! And then I saw her beneath a poplar tree just outside the window, dressed in white lace, her long hair falling to her waist. She lifted her face to the window, and by the light of the stars I saw it. Not hideous, not obscene, no beautiful as it had been in life, but transfigured now by such appalling grief as I had never seen before. The dark eyes staring, the cheeks glistening with tears, the mouth stretched wide as it cried. I needed my father. I could not bear the sight of this apparition by myself. I heard him moving about in the kitchen and I ran to him. Oh, father... Father, she's here. What, dear? What did you say? She's here. Mother is here. Is she? No, no, no. She's beautiful. She's beautiful. Um, where, where is she? Outside the window. I heard her calling me, and I went to the window, and I saw her standing under the tree. And Oh, Father. She looks so sad. Oh, my dear little girl, you've had a dream. It's not a dream. She's there. Oh, so soon after the funeral, it's natural for you to dream. Oh, come with me. I'll show no, you. You're overwrought, dear child. Come with me, you'll see. <laughs> if there were a moon, you'd see quite clearly, but even by the starlight, you can see. Look there. Where? I, I don't see it. Beneath a big poplar tree right there. I don't see anything. In her white dress. Look at her. I can't see anything. Nothing but the grass and a few shadows. That's all. That's all? Oh, my dear child, you had a dream. No, no, no dream. I saw her. But you can't see her. She, she must be a vampire. And I, I am a damn fire. What are you saying? Only the offspring of a vampire can see the vampire. Peter said he saw her. I know I saw her. We are her offspring, Peter. And I are our vampires. Oh, no, please, please, you don't know what you're saying. Oh, I know, I know very well. <laughs> Only a vampire can see a vampire. And only a vampire can kill a vampire. Well, then, I... Uh, oh, oh, what are you... What are you doing, Ona? Open this window. No, no, don't, don't. And invite her in. Mother, come in. Come in. 
Your daughter is waiting to receive you. My father rushed from the room. I can't stay. I can't watch. I can't. I stood by the window, waving to the white figure beneath the poplar tree. It was several minutes before she moved, and then very slowly, with uncertain steps, she came toward the window. She looked up at me like a child that is not certain of her welcome. Una? You've come back to live off of us, haven't you, Mother? Even in death, we are your possessions, your very prized possessions, because from us you drew pride and haughtiness and self-importance. That's what we did for you in life, and that's what you mean we should do for you now. That's it, isn't it, Mother? Oh, no. No. Forgive. Forgive? What went before. Forgive it. Forgive? I've never heard you say that word. Now, now I say it. Forgive me. All that I did, I beg of you, forgive me all my sins. Father was right. This is a dream. Forgive me that I may lie quiet in my grave. Oh, God, let me wake up. God, deliver me from this dream. You don't hear me. Oh, Una, why don't you hear me? Perhaps I fainted. I, I don't know. I suppose I did, because I remember nothing more until I was wakened by a knock on the door. I opened my eyes. I was lying on the floor next to the narrow bed, and the sun was streaming through the window. I got to my feet. Come in, Father. Ilya. Are you... are you all right, Una? Yes, I'm all right. You look so pale. Oh, I... I had a bad night, a bad dream. Yes, your father told me. My father? He went to fetch you. That, that, that's why you're here? I would have come back to you anyway. I only went to see my mother to ask her what she knows about vampires. All the old women were there. Wanda, Baresti, and all the others. Oh, they must have filled you full of stories. Uh, Una, when a whole town believes that a vampire is loose, they become terrified. A vampire, Una, is, is soulless, mindless energy on the march... Knowing neither good nor evil, only its own desires. And the vampire must be killed, Una. Do you know why? Lest we become like the vampire. We can become like that, Una. Unless a stake is driven through the vampire's heart. And who is to do that? You know. Only a damn fire can kill a vampire. A stake must be driven through the throat of the corpse. If blood spurts from the throat, it is proof that a vampire lived in that body. Can I do such a thing to my own mother's corpse? It must be done before the sun sets. Or she'll walk abroad tonight. Ilya, do you know that I thought she was here last night? In this very room? And she kept saying... Forgive. Forgive. <laughs> and then, of course, I... I knew it was a dream because my mother would never say such a thing as forgive. She... She was asking you to forgive her? Imagine a proud woman like my mother to say a thing like that. You heard her say, forgive me? In my dream, yes. I suppose it's because I... I hated her so much in life... I liked the idea that she was sorry for all the grief she'd caused us. Oh, now listen. While I was at my mother's house, she told me that there had been cases now and then where a dead person returned night after night and terrified everyone because it was taken for granted that the dead one had become a vampire. But it wasn't always true. There were times when the dead one was what they call a returner. A returner? What is that? One who comes back, so my mother says, to ask forgiveness. Are you telling me that my mother did come back last night, asking to be forgiven? That it was no dream? It's... 
It's possible, isn't it? And if... if it is true, if she is a returner... You... you must get a writ of absolution from the bishop and place it on her body. How can I tell? How can I know that she is a returner and not a vampire? You'll have to go through with it before sundown. Oh, no. No. <laughs> Drive a stake through my own mother's throat. Una, more than half the village believes your mother has become a vampire. Marie wants you to move her body across the river. And even my father is wearing the blackthorn in his coat. And even I. When I heard the bat in the rafters, I thought it might be your mother. You must have the grave opened, Una, and the coffin. And before the sun goes down, you must... Drive the stake into your mother's throat. Then we shall see whether she is a returner or that foul creature of the night, a vampire. Elia himself uncovered it open. I told my father what I meant to do before the sun went. If you must, my daughter. If you think you must. If she is really a vampire, father... Only I can do it. And I went to Peter and Marie. You you wouldn't ask me to do it, Una. No, I wouldn't ask you, Peter. You're very brave, Una. I'd have been content if you'd only moved her body across the river. There's so much talk in the village. So much fear, so much horror. We must settle this thing once and for all. from house to house telling everyone to be by the graveside just before sunset. They looked at me with pity, some of them, others with revulsion, but all, all promised to be there, and so it happened. I, I wish to thank you all for coming here. You all know of the belief that is spread through our village. Many of you share in it. My own family leans toward it. The belief that the body of the woman who lies here is not a corpse, but the shell that houses a vile and loathsome being, a vampire, that this vampire threatens the lives of all of us and the sanity, the spirit and the soul of any who escape with their lives. Listen, I have here a stake. The sun is setting. While there is still a little light, I shall drive this stake through my mother's throat. If blood gushes forth, then I shall have killed a vampire. I sh shall also have murdered my mother. If no blood comes from the body, we will know that she is no more than a returner who is asking forgiveness for the wrong she did in life. As we all one day will have to ask for forgiveness for the wrong we have done. Yes, yes, yes. Pray for me. Pray for me. Pray for yourselves. And if you can give her your forgiveness, the bishop will give her absolution. I hold the stake high for all of you to see. And. And. Now! There is no blood. Go. Send for the bishop. It's over. I've done it. And the mutilated body of my mother lies at my feet. Oh, let her release come soon. I'll be back shortly. Hi, Ms. Gold. 
Goldilocks here. Professionally, taste-testing diet drinks can be very difficult, but I've just had to bear with it. Then I found sugar-free Diet 7-Up. It doesn't taste like other diet drinks. It's fresh, light, natural, delicious. Sugar-free Diet 7-Up tastes so good that I've taste-tested it hundreds of times, and each time I've given it my seal of approval. Yes, this one's just right. thought you couldn't afford to fly to California this summer, TWA has some good news for you. You can. Thanks to TWA's demand schedule service, you can fly to California for only $125. Just make your reservations 90 days before you want to go and put down a $20 deposit for each way. For all the details, call your travel agent. TWA's demand schedule service. Now you can afford to fly to California. Frankly, wouldn't you like to sleep every night on a $100 mattress? Suppose you could get one for just $69. Why envy friends who sleep in luxury when Huffman Coos has just what you want at such a tremendous reduction? This fair-traded Stearns & Foster famous label bedding has never been on sale before. Now Huffman Coos has it exclusively at this special down-to-earth price. Why such a big reduction? Because of soaring costs. This $100 Stearns & Foster beauty has been discontinued. Huffman Coos bought the entire entire inventory to bring you this $69 twin size price. Full size mattresses or box springs originally $120 are now just $89 each. Queen size sets complete $219. King size sets complete just $319. So go to Huffman Coos at once. No more when these are gone. Tell them we sent you. You'll be glad we did. Our cast included Marion Seldes, Bryna Rayburn, William Johnston, and William Redfield. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by new sugar-free diet 7-Up. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. The preceding Mystery Theater program was furnished by the CBS Radio Network. The House Judiciary Committee purports to be narrowing the scope of its impeachment inquiry. I'm Fulton Lewis in the Mutual Broadcasting System Studios in Washington, D.C. My commentary after this. What has Sheridan done for you lately? What has Sheridan done for you now? Next time you travel to Canada for business or pleasure, you'll find 20 sparkling Sheridan hotels and motor inns coast to coast, from Quebec to British Columbia. What has Sheridan done for you lately? In Toronto, the new Four Seasons Sheraton has a five-story waterfall right in the lobby. In Vancouver, there are two new Sheratons. And for a reservation at any Sheraton, call 800-325-3535 or have your travel agent call. That's 800-325-3535. That's what Sheraton's done for Sheraton Hotels and Motor Inns Worldwide. The House Impeachment Inquiry staff reported today that it is concentrating its investigation on the major Watergate allegations and President Nixon's tax problems. The staff reported to the House Judiciary Committee that it is halting its inquiries into 15 of the 56 original allegations against the President. In each of the 15 cases, the staff said, either there is no substantial evidence known to the staff that supports an allegation of wrongdoing, or the evidence is insufficient to justify devoting the resources required to complete a thorough investigation. 
New Jersey Democrat Representative Peter Rodino, the chairman of the committee, emphasized that the final decision on dropping any allegation will be up to the committee members themselves. During today's two-and-a-half-hour meeting, the committee also voted 34 to 4 to give the White House five additional days to respond to a subpoena for tapes of 42 presidential conversations. The White House response was put off until 10 a.m. next Tuesday. Most of the items set aside by the staff include allegations that presidential friends and big campaign contributors receive special favored treatment from government agencies. Also halted was the investigation of possible impeachable conduct in connection with the president's refusal to spend appropriated funds and his attempt to shut down the Office of Economic Opportunity without prior congressional approval. The report said the staff is continuing its probe of allegations stemming from a $100,000 campaign contribution from billionaire Howard Hughes, a $200,000 cash contribution from financier Robert Vesco, contributions from the dairy industry, and a pledge from ITT to help underwrite the 1972 Republican Convention. Much of the discussion at today's meeting involved the staff's plans to examine allegations that criminal fraud may have been committed in the preparation of the president's income tax returns. Both the Congressional Joint Committee on Internal Revenue Taxation and the IRS itself have have declared that the president incorrectly prepared his pre-presidential papers. Both the committee and the IRS said that as a result of the disallowed deduction for those papers, as well as other disallowed items, the president owed more than $450,000 in additional taxes. The president, of course, has said that he will make that payment. The impeachment inquiry staff noted today that the joint committee made no investigation whether or not there was criminal tax fraud for which the president may be responsible. Such an investigation is underway by the Special Watergate Prosecutor's Office, but the impeachment staff said today it is likely to be prolonged and its result will not be available to the House Judiciary Committee under the committee's contemplated timetable. John Doerr, the chief counsel for the House impeachment inquiry, said the investigation of the president's taxes would concentrate on the gift of his presidential papers, but he emphasized investigation of tax fraud is a very complicated matter. Doerr said that he intends to ask the Internal Revenue Service for a copy of its report on the president's taxes. Another allegation stemming from secret U.S. bombing raids in Cambodia between March of 1969 and August of 1973 still remains under active consideration, at least until next week when the House Judiciary Committee hopes to obtain access to a Senate Armed Services Committee report regarding that bombing. Several committee Democrats indicated that they would strongly oppose any attempt to drop the Cambodian bombing issue from the allegations against the president. Massachusetts Democrat Representative Robert Drinan asked Doerr if he intended to subpoena White House tapes of conversations about the bombing between the president and members of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Doerr said no decision had been made as yet. Reverend Drinan said no decision, uh, also said that he opposes halting the investigation into impoundment and the OEO shutdown. The Judiciary Committee staff said that it had reviewed more than 50 court decisions challenging the administration's authority to refuse to spend appropriated funds. While in many cases the courts did rule against the administration, the staff said it found no basis at all for listing impoundment as an impeachable offense. It made a similar determination in the case of the Office of Economic Opportunity, in which a federal judge in Washington also ruled that the administration had acted illegally. Here are some of the issues that are still under active investigation. Domestic surveillance activities alleged to have been conducted by or at the direction of the White House. Political intelligence and espionage activities during the 1972 presidential campaign. Of course, the Watergate break-in and the subsequent cover-up. Allegations that contributions to the president's re-election campaign were given in exchange for special ambassadorships. Allegations that the White House attempted to use the Federal Communications Commission to control and retaliate against news media criticism. Allegations that the White House attempted to use the Internal Revenue Service to harass political enemies. Among those on which investigation has been halted were allegations of White House involvement in illegal campaign contributions received from corporate funds and allegations concerning illegal campaign contributions from foreign nationals and from labor unions. Also, allegations that the White House caused friends of the president 
to be given favored treatment by the controller of the currency that was involved in the regulation of national banks. In addition, an allegation that the antitrust division of the Justice Department dropped an investigation of a corporation that is owned by a friend of the president. And finally, allegations of attempts to obtain campaign contributions in return for promises of assistance with the Federal Housing Administration. Most of the items the committee staff is concentrating on also have been under investigation for many months by the Special Prosecutor's Office. Several former administration and presidential campaign officials are, of course, under indictment in connection with the Watergate cover-up and the break-in at the office of Daniel Ellsberg's psychiatrist. Now it seems the lines are drawn and the next move is going to be up to the White House. President Nixon now has until next Tuesday morning to respond to the Judiciary Committee's subpoena of a wide range of until now secret White House tapes and documents. One of the arguments used by the President's attorney, James St. Clair, in balking at the House panel's request earlier has been that the House Com Judiciary Committee's inquiry has been too broad, too undefined, and there is no reason, no legal ground, and indeed it would set a dangerous precedent if that committee were allowed to go fishing through executive branch files. With that argument, I think there can be little dispute. Under traditional concepts of American justice, particularly as defined and refined by the Fifth Amendment to our Constitution, no branch of government is empowered to simply walk in and search willy-nilly through records as a means of determining whether something is or is not wrong. The purpose of the search, be it a physical search or a search by subpoena, must be fairly clearly defined first, and there must be a reasonable belief that there has been a specific violation of a specific law. Until today, it was not known just what the House Judiciary Committee was going after, what violation of law, what high crime or misdemeanor it was considering in the case of Richard Nixon. I'm E.G. Marshall, and I want very much to tell you the story of a young lady named Barbara. Everyone is more or less mad on one point, said Rudyard Kipling, the famous English writer. And I'm inclined to agree with him, since I myself am more or less mad on the point of mystery. But our sweet heroine's madness took a strange turn, as we shall soon discover in the unfolding of the tale entitled... All Living Things Must Die. Our mystery drama, All Living Things Must Die, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Elspeth Eric and stars Mercedes McCambridge. It is sponsored in part by the Kellogg Company, makers of Kellogg Special K cereal, and by Anheuser-Busch Incorporated, brewers of Budweiser. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Great taste in the morning. Kellogg's, Kellogg's has that wholesome taste to get you up and grinning. This is Jerry Coffer for Kellogg's Special K. You know, for years we've been talking about the Special K breakfast, a great way to start the day if you have a weight problem. You may have seen or heard our latest commercials, which symbolize the problem of being a few pounds overweight by using this ball and chain. That's the sound effect. But so many people have come to know the Special K breakfast that can help solve weight problems, they sometimes forget that Special K is America's favorite high-protein cereal. It has eight essential vitamins and iron, and so delicious that lots of folks, kids as well as adults, eat Special K just for the sheer good taste of it. So we don't want you to think that you have to wear a ball and chain to eat Special K. All you need is an appreciation for the finer things of life, a one-ounce bowl of Special K, four ounces of skim milk, tomato juice, coffee, and maybe a little sugar. The Special K breakfast can help you lose weight all by itself. But it really is a good start. No matter what you say before, that's what suburban say before suburban. Suburban Savings offers you an easy way to borrow without touching a penny in your regular savings passbook account. Just let Suburban loan you the money. It's called Suburban Savings Passbook Loan. 
you can borrow up to 90% of the total amount you have on deposit at reasonable rates, and you can pay off your loan at your convenience. When your loan is repaid, you still have all of your savings intact, plus interest. So if you need money, why not take a loan from Suburban without touching your savings? Suburban Savings Passbook Loan in New Jersey at Bayonne, Edgewater, Elmwood Park, Emerson, Hackettstown, Morris Plains, Nutley, Paramus, and Sparta. Now begins our story of the lightly demented Barbara, a lovely lady of 31 or 2, even 4 or 5. But as we now discover her in the living room of her suburban home, she could be younger than springtime. She could be spring itself. I love you. I love you all. You are my darlings, my pets, my very own treasures. Oh, how beautiful you are. And how much I love you. Why? Well, that can't be Frank. He never forgets his key. Oh. Oh, it's... Johnson, ma'am. Detective Sergeant Johnson from the other day. Oh, yes. Come in. I didn't realize you'd be back. Well, I was just checking up. Had any more of those uh, obscene phone calls? No, not one. And it's such a relief, you can't imagine. Mm -hmm. You had your number changed. Yes, yes, and, and and that seems to have done the trick, all right. Well, good, good. Now, a lady like you shouldn't be bothered by things like that. Well, there's one other thing I hate to mention. No, no, go ahead and mention anything you want to. We're here to serve. Well, it could be my imagination, but every once in a while, I see a man sort of hanging around across the street, not doing anything in particular, but just hanging around. Mm -hmm. Any uh, special time of day? Yes, usually about this time. I see him through this window when I'm putting my plants to bed. Oh, you tuck them in, do you? Well, sort of. I talk to them, and sometimes I sing them a lullaby. <laughs> I know that sounds silly, but, well, that's what I do. And then sometimes through the window, I think I see this man. Well, it's kind of hard to see out this window, ma'am. The plants ought to get in the way. Yes, I know they do, but they like it here. I tried other places, but they weren't happy, so... They are happy here, huh? Well, they haven't complained. Although I'm not sure about Annabelle. Uh, this one is Annabelle. That's Arthur. And that's Kenneth. Mm -hmm. And this is Marianne. <laughs> and that spider plant over there is Michael. Oh, Michael's in great shape, isn't he? Oh, yes, he is. He's... Are you laughing at me? Please don't. Do I look like I'm laughing? My husband laughs at me sometimes. Well, I wouldn't know why. Oh, because... Now, you see this one, Marianne? Mm -hmm. Will you take a close look? Because you won't see a Marianne every day in the week. Well, Marianne is, uh... Well, she, she looks like ivy to me. Yes, but her leaves... Her leaves are heart-shaped. Can't you see? Each one is shaped like a perfect little heart. Uh, you know, you're right. Yes. There are more than 200 varieties of ivy. Did you know that? No, no, I never did. Hey, what's going on here? Oh, Frank. This is my husband. Frank, this is Detective Sergeant Johnson. Ed Johnson. How are you? Pleased to meet you, Mr. Murray. He came to check up on those phone calls. Oh, yeah, from the uh, degenerate. I told Barbara she should answer him back in his own language. Oh, Frank, please. Let him have it. Give it to him right between the eyes. The ears, I should say, in this instance. Well, I'll, uh, I'll be getting along. Well, I'll show you to the door. Say, listen, why can't you catch those freaks? Oh, thank you for coming around, Mr. Johnson. Yeah, sure. I'll uh, stop by again if it's all right with you. Oh, any time, practically. I'm almost always here. And, uh... Take good care of Annabelle. Oh, I will. And don't let Michael grow too fast. <laughs> I'll do my best. Good night, Mrs. Murray. Good night, Sergeant Johnson. And thank you. Now, don't you mention it. What was all that about? Well, I told you. The phone calls. I mean, all that whispering. All that bzz, bzz, bzz at the door just now. Oh, we weren't whispering. Well, what were you talking about? That I wasn't supposed to hear? Nothing. He just said, I don't know, something about the plants. That's all. What does he know about plants? Well, nothing much. When he was here the first time, and just now before you came in, I told him about them. He knows that I talk to them and that they have names. 
He was just being friendly, Frank. That's being friendly? Dropping in all the time when I'm not here? Only twice. This was only the second time. He's a kook like you. Freaked out over a bunch of plants. He was only expressing an interest. What's interesting about a bunch of plants with no flowers? Look at them. They take up the whole window. You got them strung all over the place, up to the ceiling, hanging down. They're vines, Frank. They're silver lace and philodendron and ivy. Oh, whatever they are, they're dumb. Plain dumb. I wouldn't object to a nice pot of tulips, something like that, sitting on a table. Like a nice spot of color or a hyacinth. They smell good. But uh, these things... Don't, don't, don't hurt them. Don't. I got no use for them at all. Oh, Get rid of them, why no, don't you? No, no, never. You can't make me. Oh, boy, you sure cry easy. What I say was so terrible? You said get rid of them. Well, all right, all right. Forget I mentioned this. What's for dinner? It's Swiss steak. Again? Well, it's been a whole week. Well, I'll get it on the table, because i got to get out of here early. You mean you're going out? i got a date to go bowling. Tonight? Well, certainly tonight. What do you think, next year? But you were out last night and the night before. And I may go out tomorrow night, the night after that. So what? Frank, Frank, I get so lonely. Well, read a book. Watch TV, listen to the radio. But almost every night and all day. Well, all right, talk to your plants. That's what you got them for, is it? Have a nice little conversation with Michael and uh, Mary Louise and uh, Archibald, whatever you call them. Never mind. Just never mind. Well, look, I'm going to take a quick shower and then we'll eat. Ten minutes on the outside, okay? Okay. Oh, Arthur... Annabelle, tell me that you love me. Mary Ann, do you love me? Michael, Kenneth, oh, somebody love me. Please, somebody love me or I'll die. Hey. That Swiss steak wasn't bad at all. Thank you. Got any dessert? Just fruit. I'll take an apple with me. Frank, don't go for a minute. Well, I told you I got a date. No, I want to talk to you about something. I'll go ahead, but keep it short, will you? Oh, well, Frank, remember when we got married? Well, how could I forget with you to remind me? Well, you said then that you didn't want to have any children right away. I don't believe in rushing into things like that. Frank, that was ten years ago. Yeah, I know. But, but isn't it different now? Well, not necessarily. I mean, uh, I think I'm too old for kids. Oh, you're only 45. And by the time my kid grew up, I'd be an old man. No, not really old. Well, aren't you kind of old to be having a kid for the first time? Frank, lots of women have children at my age. Lots of them. I don't know if it's safe. Yes, it is. It, it happens all the time, and I'm very healthy. I'm very strong. You don't look too strong. Well, I am, because the doctor said so. When did you go to see a doctor? Last week. I don't like you doing that without asking me first. Well, I wanted to be sure before I talked to you. And the doctor says it would be perfectly all right for me to have a baby. As a matter of fact, he said it would be the best thing in the world for me. Well, I can't see it. On account of the loneliness, Frank, I don't think you realize how lonely I get. That's why I talk to the plants and sing to them. Because I haven't got anybody else. Well, make some friends, why don't you? That's not easy for me. Well, why not? I do it all the time. Anyway, it's not the same as having somebody right here in the house with me all the time. It's not the same intimate kind of thing. If I had a baby... Oh, Frank, I wouldn't ask for anything else ever. And I'd give that baby so much love and attention... It would grow up to be the most marvelous person because it would know from the very beginning that it was loved and wanted. Oh, so much wanted. Well, I don't want it. You got that? A kid is the last thing in the world I want. Please. No, no, no. I live in this house too, you know. I don't want a kid running around, messing up everything, making a lot of noise, getting in the way all the time. No, it wouldn't be like that. Oh, yes, it would. No. No, I won't have a kid messing up my life, and that's final, so forget it, huh? Huh? You hear me? Forget it. Put it out of your mind. Okay. Huh? Well, I gotta get going. The guys are waiting for me at the boat here. Frank. All right, now what? No, no, I won't keep you a minute. I haven't got a minute. Oh, please, less than a minute. Well, okay, spill it. When I was at the supermarket this morning, 
There was this dog. A dog. Oh, boy. Really, a very pretty dog and so sweet. And he was just wandering around. Nobody knew who he belonged to. Or if he belonged to anybody, he's just a stray, as far as anybody knows. No dog. And he has this cute little tail that curls up right over his back. And, and great ears that stand up straight and then flop over. And he's mostly black with a kind of white face. Barbara, we've been through all this. I will not have a dog in my house. Now, that is how it is, and I don't want to talk about it now or never. You understand that? Yes. I gotta go. Frank? I said I gotta go. Just one more thing. There's this man hanging around outside. What man? Hanging around where? I was telling Detective Johnson about it. This man sort of hangs around across the street. And I thought if he's a, a, a prowler or a dangerous kind of person, well, a dog would be protection for me, see, when I'm alone. What makes you think this guy is dangerous? I don't know that he is, but every night now when I'm watering the plants just before you come home, I can see him through the window just sort of standing there and looking around. This window? Yes. He looks kind of shifty, Frank. And if I had a dog, I'd feel safe. I can't see it. He's right across the street. I can't see on account of these dumb plants. Don't, don't hurt them. Why do they have to grow them so damn well, long? Just, just part them very carefully. Here, let me... Oh, no, I can do it. I can do it. There. Can you see that man? I see him. Bobby, you're a nut, you know that? Why am I? That's the guard they hired at the high-rise. They pay him to watch the building. Of course he's here every night. That's what he's paid for. I didn't know that. Are you trying to con me into letting you have a dog for protection? Well, it won't work, Barbara. The answer's still the same. No dog, no baby. Just be happy with these dumb plants. They're bad enough. Taking up the whole bloody window, spilling all over the place. I hate you. You're lucky I let you keep them. I hate you. I wish you were dead. What did you say? I said, I hate you. I wish you were dead. Did you really say... Hey. Hey, what? Hey, what? Oh. What's this? The bloody plants are on my neck. Oh. Hey, Barbara, they're all around me. Mm. They're choking me. I can't get them off. Hey, Barbara. Barbara, they're too strong. Bart. Bart, 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 Barbara, don't stand there. Get them off. No. Get the scissors. Barbara, the scissors. I hate you. I hate you. Barbara. I want you dead. <laughs> Return shortly for the second act of All Living Things Must Die. Hi, I'm Goldilocks, Ms. Goldilocks, if you please, and I'm a professional taste tester. Here at my taste test laboratory, that's TTL for short, <laughs> I taste test everything from porridge to diet drinks. Actually, there's not that much taste testing in porridge these days. There used to be. Once upon a time. I mean, that's how this Miz got into the biz. <laughs> but lately, it's been diet drinks. I mean, with so many diet drinks going sugar-free, I've been really busy conducting taste tests. A rather unbearable assignment, to be sure. But then I discovered sugar-free diet 7-Up. Fresh, natural, delicious. My only problem is that sugar-free diet 7-Up tastes so good that it broke my Goldilocks diet drink taste meter well, Sugar-Free Diet 7-Up certainly has my seal of approval. This one's just right. Hey, Mom, what's for dinner? Hey, Mom, what you got? It's time to get ready for the great outdoors. And your ShopRite supermarket has everything you'll need for cookout dinners and fun in the sun. And for this week's dinners, ShopRite is featuring whole grade A frying chickens, just 37 cents a pound. Roasting chickens up to 4 pounds, 47 cents a pound. Choice rib steaks, 119 a pound. ShopRite franks, 89 cents a pound. Get all your outdoor cooking equipment and many great food values at your ShopRite supermarket. She loves the family. She wants the best. She does all that she can do. She lets ShopRite do the rest. Hey, my 
what's for dinner. ShopRite has the answer. Macy's store-wide spring sale blossoms all this week with beautiful values in every department, every Macy's store. Values like a 40-piece Nyko Ironstone service rate, regularly $55, now just $39.99. And hand-cut lead crystal selection of hostess items, regularly $15 to $25, now $9.99 to $14.99. Save in every department all this week. Macy's store-wide spring sale. This is WOR New York and RKO General Station. Now for the second act of All Living Things Must Die. It is a year later, and our heroine no longer lives in the little suburban house, nor is her name Barbara Murray. She lives in a cheery little two-room apartment, and she is married to Detective Sergeant Ed Johnson. But Kenneth and Arthur and Mary Ann and Michael and Annabelle, all the plants are grouped together in the largest window, and all appear to be in the best of health. Baby boats a silver moon sailing on the sea. Big. Oh, he's home. Ed? Hello, sweetheart. Hello, darling. Hey, 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 watch out. What, what, what have you got there? Oh, just a little addition to the family. <laughs> what? What is well, it? Well, let me get the paper off, will you? Okay. <laughs> there you are. Oh. How's that, huh? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, it's... Beautiful. You know what it's called? Yes, do you? Sure, a purple passion plant. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Oh. I thought it was very appropriate for two people oh. who've been married a month. Oh, it is, it is, Ed. It's beautiful. And you were so sweet to think of it. Well, there's uh, something else I've been thinking of. What's that? Honey, is it too soon for us to be thinking about having a baby? A baby? Well, you do want us to have a baby, don't you, Barbara? Well, I guess so. I brought the subject up too soon. I can see that dumb me. I'm sorry. No, that's right. No, no, no. I was stupid. Forget I mentioned it, huh? Only, it doesn't do any harm to think about it a little, does it? No. I guess it doesn't do any harm to think about it. Oh, Cleopatra. You're growing very nicely, dear. It would take a little while before you'll be as long as Annabelle. And you'll probably never be as long as Michael. But then very few plants are. But you're so healthy and strong. And I love your purple leaves. You're very beautiful, my darling. Yes, you are. Oh, he's home. Darling? Darling, you're home. Yep, I'm home. Hey, look what I brought with me. Why, why? Oh, no, it's a dog. Uh-huh. Oh, isn't he darling? Yeah, yeah. He, he wandered into the station house oh. about a week ago. We've been feeding him, and he's been sleeping look, there. Look, look, look. His tail curls up over his back. Yeah, he's got a great disposition. Oh, my. Doesn't he belong to anybody? Well, we advertised in the paper three days running. Nobody answered by yet. You mean he's got no home? Nobody wants him? Well, not unless you do. You mean I can have him? He can live here with us. Well, would you like oh, that? Oh, yes, yes. Uh, right. Dog, I guess you got a oh, home. Oh, <laughs> I love him. Dog, you got yourself a mother. Look, look, look at him. Look how he's looking at yeah, you. Yeah. Come here, come here, dog. <laughs> come here. Oh, he loves you. You can see it in his eyes. He just loves you. Well, I'm his father, aren't I? <laughs> Hey, dog, do you love your father? Of course he loves you. How could he help but love you? How could anybody help but love you? Well, there's only one person has to love me. That's you. Uh-huh. But you have to, baby. It's absolutely necessary. It's essential that you love me because if you don't, it's the end of me. Oh, Ed, I love you so much. I can't even talk about it. Just believe me. I love you and I love you and I love you. When you're here and when you're not here, and when you're asleep and when you're awake and when you talk and when you don't talk and when you look at me and when you don't, I love you all the time. Hey, that's a lot of love. I've got more. More? Anytime you need it. Barbara. Honey. Hmm? Look, we've been married better than half a year now. When are we going to start having a baby? Oh, I don't know. Pretty soon? Mm, I guess. You want one, don't you, honey? Yes. Well, when do we? Well, sometimes. Well, sweetheart, we're not kids anymore. I know that. You think I'm putting the pressure on you? No, I shouldn't do that. I didn't mean to. No, that's all right. No, I won't do that anymore. You, you, you just got to tell me when you think is the right time. I won't bother about it anymore. Oh, Ed, I... Now. 
What are we going to name the dog? <laughs> I don't know. How about uh, Cuthbert or, or uh, Lance? Oh, no, I don't think so. Uh, Herman? Dwight? No, 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 I don't want to give him any name like that. I want to call him what you called him. Me? I never called him Yes, anything. you did. You called him Dog. <laughs> That's what I want to call him. D-A-W-G? <laughs> dog? Yes, come here, Dog. Hey. Oh, <laughs> what a lovely dog you are, Dog. <laughs> How do you feel? I feel marvelous. Well, you look marvelous. How's the family? Well, I've been giving Annabelle a little too much water, but everybody else is fine. Oh, I brought you a present. A first anniversary present. Well, I have one for you, too. Here. That's, oh. uh, that's an engagement ring. You, you never had one. Oh, Ed, this is lovely. Do you like it? Oh, yes, I love it. <sighs> Almost as much as I love you and dog. And Annabelle and <laughs> Hey, 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 watch it. <laughs> and I got you a ring, too. A what? Yes, a wedding ring, because you never have one. Oh, hey, hey, yeah. that, that's nice. <laughs> that's real nice. Is it okay for a man to wear this? Well, it just shows everybody that you're married. Well, everybody knows I'm married. Does everybody really know you're married? Well, I talk about it all the time. Well, do you sure. really? Do you sure. talk about it? Well, I, I'm married to you, so naturally it's you I talk <laughs> about. I bet you bore everybody to tears. Yeah, I bet I do. <laughs> of course, they're, they're uh, always... Comes a time when they break in and say, any kids? You got any kids? Yes, I suppose they do say that. And, of course, I say no, and they say, well, why not? And I don't know what to say. Ed, I'm so sorry. Honey, why not? You have to tell me. Well, it's a, a, a feeling that I have. Well, don't you want to, baby? I always thought you were the kind of woman who'd want a family. It's hard to explain. Well, you've got to try. Okay. Okay, I'll try only, Ed, I don't think you're going to like what I'm going to tell you. Anything. I want to hear anything you have to tell me. Well, I have to go back to the night that Frank died. Frank? Yeah. What's Frank got to do with it? I'm going to tell you if you listen. Yeah, I'm listening. Go ahead. Well, you remember when I called you that night and I told you that Frank was dead? You remember that? Yeah, sure. Of course I remember. And, and you came over with the others and you asked me how it happened. Yeah. And I said I didn't know. I said that Frank was going to go out bowling, and he must have been in a hurry. And the room was dark, and he must have stumbled into the plants and got tangled up in them, and he couldn't get out. Yeah, but he was strangled by the plants, baby. It was a freak accident. No, that isn't what happened at all. Honey, are you trying to tell me... I don't know, are you trying to tell me that you pushed him or something, that you wrapped the plants around his neck? I didn't. All right, now, wait a minute. Maybe you better tell it to me from the beginning. Well, you remember Frank came home... That day while you were still here. Uh -huh. And then you left. And he told me to hurry up with dinner because he was going out. And I got upset. I told him I'd get so lonely here. Lonely every night. Almost every day. Read a book. Watch TV. Listen to the radio. Talk to your plants. That's what you got them for, isn't it? So after dinner, I said I wanted to talk to him about having a baby. A kid is the last thing in the world I want. And I think maybe it was then that I got the idea. What idea? It just seemed awfully important to me to get Frank over by the window where the plants were hanging. So I told him that there'd been a man hanging around outside across the street. What man? Hanging around where? And he started walking toward the window. And I started feeling this... this awful, wild excitement. The nearer he got to the window, the nearer he got to the plants. And then I said it. Said what, honey? I hate you. I said, I hate you. At first, Frank didn't hear me. Or maybe he didn't believe his ears, but I said it again. I hate you. And then I said, I wish you were dead. He heard me say that. Then what happened? He started to look angry. And he made a little move toward me, and it was then... When he started to move, that the plants moved. They moved faster than anyone would think plants could move. And they wound themselves around his neck, around and around and tighter and tighter. And Frank began to choke. Barbara, they're all around my neck. They're, they're choking me. Oh, no. I can't get them off. Don't stand there. Get them off. Get the scissors. No. Barbara, the scissors. Because there were scissors there, you know, on the windowsill. And Frank couldn't reach them because the plants were holding him so tight and tighter all the time. 
And I knew the scissors were there. I kept them there all the time, just the way I do now, to cut off the dead leaves and things. But I didn't move. I just stood there, repeating those awful words, I hate you, I hate you, I wish you were dead. Barbara! Barbara! I watched his face turn purple and then blue. And then he dropped to the floor. And I watched him drop. And I looked at him. But all I said was... Dead. I listened to the plants for a while. They seemed to be telling me, See how we love you. See, we'll do anything you ask. We are your true loves. We've killed for you. Now you know how much we love you. And then I went to the phone and called you. Darling, you had a bad dream, that's all. No. No, it wasn't a dream. I made the plants do what they did, don't you see? I said I wanted Frank dead, and they hurt me. Or they felt what I was feeling, or they sensed it, or something. And because they love me, and because they know that I'd never kill anybody, oh, of course they not. went ahead and did it for me. Sweetheart, even if what you say is true, if it could be it true, is you true. never laid a finger on But Frank. I'm an accessory, don't you see? I wanted someone to kill Frank. Not me, but someone. And the plants knew it, and they killed him for me. Do you think anybody's going to believe you, sweetheart? Yes. Do you believe me? Honey, is this why you don't want to have a baby? Oh, I want to, but... But what? That's how it all started. Me asking Frank if I could have a baby. Well, why don't you try asking me? You know what kind of an answer you'll get, don't you? Go ahead. Ask me. Ed? Is it all right? Is it? Hello. Uh, this is Mrs. Ed Johnson. Yes. Well, uh, I saw the doctor a couple of days ago, and uh, he was going to have a test made to see if I... Oh, you can tell me. It is really... Really? Oh, yes, I believe you. Thank you very much. It's true. It's really true, dog. Michael, Marianne, I'm going to have a baby. Annabelle, it's true. Kenneth, Cleopatra, Arthur, finally, I'm going to have a baby. What do you think about that? Are you pleased? Are you happy? Tell me what you think, because you're very important to me. Yes, you're my best friend. I'm not young anymore, and there are people who think I'm, well, strange. I'm too emotional, that's what they think. And they may be right. How do I know? So please, tell me, because I trust you. <laughs> Is it all right for me to have a baby? You really think so? Ed! Ed, it's true! I just called the doctor's office and they told me it's true. I'm going to have a baby, Ed. Tell me. Tell me. Is it really all right? We'll be back shortly with Act Three. When you say Budweiser. When you say Bud, you've said a lot of things nobody else can say. When you say Bud, you've gone as far as you can go to get the very best. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When you say bud, you tell the world you know what makes it all the way. When you say bud, you say you care enough to only want the king of beers. There is no other, no one. other one. Anheuser-Busch, St. Louis. 
Macy's store-wide spring sale blossoms all this week with beautiful values in every department, every Macy store. Values like all wool pile oriental design rugs, regularly $200, now just $150. Save in the rug department on worsted wool, imported woven saruk, and kerman designs. Save in every department all this week. Macy's store-wide spring sale. Orange or black, orange or black for things that make a happy day. Orange or black, orange or black, you found the love to grow and stay. Orange or black, got to pull it together. Orange or black, got to feel it free. Orange or black, 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 just to be. Orange or black. still in the little two-room apartment, and the plants still hang in the window, but everything else is different, for it is precisely eight months since we last heard her voice. There. They're gone. Ed, they're gone. What's that, Hermie? The movers have gone. They took the last chair out just now. Oh, oh I hope they don't break anything. Oh, sweetie, they won't. Don't worry about oh, it. Oh, I don't worry about anything anymore. Do you mean that? Sometimes I try to worry, because after all, I used to worry all the time. I mean, I worried all my life, but now I can't worry. I've forgotten how it's being pregnant. Well, maybe I ought to try it. Oh, uh, I'm so sorry for you, you know that. How come? Being a man, you can't ever be happy the way I'm happy. I've got my own way. I feel so complete, so... So fulfilled. I guess so. As though there'd been something missing from the day I was born. And now I've got it. I was so, so unfinished before, but now... I'm, well, I'm complete. Just you wait till we get settled in the new apartment, baby. Wait till we get the little baby's room decorated and the crib moved in and all that other stuff. <laughs> Shouldn't we go over there now? Well, I suppose we ought to give the movers time to get there. No, I want to go now. I can't wait. Yeah, neither can I. Oh, honey. Isn't it wonderful how we always seem to feel the same oh, way? Oh, honey, you never have that other feeling anymore, do you? What feeling? You know about... How Frank died, the plants. Oh, that. You don't ever feel that maybe you shouldn't have a baby. Oh, no. Well, you know, when you first found out, you weren't too sure. Oh, but that was eight months ago. That was before I started feeling the baby grow. Before I knew that it was going to be my baby, my child. And then I knew that if there ever was anything that was right, having this baby was that thing. And Frank, you ever think about him, about that night? I'm not sure it ever happened. I mean, I'm not sure it happened the way I said. I think probably you were right. I dreamed the whole thing. It was an accident, Barbara. Frank and the plants, it was a freak accident. I guess so. Now, come on, let's go over to the new apartment. Hmm. Movers ought to be almost there. Yeah, okay, I'll take the plants down. Oh, no, 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 I want to do that. No, honey, no, no, no. I don't want you doing things like that. Not now. Eight months, holy cow. Oh, don't be silly. I know just how they're tied up because I did it myself in the first place. Come on, hand me the scissors. They're right there. Baby. Now, you cut the string. I think I ought to. No, no, really, they wouldn't like anybody else touching them. I know what you can do. You can get those cartons we saved to pack them in and all that tissue paper. Go on, you do that. That'd be a big help. Okay, if you say so. Oh, here's the scissors. Right. Only take a minute. Yeah, I'll be right back. Uh -huh. Now then, here we go. Now, Cleopatra, let's get you down first. No, Michael, you'll have to wait until last because you're so long and strong. It'd be hard to separate you from the others. Oh! Gee, it's hard to reach. I don't know if I can... Oh, maybe I should have let Ed take you down. My arms hurt. Isn't that funny? I never had any trouble before. Well, of course, it's being pregnant. It's this baby I'm carrying around with me. Are you a boy? Or are you a girl? Or are you twins? I think you're twins. Wouldn't that be heavenly? An old lady like me having twins. A boy and a girl? Oh, I don't care. 
I don't care about anything anymore. Except my husband and my child. I don't even care about the plants. Isn't that strange? For so long, so many years, they were my dearest friends. They were my only friends. And now, they just don't matter anymore. I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to leave them. Right here. You don't need them. We've got a new place to live. We're going to have a baby. We have each other. We don't need these old plants anymore. They can just stay right here. Ed. Ed. I just decided that we don't... No, don't. Get away. Get away from me. Ed. Ed, it's the plants. They're choking me. Ed, the plants. Yeah, I got the cart. Oh, bro. Oh, my God. They're choking me. Right. This is it. Quick. I can't breathe. All right, I've got them. It's all right. It's going to be all right. Barbara. It's all right. Barbara, it's going to be all right. Barbara, are you all right? What the doctor say? He says I'm all right. I can go home. Did you tell him? How could I tell him? I made up something. I said I got tangled up in the clothesline. That was the first thing that came into my head. Anyhow, he didn't ask me many questions because he could see that I wasn't really hurt. I was just scared. Oh, you sure had me scared. Well, they didn't hurt me much, really, the plants. Well, why should they hurt you at all? You love those plants. Ed, Ed, Ed. While I was taking them down, it was harder than I thought it would be, and my arms got tired. Well, I told you to let me do it. And, and I stopped for a minute, and then I thought, why am I bothering with these plants? Taking them down and carting them to the new place and then putting them up all over again. So I thought, I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to leave them. I'm happy. I've got everything I want. I don't need them. I even think I said that out loud. And they heard me. Now, Barbara. But it wouldn't have made any difference. They didn't have to hear me say it out loud. Because they knew what I was thinking. Honey. No, you see, you can't live that close to somebody for so long and so close without knowing what she's thinking. And they knew that I was going to go off and leave them. After all our years together, I was going to abandon them. I didn't care anymore what happened to them. And they knew that. Oh, no, it's just hard to conceive of plans. They, they, they wouldn't have killed me, Ed. They didn't even really mean to hurt me. They were just saying, don't go. Or if you must go, take us with you. You can see that, can't you? All I know is I came into the room and I saw you with the vines around your throat and you were saying, choking me, get the scissors. Well, I got those scissors so fast, they were, they were right there on the windowsill and I... I cut those vines so fast. Boy, you had me worried, baby. Oh, you must have fainted by then. Yeah, and I picked you up and put you in the car, and you came too before we got to the hospital. And here I am, and I'm all right. Yeah, yeah. Barbara, you don't uh, suppose I hurt the plants, do you? I just slashed away. Well, I don't suppose you cut them down very carefully. Oh, heck no. Oh, they'll be all right. I'll trim them properly when we get back. You're uh, not going to leave them there? You're going to take them to the new apartment? Yes. Yes, I am. I don't know what I was thinking of. How could I just go off and leave the things that I've loved and that have loved me? I can't walk out on them. I forgot that. And they were trying to remind me. Yeah. Yeah, I guess you're right. But then you always are. Well, I'm right about this. Yeah. Well, let's go, huh? Yeah. Oh, poor Cleopatra. Why poor Cleopatra? Well, I knocked her on the floor. You what? Yeah, when I was trying to cut you loose, I knocked Cleopatra on the floor, broke the pot and everything. You mean she's lying there, the pot is broken, and she's lying there on the floor with no dirt? Yeah, I guess so. Oh, Ed, come on. Now, Barbara. No, hurry up. We've got to get there before she dies. Look, honey, please, let no, me do it. There she is. Let There's me, Cleopatra. Let me do it, honey. You just stay there. Let Look me out, her up. Ed. They're angry. Ed, they're coming for no, you. No, it's all right. Ed, please get out of the way. Stand yeah, back. Let me do it. They're going to let you do of it. Of course they are. Of course they are. Aren't you, my darling? Aren't you? Ed, hand me that egg and pot, the one right there. No, 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 no. Your roots haven't been out of the earth for very long, my love. Now, gently, gently. No, no, I'm not hurting her. See, Michael? I'm being very gentle. I'm putting the good earth in the pot. See, Michael? 
Ed, get me some water, just a little. Honey, I don't like leaving you Don't be silly. I'll be perfectly all right. Okay, I'll be right back. Now, you see, Michael? I'm scooping up every last bit of the nice brown earth, and I'm sifting it through my fingers. See? See, Annabelle? See, all of you? Oh, very carefully with the beautiful, loose brown earth. Here you are. Now, we put a little water in. Not very much, because the earth wasn't very dry. Ed, there's some plant food on the windows. Yes, I got it. Here we are. Now, we mix just a little of it into the soil. There we are, like that. And now, Cleopatra, my love, let me pick you up. I'll hold you for a second. And don't be frightened, my dear. No, 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 no. And put your little roots into the dirt. Very gently, very carefully. And press the dirt down around them. And then we add the rest of the dirt. Almost to the top. And we press it down. Not too hard, just enough to make you feel safe. There we are. You see, Michael? Mary Ann? Annabelle, see? She's going to be all right. You think she really will, Bill? Oh, yes, yes. Yes, I'm going to set her here on the windowsill. I let the sun pour all over her. Well, shouldn't you start taking down the other plants? No, no, not yet. They've had an awful shock. Yeah, but, honey, the, the furniture movers at the other apartment, they, they must be going crazy wondering where we are. Well, you go. You take the car and go over there. What about you? Come back for me later. Okay. Like uh, in an hour? Well, make it a couple of hours. Okay, baby. Hmm. Baby boats of silver moon sailing on the sea. Yes, my dear ones, rest. Rest, my darling. Sail, baby, sail Out across the sea Only don't forget to sail Home again to me Only don't forget to sail Home again to me The next time you pass by a plant Stop and look Make a little bow Or tip your hat And if its leaves flutter and make a sound. Listen. It may be trying to tell you something. I'll be back shortly. Commuting. We're big on that. Time is money in the business world. That's why Ozark offers commuter flights that get you there and back the same day. Don't ever let a few hundred miles stand between you and big business opportunities. If you're long on work but short on time, let Ozark make your day pay off. Commuting, we're big on that. Jet to Champaign-Urbana, Peoria, and Springfield, Illinois. Call Ozark or your travel agent. Macy's store-wide spring sale blossoms all this week with beautiful values in every department, every Macy's store. Values like Lee's Broadloom. Save 2 to $4 a square yard installed over sponge rubber padding. 35 styles, 500 colors. Regularly $12.99 to $21.99 a square yard. Now sale priced $9.99 to $17.99. Save in every department all this week. Macy's store-wide spring sale. Our cast included Mercedes McCambridge, Larry Haynes, and Ralph Bell. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by New Sugar-Free Diet 7-Up. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. The W.R. Mystery Theater has been brought to you by ShopRite Supermarkets, where you get a lot more for a little less. And by Suburban Savings with offices throughout North Jersey. The preceding Mystery Theater program is furnished by the CBS Radio Network.
Stand by now for a chilling moment from tomorrow night's W.O.R. mystery theater drama. You belong to her now, Claude. You belong to Venus. What are you saying? You made a vow to the statue. I was only joking. We were all only joking. Perhaps. But she took it seriously. But it's only a statue. It's the statue that stood in the shrine of the Temple of Venus. It is the Venus herself. But what does she want? She wants you. I didn't mean it. You saw it was all in fun. She wants you, Claude. She wants to love you. And then, as she's done so many times in the past, she'll kill you. Tomorrow night's thriller is called Venus Deal. It features Norman Rose and Joan Lovejoy and will be heard following Fulton Lewis at 7 o'clock right here on WOR Radio, the talk of New York. Boy, if the old-timer Horatio K. Boomer and Wally Wimple could see me now. <laughs> Trevor McGee, back on the radio right here from 79 Westville Vista with a brand-new program where I'm going to bring back the great old radio shows from way back. Shows like Mr. Keen, Lum and Abner. Well, I guess I ought to get this place straightened up a bit, though. Where's that vacuum? Oh, I left it in the hall closet. Oh, look. Hear the good old days of radio tonight at 9.05, right here on WOR New York and RKO General Station. I'm Fulton Lewis in the Mutual Broadcasting System studios in Washington, D.C. Now, my commentary. President Nixon goes before the television cameras and radio microphones tonight to explain to the nation why he will only partially comply with a House Judiciary subpoena for tape recordings of some 42 White House conversations. It is not known just how partial the president's compliance will be. Most bets are that he's going to deliver some of the tapes in their entirety. Others may be edited with discussions which the president feels are not germane to the House Committee's impeachment inquiry excluded. In some other cases, Chairman Peter Rodino's panel may just get written transcripts of the tapes, not the tapes themselves. Knowing that that would not satisfy the Judiciary Committee, Chairman Rodino has said that he will be satisfied with nothing short of complete compliance with the subpoena. President Nixon tonight is likely to strike out at some happy middle ground, or a middle ground that he thinks would be happy, selecting perhaps some mutually acceptable third party who would vouch for the authenticity of the transcripts and who would ensure that any areas which are edited out are, in fact, non-germane. Again, though, that is not likely to satisfy the Judiciary Committee, which has insisted all the way along on getting only the original materials. The president, of course, has until 10 a.m. tomorrow to formally comply with a subpoena. It is an unprecedented situation in which a House committee is clearly, clearly treading on what some constitutional attorneys regard as sacred executive territory. The Constitution, remember, establishes three separate but totally equal branches of the federal government. Each has a right to remain aloof from the other. The president, in other words, if he so chose, could probably duck behind the so-called executive privilege in refusing to even partially comply with a House committee subpoena. It would be a contest that would eventually wind up in the federal courts, no doubt the Supreme Court, and technically, even if the Supreme Court were to side with the Congress, the president could just challenge the court to enforce its ruling, knowing full well that the Supreme Court has no enforcement powers. You can be sure, though, that even though these options may have crossed Mr. Nixon's mind at one time or another, they have never been seriously contemplated. There is an element of politics in his present dilemma. An impeachment threat is breathing heavily down his neck. He must be certain on the one hand that in responding to the demands of a panel of the House of Representatives, which has been charged with the initial impeachment inquiry, he does not establish any precedents which would do irreparable damage to the doctrine of separation of powers, the president must be equally certain, on the other hand, that he does not go so far down the road of executive privilege, that he waves a red flag in the face of a potentially bullish Congress, angering it to the point where, for sheer spite, it might remove Mr. Nixon from office. Well, yesterday, a jury in New York acquitted the two men who were at the top of the official totem pole throughout the Watergate scandal. The two men who, it was widely charged, were more to blame than any others. Charges of presidential guilt have always been conditioned on the degree to which Mr. Nixon may have known about or cooperated with men like former Attorney General John Mitchell and former Commerce Secretary Maurice Stans in their, quote, unquote, crimes. 
Well, after a long and heated and belabored trial, it turns out that a jury in New York feels that neither Mitchell or Stans did commit those crimes. They were not guilty of nine charges of criminal conspiracy. They were not guilty of lying to a federal grand jury in connection with a secret $200,000 cash contribution to the president's 1972 campaign. With that court decision, the bottom literally dropped out of the case against President Nixon. How on earth could the president possibly be guilty of some criminal cover-up of a crime if a court feels that a crime was not in fact committed? Granted, the acquittal of Mitchell and Stans yesterday does not completely absolve Mr. Nixon. There remains hanging the questions of H.R. Haldeman and John Ehrlichman and others whether they tried to cover up the story of Watergate itself, and if they did, whether their actions in turn were done with the knowledge and blessing of the president. But remember, even if they are found guilty of criminal conduct, there must be further evidence, evidence beyond reasonable doubt, that there was knowledge and blessing from Mr. Nixon before the guilt can be assessed to him. Nothing short of that could, in the wildest stretches of the imagination, possibly satisfy the constitutional requirements for impeachment, and if public opinion has any influence on the jurors in the impeachment procedure, and you can bet public opinion will have a tremendous influence since those jurors are all politicians, members of Congress, well, the verdict yesterday in the Stans Mitchell case is likely to have a considerable impact. It demonstrated clearly that at least a few charges of corruption within the highest levels of the Nixon administration in recent years were unfounded charges, and the public is bound to wonder if Stans and Mitchell were accused falsely, isn't it just within the realm of possibility that President Nixon has himself been the victim of equally false accusations? That verdict in this respect is probably the first really good news that Mr. Nixon has had since the Watergate era started a long 15 months ago. These are the events that shaped the past few days. The events of the next 24 hours are likely to go a long way towards shaping the political destiny of Richard Nixon as a person, and with him, of course, the political destiny of our entire nation. They will be hours of great historical significance, great historical importance. Another key point in the Stans Mitchell trial was noted today by the foreman of the jury that acquitted the two former cabinet officers. She said that she and her fellow jurors doubted the truthfulness of one of the major prosecution witnesses, former White House counsel John W. Dean III. Dean's credibility came in doubt, she said, when he admitted that he had pleaded guilty to a charge of obstruction of justice in the Watergate scandal, pleaded guilty in hopes of drawing a lighter sentence. Here in the nation's capital, Vice President Gerald Ford had some comments of his declaring that the jury's verdict in the Mitchell Stans case, in the vice president's words, says to me that John Dean's credibility has been severely eroded. It is John Dean, of course, who was the key witness against President Nixon. Indeed, when you get right down to it, he was the only witness who actually tried to implicate the president in any criminal wrongdoing at the Senate Watergate hearings. It is the same John W. Dean III who was slated to be a key prosecution witness in other cases which are still pending against other former high-level Nixon administration officials who have been accused of involvement in the Watergate scandal. You remove this John W. Dean III from the prosecution case, and that apparently is what the jury in the Mitchell Stans case did, and all of a sudden you have a large sailboat with no wind in its sails. It's not going to go very far. Dean's credibility, rather his lack of credibility, was precisely what the Nixon forces hoped to establish, and apparently they have achieved that number one objective. From the Mutual Studios in Washington, I'm Fulton Lewis, and that's the top of the news. I'm E.G. Marshall. Welcome to our world of mystery and the macabre. The Romans called her Venus. The Greeks knew her as Aphrodite. To other ancient peoples, she was Ishtar, Isis, and Astarte. But whatever the name, she was always the same. The mysterious, passionate, voluptuous goddess of love. And sometimes, of death. Our mystery drama... The Venus de Ile 
was especially adapted from the Prosper Merrimack classic for the Mystery Theater by Sam Dan and stars Norman Rose. It is sponsored in part by the Kellogg Company, makers of Kellogg's Special K cereal, and by new sugar-free Diet 7-Up. I'll be back shortly with Act One. When you feel like having a cold Budweiser, do you automatically reach for a glass? Well, sure, Bud's a great beer any way you drink it. But without a glass, you're really missing something. Now, take that wonderful Budweiser head of foam, for instance. Those bubbles, tiny though they are, still amount to something pretty special at the top of your glass. Taste appeal and eye appeal. Two results of exclusive beechwood aging and natural carbonation. It takes a lot longer to brew Budweiser that way. But brewing beer right does make a difference that you can taste. That's why when you say Budweiser, you've really said it all. Anheuser-Busch, St. Louis. Suburban Suburban Savings offers you an easy way to borrow without touching a penny in your regular savings passbook account. Just let Suburban loan you the money. It's called Suburban Savings Passbook Loan. You can borrow up to 90% of the total amount you have on deposit at reasonable rates. And you can pay off your loan at your convenience. When your loan is repaid, you still have all of your savings intact. Plus interest. So if you need money, why not take a loan from Suburban without touching your savings? Suburban Savings Passbook Loan. In New Jersey, at Bayonne, Edgewater, Elmwood Park, Emerson, Hackettstown, Morris Plains, Nutley, Paramus, and Sparta. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you. And now, mesdames et messieurs, we play. Oh. And it is 13, rouge, 13, red. There, you see, it's always rouge when I bet Noir. But how can you change horses in midstream? No, I have faith. 50,000 francs on the black. Uh, I'm sorry, Monsieur le Vicomte. About what? There can be no more credit. No credit? Call the manager. It was the manager himself who gave the order. Oh, I see. I am sorry, monsieur. Uh, save my place at the table. Come in. Ah, oh, Claude. Have a chair, my boy. Oh, monsieur Armand, is this how you treat an old friend? We'll have a glass of champagne. Fabulous flavor. What is the meaning of have this? Have a cigar. Just arrived from Havana. Have a chair. Have a glass of champagne. Have a cigar. I'm waiting to hear you offer me what I came in for. And what's that? Credit. Credit. Let me talk to you like a father. I can see where this is leading. No credit. Had you not come to see me, I would have gone to see you. Why? You owe this establishment one million francs. And? And there are those who will demand payment. Those who will take drastic steps. If payment is not forthcoming within the next few days. What are you talking about? My boy, we are now... How can I say this? Well, we are now organized. Organized? We are owned by a syndicate. And all debts must be collected. They will be collected by people who are known as... Enforcers, I think. Will you extend me credit or not? Claude, please listen. The syndicate has been through my books. You are in danger. You expect me to be frightened by these hoodlums? Claude, give me some assurances that you can pay or else please disappear for a while. I, uh, I have a document that will not only encourage you to extend credit, but will also satisfy the vultures who seem to be running your establishment. The document? Mm -hmm. I have here a letter from Mlle. Eloise Calvert. The heiress? Yes, the heiress. The wealthiest young lady in France. In which she says, among other things, 
My darling Claude, if you refuse to marry me, I don't think I care to live any longer. She says that? Now, I would assume that this should serve as a gilt-edged letter of credit, a document even stronger than the Bank of France. May I see the letter? Ah, if you insist. Hmm. Fine. On the basis of this, your credit is unlimited. But make sure the engagement is announced within three or four days. Of course. And perhaps sooner. <laughs> Good morning, Eloise. Oh, it's only you, are we? I'm sorry you're disappointed. Oh, well, you're not bad. And if there were no Claude Louis, you might even do. Henri, have you seen him? He's probably still fast asleep. No, he promised to play tennis with me this morning. Well, then he'll be along. Uh, where did you get this amazing statue? Oh, I don't know. Uh, Monsieur Delon, who bought all that art for my father, my dear departed father, advised me to pick it up. It's fantastic. A bronze eight-foot Venus. She should be worth more than the one at the Louvre. <laughs> at least this, this one has arms. Why do you place her here, at the entrance to your tennis court? Why not? We always have a crowd here. Why should she be lonesome? Do you know that in Greek and Roman times, our very town of Il had a temple sacred to Venus? Yes, right here. <laughs> well, now, how and why should I know a thing like that? And this was the great statue of Venus that stood in the shrine of the temple. Really? The same one? Look at the air of mystery that surrounds the face. This is a woman of many moods and passions. Here comes Claude Louis. Good morning, Eloise. Hello, darling. And Cousin Henri. Have you examined this statue, Claude? Great big girl, isn't she? She's, uh, magnificent, too. The goddess of love. The fickle, jealous, unpredictable goddess of love. Well, I came down to play tennis. And I am ready for you. You're not really very good this morning. Well, wait till I warm up. Ah, just, I'm just toying with you. You can hardly hit the ball. What will you do in the game? I'll tell you what it is, darling. Uh -huh. An excuse coming up. Make it good. Well, it's this ring. This ring I'm wearing. That big, ostentatious, vulgar now, ring. Now, now. It belonged to my father. Oh, I never liked it. Uh, stop. Uh, stop for a minute. I, I want to take it off. I, I can't grip the racket properly. Ah. Uh. Now, now, where can I put it? I don't have a pocket in these trousers. Well, why don't you just throw the ugly thing away? I'll buy you a new one. Oh, now, darling, it has a very sentimental value. Oh, I, I know a good place for it. Excuse me a minute. Where are you going? I'll, uh, I'll just put it on Miss Venus's finger. Oh, and I thought you came here to put a ring on my finger. No, no, Claude, no. No what? Don't do that. It's, uh... It's what? I was about to say blasphemy, but that's not really the word. Oh, Ari, what are you talking about? But it just doesn't seem right. After all, she is the goddess of love, and you can't... Yes? You're offering her your ring, which means you're asking her to marry you. Do you have any idea what you're saying, Henri? That is, symbolically, of course. Eloise, is your cousin always like this? Well, he's um, a very deep person. Hey, Claude, I wouldn't do that if I were you. Don't put that ring on her finger. Why not? Ah, there we are. <laughs> it fits her perfectly. Looks good on her, too. All right. Now let's see if that ring really was what cramped your style, Claude. <laughs> Let's see you get that one. Ah, oh, dear. Nice. But you'll have to do it again. Watch out. You were better than last time, but still not good enough. Well, if all I did was play tennis all day... Why don't you? Uh-oh. It's going to come down any minute. Let's run for the house. We shouldn't be out here in the lightning. Hey, Henri, get my ring, will you? And, and meet us in the house, Henri. Come on, Claude. Oh, uh, wait a minute. Oh, he's just standing there. Darling, it's going to pour any second. What's the matter with him? Ollie! Eloise, is he all right? Well, let's go see. Ollie, 
Ollie. Ollie, what are you staring at? Your... Your ring, Claude. Well, what about my ring? It won't come off her finger. What? Try it. Try it yourself. Just try to take it off. All right, I will. Well, please hurry. We'll be drenched. Huh. See what I mean, Claude? What does he mean, Claude? Well, this... This ring, my ring, for some reason. I, I, I can't seem to get it off her finger. What on earth are you talking about? Just just take it off. Well, it, it seems to be stuck. Why? I don't know. Wait. Uh, why are we just standing around in the rain? Why won't this ring come off? I can't even move it. Well, you worry about it. I'm going into the house before I get soaked. Ari. Ari, why can't I get this ring off? Why? Dinner will be ready in a few minutes. The chef went out of his way for Claude. Oh, Henri, why doesn't he ask me to marry him? Who? The chef? No, idiot, Claude. <laughs> he will. After all, he's penniless. Oh, now, that's not worthy of you. I'm... I'm sorry. Where is Claude? He's out on the tennis court. Now? It seems he still can't get his ring off that goddess's finger. I don't believe it. Do you want to go see? In this rain? No, thank you. Ah, oh, Claude. Oh, darling, look at you. You're dripping wet. Well, I, I, I'm sorry. I, I'll go right upstairs and change. What were you doing outside? Well, I, I know it sounds silly, but I was trying to get my ring off her finger. And did you? No, no. There could be a kind of secret spring, and it, it snapped, and it sort of curved her finger around it. I don't know what to do about it. Is it all right if I just leave it there? Oh, I never liked that ring. If the statue wants it that badly, let her have it. Did you enjoy dinner, darling? Oh, it was delicious. Pierre outdid himself. How would you know? You scarcely touched your food. Eloise, if you must know, it's that silly statue. Can't we forget her finally, I hope? Henri, how do you account for it? You wouldn't believe a word I say. Oh, well, say it. In the old days, she was the center of an adoring, worshipping populace right here. Every day, she was presented with gifts. And then suddenly, it stopped. The old religion had died. And for nearly 2,000 years, she's been neglected. Suddenly, once again, she is given a gift. You can imagine that this one is more precious to her than anything in her history. And so, she refuses to give it up. Claude, darling, of course, Henry is crazy, but he's only my cousin by marriage, so it doesn't run in the family. Well, it's, uh, it's rather late. I think I'll... Turn in. Good night, all. Good night. Oh, yes, good night. Of course, you received my letter. That's why I came. I love you, Claude. I love you, too. I... But I want you to ask me. Oh, yes. Yes, I will. Well, I'm waiting. Eloise, I... Claude, why are you so pale? Uh... I, I, I don't know. Are you ill? I feel very strange. How? As if... As if I hear music. Music? But there's no It's music. an unusual kind of music. I've never heard anything like it before. Claude. Claude. You belong to me. You have given me your ring. You belong to me. You belong to me. Forever. What did Claude do? Did he really awaken this sleeping goddess after so many centuries? And now another story of the ball and chain as Kellogg's Special K presents Veronica and Jeff. Oh, 
Oh, Jeffrey, isn't this romantic? Out in a quiet lake at night with you rowing the boat. Yes, Veronica, it's really neat. Jeffrey, what was that? Uh, frogs. Frogs that go bong? Uh, they're pretty weird frogs. Oh, Jeffrey, you're such a car. You have a ball and chain, like the ones they use in those special K commercials. Yes, Veronica, it symbolizes my few pounds of extra weight. But I'm going to get rid of it. How? Uh, by exercising. You know, like rowing this boat and eating smart at every meal, starting with a special K breakfast. You mean a one-ounce bowl of high protein Special K, four ounces of skim milk, orange juice, and coffee? Uh, precisely. It's less than 240 calories, and it tastes delicious. It'll help me get rid of this ball and chain. I'll help too, Jeff. After all, we're all in the same boat. <gasps> you have a ball and chain too. <laughs> Your happy ending could begin with a Special K breakfast from Kellogg's. Hey, ma'am, what's for dinner? Hey, ma'am, what you got? It's time to get ready for the great outdoors, and your ShopRite supermarket has everything you'll need for cookout dinners and fun in the sun. And for this week's dinners, ShopRite is featuring whole grade-A frying chickens, just 37 cents a pound. Roasting chickens up to 4 pounds, 47 cents a pound. Choice beef rib steaks $1.19 a pound. ShopRite franks, 89 cents a pound. Get all your outdoor cooking equipment and many great food values at your ShopRite supermarket. She does all that she can do She lets shop right to the rest Hey, my, what's for dinner? Shop right has the answer This is WOR New York, your mystery theater station Something's wrong. I, I have a feeling... I'm going to call the doctor. Oh, no. But you're ill. No, I'm not ill. Darling, please, get some rest. I'm sure you'll feel better in the morning. Oh, yes, yes, I'm sure of it. I'll, I'll just sit here for a few minutes and smoke a pipe. All right. Good night, Claude. Good night. My beloved... Lord Louis, my beloved. Who is that? Who's there? Claude, you will come with me. You will live with the gods. You will live like a god. Leave this house. Leave this foolish mortal woman and come with me. No. God, I am the goddess of love. I am also the goddess of death. No. No, no. Let me alone. Oh, good morning, darling. Good morning. I had to appear to prepare an especially delicious breakfast, so I do hope you're hungry. Ah, Mademoiselle Louise, Monsieur Claude. What is it, René? Monsieur Claude, you asked me to see about the ring. What ring? Oh, that ring. Uh, were you able to... The ring just won't come off. It's like um, fused to the metal. Oh, could that be... Possible somehow? No, sir. It is not possible unless you welded it on there, which you didn't. Well, then what's to be done? Nothing. Unless you want to cut the finger off. Oh, no, no. Uh, I am so tired of all this chatter about that silly ring. Oh, thank you, René. I appreciate what you've done. Uh, yes, Monsieur Claude. Good day. I tried my best. <sighs> I'm sorry I bought that ridiculous statue. She's hardly ridiculous. And now you're starting to talk like Henri. Well, I'm sorry. I keep asking myself, why did I have to fall in love with you? Well, because I'm charming and handsome. No, well, the sensible thing would have been to fall in love with Henri. Uh, darling, I'll go up and change and meet you at the tennis court. Oh, 
Listen. Whoever you are, whatever you are, listen. I put that ring on your finger the way... Well, the way you place a hat on a rack or a coat on a hook. I wasn't thinking of... Well, I certainly didn't mean anything by it. So, if this is all a practical joke, fine. The joke's on me. But, but if you really are a goddess and you're taking this seriously, what would you want with me, anyhow? You are my beloved. I, I'm trying to explain. I must marry Eloise Calvert. I have no choice. I am your bride. I will share you with no mortal woman. I will see you dead first. I didn't know you were in the habit of talking to yourself. Oh, Henri, what are you doing here? Eloise sent me. Her lawyer has just arrived from Paris. He has papers for her to sign. Oh. In anticipation of your coming marriage, she's having considerable property signed over to you. Oh. Something wrong with you this morning? Well, well yes, it, it... Well, it's that damn statue. Claude, I shouldn't say this. Shouldn't say what? I have good advice for you, even if it goes against my own interest. Please, forget about that statue. Well, forget? This whole affair about the ring and the mysterious fact that it won't come off is starting to frighten Eloise. Frightened? She doesn't like to be frightened. Well, who does? She's been fantastically rich all her life. She's always had everything she wanted by snapping her fingers. Except you. Well, she's got me. No, not quite yet. Instinctively, you know how to treat her. You don't fall at her feet the way the rest of us do. You maintain a kind of reserve. That's because you know all about women. Uh, you flatter me. Even now, you're playing her to perfection. True, it's a formality, but she wants that ritual declaration of love, that beautifully stated proposal of marriage, and you delay it exquisitely. But I came here to propose. You've already proposed to one goddess. Stop that, will you? The goddess of love. And now you intend to propose to another. Eloise? A goddess? Of course. The goddess of wealth and power. How fortunate. Each of these goddesses wants you as her consort. Oh, Henri, sometimes I wonder about your sanity. <laughs> That's just another way of saying that you wonder about your own. Why won't the ring come off? Well, there must be an explanation. Yes, there is. You're the fiancée of Venus. She won't give you up. I mean a rational explanation. It makes sense to me. And it also makes sense to you. You don't have to admit it. Well, I came here to propose to Eloise. Then why don't you do it? I will. I'll take her out to dinner tonight. And I'll ask her to marry me. A lovely place. A bit off the beaten track, darling. And the food. <laughs> I wanted a perfect setting. For what? For the most important statement of my life. <laughs> flatterer. Of course I'm a flatterer. And you love flattery. Doesn't every woman? Oh, I can see we're going to be a very straightforward couple. Yes. Eloise, I... Yes? I want to ask you to... I'm waiting. I, I... You're mine, Claude. You gave me your ring. But... But I told you... Claude, you may play with other women. You may deceive other women. But no man in the history of the world has ever deceived me and lived. I am Venus... I am Aphrodite. I am Astarte. I am Isis. I am Ishtar. But I only... Hundreds, thousands, numberless races of men on this planet have worshipped me under numberless names. And now, I choose you. 
I choose you, Claude Louis. You belong to me. You are mine. You must leave this woman. Claude. I, I must be... Darling, something is wrong. No, I, I just feel very... Very what? See, you can't say. You don't know. But I know. Do you? I spoke to Dr. Legrand. He told me all about men like you. Men like me? Yes. It has to do with the fear of becoming a husband. But I have no fear of... Yes, yes, you do. Oh, you do. Way down, deep down in the subconscious where you're unaware of it. You're giving up the old, wild freedom. And you're just not sure you want to... Oh, but I, I am... Well, I intend to... To be patient. I love you. Ah, good evening, Claude. Oh, well, good evening, Monsieur Armand. I was dining here with some associates, and uh, I thought I would come over to pay my respects. Oh, yes. Uh, darling, may I present Monsieur Armand? I am honored, mademoiselle. Enchanté. Well, Claude, I had expected... Uh, uh, yes? Apropos of our last discussion, I had expected a settlement uh, or a statement. Oh, yes, uh, yes, I know. As a matter of fact, my associates were saying just now, why do you suppose we have not heard... Reassure your associates for me, monsieur, that, that everything is in order. Of course. So happy to have made your acquaintance, mademoiselle. Darling, what was he talking about? Oh, business proposition. Claude, Monsieur Armand, he's sitting at that table. Look, over to the right, you see? Oh, well, what about it? Well, look at those two men at the table with him. He called them his business associates. I suppose they are. Well, then I cannot imagine what sort of business he could be engaged in. Those two men are the worst-looking... Thugs I've ever seen in my life. Uh, now, darling, you shouldn't judge by appearance. They could be tender hearted, church going, devoted family oh, men. Oh, no. Hired killers would be more likely. Darling, take me home. I'm frightened. Ah, good morning, Claude. Morning, Henri. You seem to have quite an appetite this morning. What do they say? The condemned man ate a hearty meal. What does that mean? I'm not sure. Have you seen Eloise? Oh, no, she's still asleep. Well, that's not like her. She's worried about you. Well, everything's all right. We can be married tomorrow if she wants. Oh, you've decided? Of course. And what about the other one? What other one? As if you don't know. I'm not sure I understand. The Venus, your own Venus deed. Oh, that. Well, let me tell you, I didn't sleep last night. Oh, I'm sorry. No, no, it was good for me. Henri, I did some thinking. And? And I called myself every stupid name I could remember. Why? If I keep this up, this, this groundless, mindless, idiotic fear or apprehension, if I keep imagining she talks to me, well, I can very well lose Eloise. Eloise is very much in love with you. Uh, love. Love is an illusion. You fall in, you fall out. I can read women. This ring business is beginning to irritate her. Worse, it's starting to bore her. Ah, I've been warning you. What really happened? I needed a resting place for a ring. So I absently placed it on the finger of a statue. A lifeless metal statue. You follow me? You're telling the story. Due to some phenomenon that probably has a rational explanation, if we ever find it, the ring seems to adhere to the finger of the statue. Is that true? <laughs> Obviously, the ring's still there. But... That's all that happened. Who said anything else? You did. Me? You. You're the one who invested the statue with all kinds of magic and mysterious qualities. Well, I, I was merely stating some facts. Oh, yes, yes, of course. But you have an ulterior motive. If you could get me upset, fire my imagination, perhaps, something might happen and you could have Eloise for yourself. I'm not aware that I've tried to upset you. No, not consciously, perhaps. Well, in any event, it's all over. And I certainly will not jeopardize my chance of becoming a billionaire because of an overactive imagination. Do you understand me? Yes. But I wish you'd be honest with yourself. 
You said you absently placed the ring on her finger. Is that really true? Or did you do it as a joke? Or did you, as millions of men before you, actually fall in love with her? Oh, no, Ari. We're not having any more of that. Well, old girl, I must say it was exciting. It was even fun for a while. Venus deal. Ah, you must have been something in your day. All woman. Oh, no. No, madame. I'm wise to these little tricks of the mind. Not this time. Not again. Claude. Of course, Claude. But you're in my head. You're part of my imagination. Claude, you belong to me. I belong to no one. I belong to myself. Foolish, Claude. Do you think you can fight me? You're just an image in my own brain. <laughs> Claude. You don't love Eloise. You're in love with love. Claude. I am love. I... I don't believe. Yes, Claude. You believe. You believe. The love I offer you is beyond dreams, beyond imagination. No. No, I'm not listening. A glorious love. No, please. Don't be frightened. Come with me. Live with me. Live like a god. A god. Live on love. No. You asked me, God. You gave me your ring. You wanted me. You always wanted me. Say it. No. Say it, Claude. Say the truth. <laughs> yes. 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 Then. Come with me. Now. Now. That's it. That's how it happened. That's how it happened. I know. I know how it happened. Oh, uh, what are you doing standing out here and yelling like a maniac? It's another electrical storm. We'd better get inside. Oh, yes. Come, Claude. Now. Now, I know. What do you know? I know. I know why the ring is stuck on her finger. Huh? Do you? Is it so important after all? Oh, yes. It's important. Do you remember what Rene said? He said, it looked as if the ring is fused to the metal. Well, look closely. Doesn't it appear that way? Well, what's the difference? He also said it was impossible unless you welded it on. And, of course, you didn't. No, I didn't. But someone else did. Who? Perhaps not a who, but a what. What did happen? We were playing tennis. I took the ring off, placed it on her finger. Well, we already know all that. Tell us the rest of it. You know the rest of it, too. Claude. Of course you do. We kept playing tennis, and then... And suddenly there was a, a, a peal of thunder, a flash of lightning. Well, don't you see? No. The lightning. It must have it must have struck the statue in such a way as to have fused the ring to her finger. Well, that's impossible. Oh, no, no, it's not impossible. It could have happened. Well, then it answers the question and finally settles the problem. It's the only way we can account for it. Unless... No, no, I'll read no more of these unlesses. So now, can we forget about oh, it? Absolutely, my darling. Eloise, marry me. What? I said marry me. But I, I was expecting... You were expecting a romantic speech, poetry, sweet music, sparkling wine. Yes. Shall I try again? Oh, no. No, I accept. I accept. May I be the first to offer congratulations? Of course, of course, Henri. You fought a good fight. Ah, but the better man won. Eloise, my darling, may I... May I ask for a wedding present now? Oh, anything. Good. Would you... Could you... Get rid of this statue? <laughs> My rival? Well? Of course. We'll donate her to a museum. No, no. No, I mean... Get rid of her. How? Have her destroyed. Melted down. Oh? Uh, but Claude, she's priceless. Well, I... I'll have it 
taken care of tomorrow. Well, can it be done today? Oh, yes, Rene will be back in the morning and... Oh, well, I, I suppose it'll be all right. He'll take care of her. First thing. Ah, uh, ladies and gentlemen, your attention, please. Oh, uh, uh, a away. toast to the happy couple. Oh. <laughs> yes, congratulations. Long life. Thank you. Thank you all. Claude and I are so happy. Please, everybody, eat, drink, dance. Help us enjoy this, this glorious occasion. You look beautiful, my dear. Oh, I always dreamed of a night like this. Are you happy? Oh, yes. Completely? Yes. It's odd. You, you look so thoughtful. Do I? Very. I'm only thinking of us. Only of us? My darling, in this whole wide world, there are only the two of us. But, Claude, is something the matter? You're frowning. I, I wasn't aware. You're not ill? No, no, of course not. You don't look very comfortable. Oh, well, perhaps it's a bit close in here. I may just need a breath of fresh air. Oh, I'll go with you. No, no, dear. We both can't leave our guests. I'll just step outside for a moment. It'll do me good. Claude. Claude Louis. No, no. You fool. I won't believe it. What won't you believe? I won't believe you are there. You have dared to trifle with the heart of a goddess. I don't know what you're saying. I offered you my love. I would have given myself to you. I've got to fight this. I am not mad. I've got to fight. Of all the uncounted millions since the very beginning of the human race, I offered myself to you. I accept this as an hallucination. Fool! Look at me. Look at me! No. It can't be. It can't be. You... You're human. You're, you're flesh and blood. You're a woman. Yes. A woman. A woman spurned. A woman scorned. I didn't know. How was I to know? I told you. I told you. Forgive me. Please forgive me. Forgive you. Come to my arms. Embrace me. Know what you might have had. I know what you have lost forever. I love you. I love you. Fool! Fool! Please. Please. You, you're, you're crushing me. You love me. But now you can only die for the love of me. No. Please. Let me. Let me love you. Let me go. No. No. Help. Help. Claude. Claude, where are you? Eloise is worried about... Claude. Oh, no. Don't come close, Eloise. Don't look, Eloise. Don't. The statue, it fell on him. He's... Yes. He's dead. Hmm. The statue just crushed him. Oh, we... Oh, we look. What is it? Look at the ring. That ring. I don't see the ring. Look. Where? On Claude's finger. Oh. The ring is back on Claude's finger. <laughs> Well, you have a choice. You can believe that the goddess Venus fell in love with Claude, became angry when he jilted her, and killed him. Or you can believe that he went out for a walk and the rain had softened the statue's foundation and it just fell on him. There were also the enforcers. All the ingredients are there for a provocative stew. Use what you like and stir to your taste. I'll be back shortly. If you thought you 
couldn't afford to fly to California this summer, TWA has some good news for you. You can. Thanks to TWA's demand schedule service, you can fly to California for only $125. Just make your reservations 90 days before you want to go and put down a $20 deposit for each way. For all the details, call your travel agent. TWA's demand schedule service. Now you can afford to fly to California. Our cast included Norman Rose, Joan Lovejoy, E.V. Jester, Dan Ocko, and Robert Dryden. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Anheuser-Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. W.R. Mystery Theater has been brought to you by ShopRite Supermarkets, where you get a lot more for a little less, and by Suburban Savings with offices throughout North New Jersey. The preceding Mystery Theater program is furnished by the CBS Radio Network. This is Mary Helen McPhillips. Remember a few years back when you couldn't get a newspaper to read because there was a strike? Well, that prospect once again looms on the horizon. And tomorrow morning at 10.15, my guest will be Sheldon Zelaznik, editorial director of New York Magazine. And he'll explain the problems that currently face New York City's daily newspapers. So join me at 10.15. I'm Fulton Lewis in the Mutual Broadcasting System studios in Washington, D.C. Now, my commentary. President Nixon's edited Watergate transcripts were formally delivered to Congress today with a White House brief that pronounced them proof of the president's innocence and quoted him as ordering amid the unraveling cover-up a year ago that, quote, everybody in this case is to talk and to tell the truth. In a volume roughly the size of a big city telephone book, 1,308 pages of transcripts were sent to the House Judiciary Committee for its inquiry into the president's possible impeachment. Separate copies in manila envelopes were delivered to the 38 committee members individually. They are going to meet tomorrow to decide whether to accept them in lieu of the White House tape recordings that the panel had originally subpoenaed. With them went a 50-page brief that was prepared by the president's impeachment attorney, James St. Clair, which wove presidential quotations together with a White House account of what the president actually said and did during the crucial phase of the Watergate cover-up attempt. The St. Clair paper concludes, quote, Throughout the period of the Watergate affair, the raw material of these recorded confidential conversations establishes that the president had no prior knowledge of the break-in and that he had no knowledge of any cover-up prior to March 21st, 1973. In all of the thousands of words spoken, even though they often are unclear and ambiguous, not once does it appear that the president of the United States was engaged in any criminal plot to obstruct justice. While the official business today was the delivery of those papers to the House panel, their public release was perhaps more crucial to the president's latest effort to clear himself and settle the Watergate scandal. For the president himself said Monday night that in releasing the papers, he was placing his trust in the basic fairness of the American people to examine the evidence and see that he sought only to do what was right. One of the quotes included in the St. Clair brief today as evidence of the president's determination to clear up Watergate came from an April 15, 1973 conversation with Assistant Attorney General Henry Peterson about the refusal of conspirator G. Gordon Liddy to cooperate with the government prosecutors. Quote, I want him to be sure to understand that as far as the president is concerned, everybody in this case is to talk and to tell the truth. You are to tell everybody, and you don't even have to call me on that with anybody. You just say that those are your orders. Another statement from an April 14th conversation with former aide John Ehrlichman reads this way, quote, We have to prick the boil and take the heat. Now that's what we're doing here. We're going to prick this boil and take the heat. I am not overstating. Within hours after the presidential material was delivered to the Judiciary Committee today, portions of the transcripts were obtained from House members, 
but they were, as St. Clair had said they would be, often unclear and ambiguous. That was the case, for example, with a March 21, 1973 discussion of demands of the original Watergate burglary defendants for payoffs to keep them silent about the involvement of others. At one point in that very critical conversation, according to the transcript, there was a discussion about payoff demands and the likelihood that they would later be followed by demands for executive clemency, both of which President Nixon rejected. But later, the transcript shows this exchange in a discussion of the demand of Watergate conspirator E. Howard Hunt that he be paid $120,000. The exchange goes like this, President Nixon saying, you have no choice but to come up with the $120,000 or whatever it is, right? John Dean III, then White House counsel, replied, that's right. The White House brief said flatly that the president rejected the payment of $120,000 or any other sum to Hunt or to any other Watergate defendants. But St. Clair noted today the transcript could, does contain ambiguities and statements which, taken out of context, could be construed to have a variety of meanings. In prefacing his narrative account of the president's statements and actions, St. Clair repeated the president's offer to have New Jersey Democrat Representative Peter Rodino, the Judiciary Committee's chairman, and Michigan Republican Representative Edward Hutchinson, the ranking Republican member of the panel, listen to the actual tape recordings, quote, to satisfy themselves that a full and complete disclosure of the pertinent contents of those tapes had indeed been made. The White House brief said unnecessary expletives, characterizations of third parties, and material not involving the president's conduct had been edited out of the transcripts, Deletions were indicated with parenthetical notes in the body of the transcripts. The transcri transcripts did bear out the president's prediction that they uh, would end the speculation about the Watergate issue, for example, on February 28th of 1973, during a discussion of a formation of a special Senate committee headed by Senator Sam Irvin to investigate Watergate. The president said, I frankly say that I would rather... They would be partisan rather than for them to have a facade of fairness and all the rest. Irvin always talks about this being a great, about his being a great constitutional lawyer. On September 15, 1972, the president, John Dean, and H.R. Haldeman discussed the fact that a general accounting office auditor was examining presidential campaign contribution records at the request of House Speaker Carl Albert. Haldeman, during that conversation, said, Maybe we better put a little heat on him. The him being Albert, the president responded, I think so too. Haldeman then said, we really ought to do, what we ought to do is to call the speaker and say, I regret that you cause us to do this to you. And the president responded, why don't you see if Harlow, he was referring to presidential aide Bryce Harlow, why don't you see if Harlow will tell him that. But the initial incomplete transcripts that became available on Capitol Hill proved, as the presidential lawyer St. Clair had predicted, very inconclusive on the primary issues of precisely when the president learned of various aspects of the Watergate scandal. The White House brief, constructed generally along chronological lines, notes that no one, not even Dean as the president's chief accuser, has alleged that the president had advanced knowledge of the wiretapping burglary at the Democratic Party headquarters on June 17th of 1972. It quotes the transcript of a Nixon conversation with Dean. This one was held on February 28th, 1973, in which the president said, quote, of course, I am not dumb and I will never forget what I, I will never forget when I heard about this forced entry and bugging, I thought, what is this? What is the matter with these people? Are they crazy? I thought they were nuts. Dean has testified that after a September 15, 1972 meeting with the president, he had, in his words, the impression that the president was well aware of what had been going on regarding the success of keeping the White House out of the Watergate scandal. And in Dean's words, I also had expressed to him my concern that I was not confident that the cover-up could be maintained indefinitely. The White House brief, submitted to the Congress today, said that the tape of that meeting does not support Dean's testimony that the president was aware of the cover-up of the Watergate involvement. It quotes the president as saying, Oh, well, this is a can of worms, as you know. A lot of this stuff that went on, and the people who work this way are awfully embarrassed. But the way you have handled all this seems to me has been very skillful in putting your fingers in the leaks that have sprung here and have sprung up there. St. Clair today explained to the president, in that sentence, 
Speaking about the politics of the matter, such as civil suits, countersuits, democratic efforts to exploit Watergate as a political issue and the like, he was not speaking in the context of any plot to obstruct justice. The reaction of the House Judiciary Committee to the president's actions of the past 24 hours is not yet known. This afternoon, Democrats and Republican members of that panel were caucusing separately, and tomorrow they'll get together and render their joint opinion. The president, I imagine, will be happy if he has succeeded only in rallying the Republican members of that panel into his corner. A partisan split within the, the impeachment in, inquiry would serve to discredit the inquiry to the point where the entire probe would have little, if any, public credibility. Today, some of the more ardent Nixon critics on the House panel, specifically Massachusetts Democrat Representative Drinan and California's Democrat Representative Waldy, stated that in their view, the president's response to the Judiciary Committee subpoena was totally unacceptable. They will take nothing more than the complete original tapes, not edited transcripts. They, in fact, will not even consider the president's suggestion that the full tapes be heard by Chairman Rodino and Representative Hutchinson. That will not be acceptable. They want the full tapes turned over to the full committee. At the very least, they want them heard in their entirety by the minority and majority councils of the committee. The majority view of the committee Democrats, then, we can expect to be a little less extreme than that. The Republican view, we can expect to be even more moderate. I'll add more for you now in just a moment. Service. We're big on that. When you buy an airline ticket, you're buying service. And at Ozark, we try to give you your money's worth. Service and making reservations. Planning your trip at the ticket counter. Service on board. Ozark didn't get where it is by being small and things that really count. Service. We're big on that. Go Ozark Jet to Champaign-Urbana, Peoria, and Springfield, Illinois. Call Ozark or your travel agent. What the president has done, in effect, has been to throw the ball back into the Judiciary Committee's court. His approach last night, I think, seemed fair and equitable from a public opinion point of view. And public opinion, as I have stressed before, is going to have a tremendous impact on the entire impeachment process. The president, it is true, did not turn over the complete tapes. To have done so, he felt, and I think properly so, would have established a precedent which may have permanently impaired the separation of powers in the part of the Constitution which sets up the three branches of government as being separate but equal. It would have also permanently endangered the right of privacy and independence of the executive branch of our government. The president, on the other hand, did not invoke executive privilege in its entirety, he seemed to be cooperative, very cooperative with the impeachment inquiry, and he seemed to be very cooperative with the public as a whole, making the heretofore secret transcripts of the Watergate tapes public material. From the Mutual Studios in Washington, I'm Fulton Lewis, and that's the top of the news as it looks from here. E.G. Marshall. Welcome to the world of terrifying imagination, to the fear you can hear. There is a green land called the Emerald Isle, where stardust dapples shining lakes that sparkle against blue mountains which fall away to winding bays. But there are darker sides to Ireland, currents that run deep, a wasting bitter civil war in the north, and everywhere Lurking behind the shamrock and beneath the laughter, a dark world of legend, of banshees and warlocks, of voices on the wind against which the traveler should stop his ears, or the sound of the death bell. Our mystery drama, The Death Bell, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Ian Martin and stars Michael Tolan. It is sponsored in part by Anheuser-Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser, and by the Kellogg Company, makers of Kellogg's Special K cereal. I'll be back shortly with Act One.
Hello, this is Goldilocks. It seems like only yesterday that I was a little girl tasting porridge. You know, this one's too hot. This one's too cold. And now I conduct taste tests on diet drinks. And there's one I must tell you about. Sugar-Free Diet 7-Up. It has a fresh, natural, delicious taste. It drives my taste meter crazy. Sugar-Free Diet 7-Up. <gasps> this one's just right. Computers, we're big on that. You deserve an airline that remembers your name. Ozark's computer helps us not to forget your name, reservation, connections, your return plans. At Ozark, a big and personal computer helps us deal more personally with you. Computers, we're big on that at Ozark Airlines. Now go Ozark's evening jet at 645 to Washington with through service to Champaign-Urbana and Peoria. Since time immemorial, man has sought to trace the future in the lines of the palm. The best answer always is, if you truly believe. As in spite of herself, it would appear that Sheila Doyle does. The moment I clapped eyes on Benny's cousin from the States, Brian Macken, there was a bogle tugging at my skirts. And the one look in his hand ran the blood in me cold, for I never saw a shadow plainer. Brian? Hmm? Oh, yeah, yes, Denny. Well, what are you doing over by the window? I'm trying to see where that bell came from. What bell? It's been ringing ever since you went up with Sheila, don't you... Well, that's funny. What? It stopped. You didn't hear it? Nope. Well, maybe you're just used to it. D don't you have some kind of a bell around here? Well, uh, the church? No, no, not a church bell. Something much smaller, like uh, on an animal, maybe. Well, there aren't any animals around. Oh. Well, maybe I'm just hearing things after that scare Sheila threw into Oh, me. look, Brian, I'm sorry about that. Sheila... Well, Sheila's as level-headed as they come about everything except some of the old country superstitions. <laughs> she wasn't kidding, you know. She really believes in a lot of this. Well, forget it, Denny. I'm not worried about me. I was only concerned about Sheila. She looked all shook up. Oh, she was embarrassed. I think she felt she'd made a fool of herself. <laughs> I don't think she'll be able to face you again tonight, but by morning, she'll cook you a breakfast that'll stick to your ribs. <laughs> you are going to stay, huh? Oh, I can take the car and run down to the local inn. No, right? sir. No, sir. Not on your life. My cousin comes all the way from the States. I don't let you get away till we do some catching up. Catching up? Yes. I want to hear all about your wife. My wife? Yes. Sheila and I are so sorry she didn't come along with you. She, uh... She wasn't feeling herself at the last moment. Yes, I know, so you said. You see, this isn't so much a trip. It's more a sort of pilgrimage. A what? I want to find Carrie Kleiner. I want to see it for myself. If it exists. What do you mean? Well, Brian, I always understood it was just a, a family legend. You mean to say you've been here in Ireland now for three years and you haven't tried to look it up? Man, it's near 250 miles from here and I haven't a car. Anyways, it wasn't my side of the family. Well, it was mine. Or should have been. At the very least, from my mother's side, you know that. Well, I honestly don't. All I know is that my mother used to ramble on when she got older about how there was royalty in the blood somewhere far back and the ancestors lived in a castle in the north. Carrig Kleiner. It was a castle. Uh -huh. The Carrigs were said to be in the direct line of descent from Brian Boru himself. And it was a family custom to name the residence for the family name and for the wife who reigned over it. My great-great-grandmother, Kleiner, was married to the last of the line, Lord Carrig. Your great-great-grandfather? That's one of the things I'd like to find out. See, I think he was. You think? Lord Carrig didn't. He killed Kleiner and threw the man he said was her lover from the balcony over the sea to be smashed to death on the rocks below. And he sent my great-grandfather to be brought up by his wife's family, the Mackins. Your great-grandfather? You mean Carrig's son? He refused to recognize him. Claimed he was illegitimate. Oh, I see, I see. Well, now, look. Looking for an old lost castle is as good a way as any of spending a vacation. You'll get a chance to see a good bit of Ireland on the way. Now, come on. Let's go get your bag out of the car and I'll show you to your room. Mm -hmm. 
for the first time in our marriage, I found myself getting a little annoyed with Sheila as I walked Brian to the car. There was that vague kind of family connection between us. You write off as cousins, but mostly what we were was old friends and classmates. Now, with Sheila's superstitions jogging my imagination, I was uh, uneasy with Brian. A feeling, thank the Lord, that a few minutes in the soft Irish night blew away. Oh, it's good to be alive on a night like this. Mm. It makes me think of... What, Brian? Commencement. The end of the term, anyway. (laughs) Or, Or after the last ball game of the season. Tired, but... Loose, you remember? Well, for pitchers, maybe. Catchers with old football knees took longer to unwind. <laughs> well, so, how's the old rat race? Advertising? Oh, it still goes round and round. Hamsters on a cage wheel. How's the writing? Slow, slow, but sure. And I make an honest buck cutting peat to keep myself in shape. You're a happy man. Oh, what more could I ask for? Wait till you see your namesake tomorrow. Little Brian. How soon will he be, too? About the time his little sister comes to join him. Six months or so. Oh, hey, you're having another? Yes. Well, that's... That's solid, man. It's solid. Well, you know I always like kids. Nothing like having your own, though. And how about you, senior citizen? <laughs> what does that mean? Well, you have been married longer than Sheila and me. When are you and Gloria going to have yours? As a matter of fact, Gloria got pregnant seven months ago. Oh, and you're trying to keep it secret. So that's why she didn't come along, huh? That's one of the reasons. Uh, But come on, I can't keep you away from your wife any longer. Here, just let me get my gear and we can hit the sack. Oh, there's no hurry, no hurry. For my money, we could sit up all night and shoot the breeze. Well, that'd suit me if I didn't have a, a long journey ahead of me tomorrow. Oh, I see. You're still determined to go chasing rainbows. I heard the door close when they left the house and had gone to the window to watch Denny and Brian talk at the car. I couldn't hear the words, but at least Brian's arm slung around Denny's shoulder eased my mind enough to make me go to bed. Still and all, even with the soothing sound of their voices rumbling below and their laughter, it was long before I fell into an uneasy sleep. Oh, I... Danny? Oh, I'm sorry. Shh, Sheila, shh. Darling, go to sleep. That's all right. I was half on to waking. Turn the light on. No need, no need. I'm all undressed. Just come into bed. And did you get Brian settled? Ah, yes. He, he's snoring already. By the time I closed up and looked in on little Brian, he was dead to the world. Darling, what's wrong? Hmm? You shivered. Oh, it was maybe a hair limped over my grave. Oh. Hold me. Hmm? Who needs to be asked? Sheila, you're wrong about Brian. What way? We've had a long talk, just like old times. I I never felt closer to him. Well, I know you've missed him since you came away here. We were always more like brothers than cousins. Well, I'm not saying he isn't tense and all wound up, but that's old stuff to me, Akushla. (laughs) You're making to be a real Irishman again. (laughs) Well, next to you because of you, and grateful I am. Are you for real, Danny? Don't you know? Oh, Sheila. I used to be all tied up in knots like Brian, and that's all it is, you see. Well, I hope you're right. You haven't heard the best news yet. What? Well, you're not the only one that's carrying a heart beneath your own. Gloria's expecting. Brian's wife? When? Before you. That's why she didn't come along this trip. Well, that's good news, Danny. I want to be happy for your friend, dear... Cousin, your your brother, almost. Well, so you can be, you can be. (sighs) Sheila. Hmm? What did you think you saw in Brian's palm? Don't ask me. First of all, because I have no words to tell you, and second, I'm praying to sweet Mary to forgive me, for I'm hoping it was himself who's only given me a warning not to meddle in the Lord's business. The night is quiet outside, except for the tinkle of that far-off bell. There's a kind of peace. I had to stop here with Denny, touch normal life, if only for a moment. I will not think back, and tomorrow must wait till I find it. I know what it will bring to so many people. I wonder what it will bring to me, Brian Mackin. 
The last thing I hear is the bell lulling me to sleep. Well, that does it. All set for the road. Oh, I wish you didn't have to go so soon. So do I. Will you stop by then to see us on your way back? I, I don't know if I'll be coming this way, Sheila. Oh, try. Try to make it. And, and, and Brian. Yes? The farther north you get, particularly beyond Sligo, hug the coastline all the way. Please, don't go near the border. Ulster, you mean? There's still a lot of trouble. I wish you'd forget the whole thing. Except I won't. Well, man, it's like looking for a needle in a haystack. And if there ever was a Cary Clayna, it's, it's probably nothing but ruins by now. If there ever was one. I'll find it. And I think I will. And if you should, what would it prove? I, I don't know. Goodbye, Brian. Come again. I'll try. Bye, Denny, old pal. I'll only say au revoir. And it's glad I am to have met you and... And forgive me for last night. The gypsy's warning? I don't know what came over me. <laughs> think nothing of it. Well, so long, shaman. Drive carefully. I hope you had a good night's sleep. With the good company and the good air? What else? Even the little bell I found I got used to. And off I went like a log. <laughs> so here goes. Hail and farewell. What was that about a bell, Denny? Oh, search me, Mavourneen. When I came downstairs last night after I took you up to bed, Brian was by the window. He insisted he could hear a little bell ringing somewhere, but <laughs> I couldn't hear it. What kind of a bell was that? Like it was on an animal, he said. Not like a cow, but more, say, like, uh, like a goat. The Lord and all his saints be praised. Not goat. What is it, she? We should call him back. He should get out of Ireland. Well, what are you getting all riled up about now, I honey? I told you he was holding the shadow of death in his palm. Now I know I made no mistake. There's no bell in this town he could have heard, like you said. Except one. What? What? The one that's only heard by him it sounds for. And I know it for sure. Twas the death bell. Is Brian Mackin really marked for death? And if so, how soon? And how? We will return shortly with Act Two. Some beer drinkers have funny ideas about beer. They think beer improves with age, like wine. Well, find a brewmaster, though. You'll find a beer drinker who knows better. The Budweiser brewmaster says it all depends on how beer is aged. Just letting beer sit in lagering tanks makes it older, not necessarily better. That even goes for keeping a case around the house for a couple of months. But there is one kind of aging that's good for beer, the Budweiser kind, beechwood aging. In this kind of aging, something happens. It lets all the flavor of the choicest hops and best barley malt that go into Budweiser get through to you. Sure, it takes more time and trouble to brew Budweiser that way, but brewing beer right does make a difference. Anheuser-Busch, St. Louis. Hey, ma'am, what's for dinner? Hey, ma'am, what you got? It's time to get ready for the great outdoors, and your ShopRite supermarket has everything you'll need for cookout dinners and fun in the sun. And for this week's dinners, ShopRite is featuring whole grade-A frying chickens, just 37 cents a pound. Roasting chickens, up to 4 pounds, 47 cents a pound. Choice beef rib steaks, $1.19 a pound. ShopRite Franks, just 89 cents a pound. Get all your outdoor cooking equipment and many great food values at your ShopRite supermarket this week. She loves the family. She wants the best. She does all that she can do. She lets ShopRite do the rest. Hey, Ma, what's for dinner? ShopRite has the answer. Two hundred and fifty miles is a short day's drive, as we reckon it, in the good old U.S. of A. But through the length of Ireland, stopping more and more in the last fifty miles to ask the still unanswered question, do you know of a castle in these parts called Carriclena? It's a long, long trip that at last has brought Brian Mackin to a little bridge across a valley stream. Stopping there to eat the lunch Sheila put up for him before he left, 
He has scarcely finished it as twilight falls. Then, as he dozes for a moment, back against a tree... Uh, what? Pull him up! Pull him up! I can't! Throw him! Hold on! Hold on! Don't get thrown! Oh, boy! Oh, easy! Easy! Hold up there! Hold there! Hold there! Hold up! All right. Easy, boy. Easy. All right. All right. Are you... You all right, ma'am? Yes. And I'm much beholden to you, sir. Oh, it's my pleasure. What what happened? Well, something frightened my horse. I I lost control. May I have the reins, sir? All right, now, stay, boy, stay. There, here you are. Oh, thank you, Mr. Uh... Brian Mackin. How do you do? I am the Lady Clayna Carrick. What? I said I'm Lady Carrick. Of Carrick Clayna? Well, naturally. <laughs> then it does exist. I should hope so. I was just on my way home. Where, where is it? Just across the bridge and over the hill. Oh, now that I've regained my composure. On my soul, you do look familiar. I didn't catch your name. Brian. Brian Mackin. Oh, no. No. You must be mad to try to intercept me here. Run, Brian. Run for your life. Wait a minute. Wait a minute, my lady. If you value your life, stay away from me. I am frozen at her sudden flight. Then suddenly I find myself running after her, laboring for breath over the last burst to the crest of the hill. Oh, oh, damn the light going. But but where? Where? She she couldn't have just disappeared into, into thin air. But she had. In the lowering darkness, I can see the long sweep of the countryside down to the rocks and sea cliffs, And there's no sign of horse or rider, or of any destination they might be bound for, nor any road for a horse to follow, much less my modern car. For the moment, I realize I must return to my car and seek some lodging for the night. Danny, is that you? Well, who else were you expecting, Sheila? Oh, darling, I'm that glad to see you. Uh Ah, It's late, you are. Oh, we cut a few extra squares tonight as long as the light was with us. Here, here, what is it, little bird? You're all a flutter. It's Brian's on my mind. Oh, you'll laugh at me again, I suppose. But as I was laying our little one down with the sun just gone over the hill, I thought I heard him calling, Clayna, Clayna. Oh, now, Sheila, I... (laughs) What's got into you? I wish I knew... I only know somehow we should never have let Brian go off for the north. Something terrible is going to happen to him. And if there is, what could we do to stop it? Well, we should try. Would you have me follow him on Shank's mare? How fast do you think I could walk it? Well, you could borrow the McFadden's car or Seamus' motorcycle. And if I did, where would I head for? Oh, don't fault me, darling, or make me the fool. It's just a feeling comes over me and I can't help it. I'm... I want to be wrong. I hope I'm wrong. Sheila, now, please, please, stop worrying about Brian. If anyone ever knew how to take care of himself, that's the guy. I said it with authority because I meant it, or I thought I meant it. Or I tried to mean it because I wanted to reassure Sheila. The truth is, I was shaken again. I'd been three years living in Ireland, long enough to fall under all of her spells, even the black ones. And I'd have given anything to know where Brian was at at that moment. And what he was doing. Excuse me, gentlemen. Sorry. Closing time is posted. I wasn't... I wasn't looking for a drink as much as I was for accommodations tonight. Well, now... As to that... I'm willing to pay well for it. An American, is it? Well, for that much, I suppose we could be after finding your room and a bite to soup. And perhaps a little information? We're not for doing much talking around these parts, in particular to strangers. What would you want to know? Well, something very simple, I hope. Would either of you know where I could find a place called Carrie Kleiner? Carrie Kleiner? Please, no. What would be after bringing it to these parts looking for the likes of Carrie Cleaner? Well, till late this afternoon, only a dim hope of finding it after all these years. For private reasons. Oh, and what would the private reasons be? Family ones. 
My great-grandfather was born there. Who was he now? And what was it that late this afternoon gave you the good hope of finding Carrie Cleaner? I ran into someone who lives there. Who lives there? Patty. Will you hold your tongue, Mick? And uh, who would you have met that said they was from the castle? A very beautiful woman. A girl, actually, who said she was the Lady Cleaner Carrie. Oh, the Lord and his saints preserve us. The Lady Cleaner? Uh, where was this then? For about five miles or so north of here. There's a road goes winding down to a little bridge and then goes up a rise on the other side, but sort of, sort of peters out. Ah, oh, that's the old Bali Brig across the Scalinor. Did you drive your car across that bridge? No, I stopped this side of it because the going was getting so rough. Sure, it's lucky you didn't drive on it. It might have carried away with you. That bridge has been condemned for anything but foot travel as long as I can remember. But why? Because it doesn't lead to anywhere anymore. It leads to carry Kleiner somehow. How would you know that? Because the lady was bound for there on her horse. Ah, was it a big bay mare with a mane as white as snow? Yes, that, that's the one. And the woman? How was she dressed? Why, she, uh... She was in sort of a green velvet dress with a big hat. Like an old-fashioned riding habit, you'd say. Oh, Mary bless us. And the good Lord save us all. Old-fashioned it is for sure. Well, the Lady Cleaner has been dead these hundred years and more. No, no, this this was a young woman. She was only past her 21st year when she died. That was no real woman you saw this afternoon, stranger. That was her ghost. But I talked to her. Did you now, then? What you saw was never real. And you can take that as gospel. Well, perhaps. I, I hadn't eaten all day, and I did take a nap under a tree. Mm, and was twilight, when all fancies begin. We'll let it go at that, anyway. But, Carrie Cleaner, is that just fancy, too? Well, no, as to that... Must you but... always put your oar in, Mick? I'm talking to the gentleman here, Mr... Uh... Mackin. Brian Mackin. That is a good Irish name. I mentioned that my family came from Ireland. Mm, so you did. And at least you've had the sense God gave you to come back. I'm Paddy Flynn, and the little runt here is Mickey Mahan. Uh, the top of the evening to you. Is it back you are to stay, Mr. Markin? That depends on what I find at Carrie Cleaner. Uh, it's little you'll find there. Deserted and empty and blown by the winds for a century. It's not but a ruin. Not worth the effort to go by it. And sometimes at nightfall, there's a woman's voice that'll call, Come away! Come away! And it'll betide the man who listens. Well, just the same, I want to see Carrie Cleaner. Can you guide me there? Not by night. I wouldn't stir out by night for all the gold in a leprechaun's hoard. Maybe tomorrow. We'll see. Yeah, it's time we were all to bed. Come. I'll show you your room, Mr. Mackin. He's from the police. I don't think so, but I'm taking the chances. Sure, and what are you doing there? I'm making Mr. Mackin a little nightcap as he requested. Only it will be a little stronger than he expected. Ah, uh, how is that, Paddy? Sure, I'm giving him a little extra dividend. Uh, your namesake, as you might say. But who will that be at all? Mickey... Pin. Oh, I never heard tell of him. Well, now, that's because he emigrated to Chicago, USA, long before your time and mine. Uh, but he gave his name to what's in this little bottle here. Well, it looks like no more than bog water. Uh, it'll make you sleep a deal sounder. Now then, you'll take this drink up to him whilst I go arrange for the truck. It is a good thing we have a full moon to work with this night. To work? Isn't it obvious the guns are no longer safe at Carrie Cleaner? We'll have to have them up and away over the border by morning before our American gets to nosing about. Wish we're not going by the castle by the dead of night. How else? But she'll be walking again by the full moon. You heard Mr. Mackin saw her abroad in scarce before dark. What kind of soldier are you, Mick, that starts at shadows? Now, let's have no more nonsense out of you. And away up with a drink to Mr. Mackin. I look at my watch. It's just after midnight. The nightcap is untasted on the table beside my bed. I don't trust it. I don't trust a lot of things. But where to get rid of it? 
A vagrant memory drifts across my mind of jokes among old country people. A quick look under the bed, and there is the receptacle. It's a matter of a moment to empty the glass in it. And none too soon, I can hear stealthy footsteps approaching. Don't use the Kashmik unless there's trouble. If there is, I'll put him to sleep myself. Mr. Mackin? Mr. Mackin? I think he's away. Follow me. Ah, he's dead to the world. We'll check that out. He's drunk it. Will it keep him quiet long enough? Well, eight to ten hours. And even when he wakes, he'll not want to leave his bed. Now come away, man. We've much to do. Lying on my bed, snoring, pretending to be asleep, I have listened to everything. But the fall of that heavy lock tells me once and for all, I am a prisoner. But as I wait for them to leave the house, I know that nothing will keep me from Carrie Kleiner. I have an appointment there that's been waiting a hundred years. And even now, in the still of the night, I can hear the far-off tinkle of that bell and a voice crying. Turn shortly with Act Three. I stand by the window, carefully on the side where the moonlight cannot cast my shadow, and watch the courtyard of the inn below. A small truck, like a weapons carrier, is there, and Patty and Mick climb into it. In a moment, it has gone to a destination I can only guess. By the time I am out the window, clambering to the courtyard and into my car, there is no hope of following. Particularly when I find my distributor cap gone and my car useless. It's a long, agonizing walk for five miles, even on a moonlit night. And by the time I have crossed the bridge and climbed to the ridge above, I am at the ragged edge of exhaustion. But there is a reward... Far below, against the restless sea, there are pinpoints of light that move. I am near the end of my pilgrimage, and the bell is sounding again. Danny. Danny. Uh, uh, what, what is it, Sheila? The phone. It's ringing. Well, what time is it? It's half past three in the morning. Well, who could be calling us I now? I don't know. I have been lying here awake, afraid that something was about to happen. Will you go down now and answer it, or shall I? All right, all right. I'm on my way, but who? It's Brian, or something about him. And whatever it is, no bell that rings in the night brings anything but ill luck. Is that the last of them? Not by a long shot. And damn the moon... It's off away behind the clouds again. I wish I was off away with it. What's the matter, Mick? Are you afraid a banshee will howl you off to your grave? Well, there's little I like at all about this night. We're all stretching our necks across the gibbet one way or the other. Well, the sooner we deliver these guns over the border, the safer we'll be. I wish now I'd stood away with a ship that delivered them three days ago. And I'd be out of this in the way home. Well, you didn't. So let's have at it and get them away from the storehouse before... Wait a minute. Ah, what is it? By the ridge there. The silhouette of a man. Let's get the truck away and hidden around to the seaward side. Hey, you take it. Give me that cush of yours, and I'll handle whatever comes this way. Uh, yes, Sergeant, he was. Well, he left this morning, I mean yesterday morning, about nine... All I know is he was headed somewhere north of Sligo, Galway Bay area. Yes, he was looking for a place named Carrig Clayner. No, 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 not at all. And please, he's a, he's a cousin of mine and a, and, and a very good friend. You will keep us notified and let us know what's happening. Yes, I'd appreciate that. Thank you. What is it, Danny? Oh, 
What are you doing out of bed, Sheila? Who was on the phone? You said Sergeant. It was Liam Flaherty of the police. Oh, Sheila, it's all hell to pay. Tell me. There was a tracer from the States. They called the local here to get in touch with us. Why? The police in America. They're trying to get in touch with Brian. What has Brian done? That isn't the point. It's what's been done to him. What? Brace yourself, my darling. Somebody murdered his wife. A moment ago, on my way down the hill, I could see Carrie Clayna full in the moon. What do they mean it's a ruin? It was just as I pictured it. Turrets, mullioned windows with diamond-shaped glass panes, great oak doors, and ivied granite. Now with the moon hidden, its silhouette looms over me, reaching out to me as I come home at... <coughs> oh, oh. oh, cool, you didn't have to hit him so hard. I wasn't taking any chances with Mr. Mackin this time. Ah, is that who it is? Say for yourself, how do you get over the drink and away and here? No time to worry about that now. You think he is Paul Heath or maybe the British? Whatever he is, we'll decide that later. Let's get the guns off and away first. I'm standing in front of the great door of Kelly Kleiner, and I know that everything's going to come clear at long last. I reach out and pull the bell. Even the bell is familiar, although I cannot quite place where I've heard it before. And now, the door is opening. Good evening, Brian. We've been waiting for you. Good evening, Your Lordship. I'm sorry I'm late. No matter. We've but just finished dinner. And her ladyship is with, uh, the child. Will you join me in a glass of mulled wine? At your pleasure. I've not seen you for some time, and, uh... Ah, the devil. I've forgotten. I must catch my sea captain before he leaves. To send some packets. Will you forgive me? I should not be over two hours or so... Uh, may I hope you will attend, my lady, in my absence? I should be happy to, except... Would you not rather I transmit the packages for you on my way home? No. I must have certain words with the shipmaster that I alone can bring. Besides, I would not deprive Clayner of some outside companionship. We're so isolated here, it would be cruel to deny her a new face to brighten her solitude. The hour is late. Perhaps it would be better... No, no, I won't hear of it. You shall be our guest for the night, and I shall be back post-haste. I'll try to make it in as close to two hours as possible. Meanwhile, make yourself completely at home. I am in a dream, I suppose. For by my host's clothes, the speech, a calendar I find on the wall, I am back in the past over a hundred years. But more important, I am within the walls of Carrie Clayner. And the riddle of my whole life, I feel, is near to being solved. When Lord Carrick leaves, I am too impatient to wait for my answers. So I climb the great staircase to Clayna's bedroom and knock on the door. Who is it? Brian. A moment. What are you doing here? I grew tired of waiting for you to come down. My husband, he's... Lord Carrick has ridden to town. It will be two hours before he returns. May I come in? I shouldn't let you. It's too late. I, I thought you'd left for good two years ago. When I lost you to him, I meant to. But for a while, I stayed hiding in the fen. Oh, I know you were seen. Do you know what you've done to me? And why do you come back now? I wanted to see the boy. By what right? He... Is he mine, Kleiner? I have to know. Is he mine? No. You called him by my name. It was a foolish choice. Why? Because I loved you. And now? Oh, Brian. The years have come and gone. Lord Carrick is my husband and the father of my child. And I have a whole new life I've learned to accept. I still want to know if the child is mine. Let me go. When you answer me. How could he be yours? He, he was born ten months after I married Lord Carrick. Then why does everyone whisper he's mine? Because you didn't leave as you promised. Why didn't you take yourself right out of my life? But there was nothing between us after your marriage. We know that, but no one else believes it. They still think the child is mine. Even Lord Carrick? I can't imagine why he could have welcomed you here tonight. I can't tell you how he... Wait a minute. What is it? Hush. 
dear God, he's here. You'll kill me. Over my dead body. And here it is. The moment I've reached back through a century for. The one I want to change. It's today I want to bring back. And Gloria and my own child that I killed in one moment of anger and hate as Lord Carrick plans to do with me and Clayna now. I have only one chance of bringing Gloria back. To change history. Or at least to set it right. He's coming up the outside balcony stairs. Through the French windows. Run, Brian, he'll kill me if he finds you here. I'll kill him first for doubting you. Oh, in heaven's name, no! Lord Carrick... So once again you try to steal my wife. Put up your dagger. I am unarmed. So much the better. You first, and then my wife. This time not so easily. I'm not the hunted, but the hunter. Look to yourself! He stands with his dagger half raised, frozen with inaction as I hurtle myself towards him, hands raised to shield and grapple and destroy him. But what I reach for is nothing but a shade. My outstretched hands grasp only air, and my hurtling body passing through his spectral waist crashes full tilt against the crumbling battlement, which gives way like powder. And of a sudden, just like the lover in the ancient legend, I am plummeting like today's skydiver towards the rocks below. And in this awful moment, I know that I was just as wrong about my wife Gloria as Lord Carrig was a hundred years ago about Plena. Small comfort now to know that I am legitimate as the rocks below rush up towards me like an express train and I am no more. Are you ready, Sheila? In a moment. What is it, darling? That bell. I don't know if I ever want to hear a bell in my life again. That's only the church bell. We didn't ever hear the other one. What happened to him, Denny? Oh, I'd have to be God to answer that. He snapped. The way a lot of us do when life spins us around too fast and curdles our brains. Why do you think I ran away from it all and... and came here to find peace? Brian really killed Gloria. He'd had a nervous breakdown two months ago. He escaped from the sanitarium... His obsession about paternity had put him there, and Gloria was asking for a divorce. He lost his head. She lost her life. But how did he think he could escape by coming here? I don't think he was looking for escape, but... Oh, I know it's such a writer's word, but... Expiation. Are you saying, then, he was after taking his own life? We'll never know, Sheila. The police say there's some evidence that the IRA were using Carrie Kleiner as a depot for smuggled arms from the sea. Maybe he stumbled on them. The local folk would tell you that anyone in that haunted castle after dark, especially when the moon was full, was risking God knows what. And someone I know very dearly sensed he was marked by fate for death. Oh, don't. I wouldn't wish that on anyone. Perhaps for Brian Mackin, was the only way. Let's us go give him a decent burial and wish him peace at last. tale. A tortured man who borrowed a century-old sorrow and carried it on his back like the old man of the sea. Small wonder he broke eventually under the senseless strain and ran amok. A man to be censured, but also to be pitied. A man for whom the death bell sounded. Let his epitaph be John Dunn's, lest you stop to criticize too harshly. Ask not for whom the bell tolls, it tolls for thee. I'll be back shortly. Oh, sure. You can talk about good-tasting diet drinks, but I know. I'm Goldilocks, and here at my taste-testing laboratory, I taste-test them all. And nobody's been drinking my diet drinks until I tested sugar-free Diet 7-Up. And then, kabloomy! Every bear wanted some. Diet 7-Up is fresh, natural, delicious. Sugar-free Diet 7-Up. This one's just right. 
North Jersey is certainly getting a higher yield this spring, especially with Suburban Savings Special High Yield Savings Certificate that you can raise for fun and profit. All you have to do is plant a modest $2,500 minimum in Suburban Limited Issue 7.50% Savings Certificate. Then put your certificate in a nice safe place. Suburban takes care of the rest by compounding interest continuously from day of deposit paid quarterly. You'll get a nice healthy 7.90% effective annual yield on your 7.50 saving certificate when you let it grow from 4 to 10 years. Early withdrawal prior to maturity is, of course, subject to a substantial penalty. So for a nice healthy 7.90% annual effective yield, grow Suburban's 7.50% saving certificate for fun and profit at any Suburban Savings Office. In Bayonne, Edgewater, Helmut Park, Emerson, Hackettstown, Morris Plains, Nutley, Paramus, and Sparta. Our cast included Michael Tolan, Marion Seldes, William Redfield, and Guy Sorrell. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by New Sugar-Free Diet 7-Up. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. Theater program was furnished by the CBS Radio Network. This is Mary Helen McPhillips. Growing old may not be fun, but the only choice is to die, so hopefully most of us will grow old. And how to do it well is what we'll be talking about at 10.15 tomorrow morning on the Martha Dean program. Morton Puner, a member of the Gerontological Society, will tell us what we know about growing old. I hope you'll join me tomorrow morning at 10.15. I'm Fulton Lewis in the Mutual Broadcasting System Studios in Washington, D.C. Now, my commentary. President Nixon's Watergate lawyer said today that he's going to move to quash a Watergate prosecution subpoena for 64 more White House tapes. He would not say whether the president will abide by any adverse Supreme Court decision should that tape battle come to that. Facing a deadline of Thursday for responding to the subpoena from Special Prosecutor Leon Jaworski, the president's defense attorney, James St. Clair, held a broad-ranging news conference here in Washington today, a news conference in which he discussed the president's reasons for making public more than 1,200 pages of edited transcripts of the Watergate tapes. He also disclosed that the House Judiciary Committee is seeking more than 140 additional tapes for its impeachment inquiry. Discussing Jaworski's subpoena, St. Clair argued today that the massive public release of transcripts by the president yesterday strengthens his effort to have the subpoena quashed. He said he will move now on two grounds. First, in his words, especially now, clearly the prosecution must have enough evidence to proceed to try these cases. And knowing Mr. Jaworski, I am confident that he wouldn't have indicted these people if he didn't think he had enough evidence to convict them. Secondly, Acknowledging that the White House has a duty to make available materials that would be helpful to the defendants, St. Clair today said, everything we know of is in that book of transcripts. Everything is there. He also contended that there was a significant difference between the Jaworski subpoena and the one issued last year in the name of former Special Prosecutor Archibald Cox. He said the Cox subpoena, which led directly to the explosive firing of Cox, was on behalf of a federal grand jury, and the two court decisions that went against the president in that case were based on the proposition that the grand jury has sort of unique requirements. The Jaworski subpoena, on the other hand, St. Clair noted today, is aimed at providing materials for use in court trials rather than in grand jury deliberations. Asked whether the president would abide by an adverse Supreme Court decision should the Jaworski subpoena lead to a court fight and eventually reach the Supreme Court, St. Clair today said, quote, I wouldn't want to comment one way or the other because I have not discussed it with the president and I would not want to presume on his decision. In any case, he said, 
I don't believe that we will come to that. St. Clair also was asked to outline the strategic or tactical advantages that the president hoped to reap by making public the massive array of edited transcripts. He cited the following as the basic consideration, and I quote, People were getting more and more imbued with the idea that the president had something to hide to the extent that it endangered the presidency. The facts ought to be known, and then let's argue about them. The president's Watergate attorney, James St. Clair, today volunteered that the staff of the Judiciary Committee is seeking tapes of 141, 142, maybe, uh, those additional presidential conversations. He said he hoped the committee would take a second look at that request in light of Tuesday's disclosures and decide not to press it. Since most of these tapes are understood to deal with the controversies involving milk producers and the ITT, St. Clair was asked if he meant to suggest that the committees should forget those two issues. He said, based on what I know about it, the answer is yes. St. Clair made it apparent, however, that he is not opposed to providing additional materials relating to political contributions by the milk producers and the administration's controversial decision to raise milk price supports. He was asked if he felt that yesterday's disclosures might prejudice the cases of Watergate defendants that are still facing trial. St. Clair said, I do not think so. But as far as the conduct of the case is concerned, that is the first responsibility of the special prosecutor. Reminded that at one point in the bulky volume of transcripts, the president suggested to John Dean, who was then his private counsel, that witnesses in the Watergate proceedings might have conveniently faulty memories while under oath, St. Clair today said, as the president said, there are unfortunate remarks in there. Urging that the transcripts be looked at as a whole, he said the danger of this is to pick out a phrase here or a sentence there. The president's attorney also was asked if he thought it had been appropriate for the president to discuss at length payment of hush money to some Watergate defendants, as one transcript shows. St. Clair today responded, I'm sure if he had to do it all over again, he wouldn't have done that. The president is looking to the American people for vindication and vindication in the Watergate issue, while House impeachment investigators meet tonight to decide their next move in the quest for White House evidence. A majority of the House Judiciary Committee evidently was dissatisfied with the edited White House transcripts that the president delivered yesterday in lieu of tapes of those 42 presidential conversations that the committee had originally subpoenaed. The panel's Democratic majority planned to stop short of any formal demand for enforcement of the subpoena in favor of seeking bipartisan support for a simple statement declaring that the president had failed to comply with the subpoena. It was clear from the time that the president disclosed his transcript plan on Monday night that the support he sought was far beyond Capitol Hill, that his eventual goal was to try to persuade the American people that he did have no advanced knowledge of the Watergate break-in, that he had no knowledge of the cover-up of the Watergate issue, and that he was providing investigators with a full story of his role. For all of the 1,308 pages of presidential transcripts, there are nonetheless many uncertainties about just what the president did or did not know and when he knew it and what he intended to be done. It was, as the president's lawyers and the president himself had said, a document that is marked by ambiguities. One White House covering statement that was delivered with the transcripts declared, in all of the thousands of words spoken, even though they often are unclear and ambiguous, not once does it appear that the President of the United States was engaged in a criminal plot to obstruct justice. Those words also created a picture of a president feeling increasingly embattled and frustrated by a scandal, the disclosure of which he considered inevitable, but which he hoped to control, possibly even avoid. And they showed the president considerably, uh, considering many alternatives, many different options, including at one point the payment of some hush money to the original Watergate conspirators. The transcripts covered conversations between September 15th of 1972 and April 27th of 1973. There were a few critical meetings, though. There was one on September 15th of 1972. That was the day that the indictments were returned in the Watergate break-in case. On that day, the president met with White House counsel John Dean, who was later to become the president's chief accuser before the Senate Watergate Committee. There was another meeting on March 17th, 1973. That's the day that the president learned that members of the White House Plumbers Unit, set up to trace leaks of classified information, had engineered the break-in at the office of Daniel Ellsberg's psychiatrist. There was a meeting just four days later, March 21st of 1973, 
That was the day the president said that John Dean first told him about the Watergate cover-up. Numerous alternatives, including meeting demands for hush money, were considered by the president, by John Dean, and by White House age, aides H.R. Haldeman and John Ehrlichman. Less than a month later, April 14, 1973, there was a meeting. That was the day of a rambling discussion of Watergate by the president, Haldeman and Ehrlichman, during which they talked about the need to fire John Dean and the equally important need to convince former Attorney General John Mitchell to appear before the prosecutor and a grand jury. There were also a series of meetings in mid to late April 1973, during which the president learned more and more of the extent of the cover-up and the various progresses that were being made in the Watergate investigation. Those sessions climaxed with decisions to finally accept the resignations of Attorney General Richard Kleindienst, Haldeman, and Ehrlichman, and, of course, also the decision to fire John Dean. After voting to revise oil taxes, the House Ways and Means Committee is turning to general tax reform, but a personal income tax cut does not seem to be on the panel's present agenda for possible action. The committee was at work again today on a sweeping series of items, ranging from cutting Social Security taxes to reviewing tax shelters and tax treatment of capital gains, and from tax provisions for single people and married, married couples to tax simplification involving itemized deductions. Tax staff experts told newsmen following a closed-door committee meeting yesterday that the panel plans to consider this material in the next 60 days and may have to admit some of these items from the list but hopes to cover as many of these as possible. Missing from the listing of more than 25 topics, though, was a general personal income tax cut along the lines of a $5.9 billion measure that has been suggested by some members of the Senate. In the Senate, that body voted today to let states decide whether a motorist, motorist could buy group health insurance to cover accidental injuries. The action came as the Senate neared a final vote on no-fault automobile insurance, which would compensate accident victims without regard to who caused the accident. San Francisco Mayor Joseph Alioto announced today that police in his city have arrested seven black men in the so-called Zebra Street killings carried out by a black group, which in Alioto's words was dedicated to the murder and mutilation of whites and dissident blacks. He told a news conference, the police have pierced the veil of a vicious ring of murderers called the Death Angels. The Death Angels is kind of a re reverse Ku Klux Klan. Twelve whites have been killed, six others wounded in San Francisco in very random, very unprovoked attacks over the past six months. From the Mutual Broadcasting System Studios in Washington, I'm Fulton Lewis, and that's the top of the news as it looks from here. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. Welcome to the terrifying world of your imagination. Vampire. Perhaps in the safety of your home, the word means little to you. Oh, you've heard of vampires, of course. But do you believe that they exist? Not you. Well, all I can say is, Minna Harker didn't believe either. Our mystery drama, Dracula was specially adapted from the story by Bram Stoker for the Mystery Theater by George Lothar and stars Mercedes McCambridge. It is sponsored in part by new sugar-free diet 7-Up and by the Kellogg Company, makers of Kellogg's Special K cereal. I'll be back shortly with Act One. And now, another story of the ball and chain as Kellogg's Special K presents The Library. Welcome to the public library. May I help you, sir? Uh, yes, I'd like to check out... Shh. Uh, I'd like to check out Famous Laundromats of the World by Audrey Schnorbart. Sir, excuse me, but isn't that ball and chain you're wearing just like the ones they use in the Kellogg Special K commercial? Uh, this ball and chain? Shh. Yes, that one. How are you going to get rid of it? Well, you know, lots of good exercises. And by eating smart at every meal, starting with the Special K breakfast. Don't you have to watch your calories? Yes, and the Special K breakfast is less than 240 calories. Less than 240 calories? 
Right. A one-ounce bowl of high-protein Special K, four ounces of skim milk, tomato juice, and coffee. It's really tasty, and it's going to help me get rid of this ball and shake. I'd say it's <laughs> long overdue, get it? <laughs> Your happy ending could begin with the Special K breakfast from Kellogg's. There's a very special deal going on at all offices of Suburban Savings throughout North Jersey. It's called Suburban Special Interest Deal, and you'll be especially interested in the savings you get. A top 7.90% effective annual yield on Suburban Limited's issue 750 savings certificate. And Suburban guarantees it for from 4 to 10 years. Minimum deposit, $2,500. Early withdrawal prior to maturity is subject to a substantial penalty. Suburban compounds interest continuously from day of deposit, paid quarterly. So you not only get interest on your savings, you get interest on the interest. And Suburban offers you the highest interest rate allowed by law. Here's your chance to get a great savings. A top 7.90% effective annual yield on Suburban's limited issue 7.50% savings certificate. Why not deal yourself into Suburban Savings Special Interest Deal in Bayonne, Edgewater, Elmwood Park, Emerson, Hackettstown, Morris Plains, Nutley, Paramus, and Sparta? in its purest form, lies ahead for us. I would be remiss if I didn't warn you that if your nerves are not strong, it might be better for you not to listen. No, really now. Be warned. Because as Minna Harker tells us in the diary she kept, there awaits you... An experience so loathsome, so horrifying, that I can hardly bring myself to write of it. If I'd known what lay ahead for me when I went to visit my dearest and closest friend, Lucy Westenra, at Hillingham, I could not have brought myself to go, much as I loved her. Looking back now, I realize I had plenty of warning, but I paid no attention. For example, as I drove to the Westenra estate through that lonely, isolated country and heard the wolves howling in the distance, it occurred to me that it was strange to hear wolves in this part of the country. As strange as the huge bat that flew alongside my car. I mentioned this to John, Dr. John Seward, Lucy's fiancé, as we sat having a drink in the living room. It's strange, Minna. I've, I've seen that bat myself. The thing must have a wing spread of at least four feet. I haven't the faintest idea where it came from, or the wolves either. Even Lucy's letters seemed kind of strange to me, John. What is the matter with her? Oh, I don't know. I'm completely baffled. I've had two other doctors look at her colleagues of mine, and they can't figure it out. I'm desperate, Minna. I'm so desperate, I've called in my old friend and teacher, Professor Van Helsing. Van Helsing? Yes, he's one of the finest diagnosticians in the world, John. Yes, he'll be here from Amsterdam in a day or two. Amsterdam, Holland? Yeah. All the way from Amsterdam. Oh, John, you must be desperate. Look, Lucy is dying, Minna. I'll do anything I can to save her. We we must find a way to stop her from losing blood. Losing blood? Well, it's this constant loss of blood that's killing her. Transfusions help for a time, but only a short time, and each transfusion is less effective. John... When can I see her? Oh, she's sleeping now. Her mother's with her, watching her. We take turns. As soon as Mrs. Westenra lets us know she's awake... Oh, listen. Those wolves, they're at it again. John, hasn't anyone looked into this wolf thing? How they suddenly come to be in this part of the country? Well, according to the paper, the town police have looked into it. Well, that's peculiar, too. What? Well, they haven't been able to spot one single wolf. Oh, <laughs> Uh, excuse me, we have a visitor. Oh, uh, come in, Count, come in. Thank you, Doctor. I'm on my way to town. I have a dinner engagement, and I thought I would stop to ask after Miss Westenra. Oh, she's no better, I'm afraid. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Uh, can you stay for a drink? Well, I... I'd like you to meet a friend of Lucy's who'll be staying with us for a while. Oh, in that case, of course... Uh, Minna, this is Count Dracula, our new neighbor. Count Miss Minna Harker. How do you do? How do you do? Count Dracula? Yes, but do not hold it against me, Miss Harker. I cannot help being of the blood royal. Well, you, why uh... don't you two get acquainted while I go up and see if Lucy's awake yet? I shall do my best to entertain this charming young lady. I won't be a minute. You're a long way from home, Count. A very long way, Miss Harker. 
Is it, may I ask what brought you here? In business? Business? Good heavens, what kind of business could you have in this part of the country? I mean, it's so isolated. <laughs> True, it does present difficulties, but uh, I like living in the country. Oh, you must. Oh, forgive me, I'm forgetting my manners. Would you like a drink? Uh, thank you. A scotch or bourbon? Is there perhaps some wine? Red wine. Now, let me see. I'm not very familiar with the supply here. It's... Ah, here we are. Here's a bottle of burgundy. Ah, that glass of that will be... Oh. Miss Harker, what's wrong? I, I... Uh... What is it? Uh, it's the bottle, I'm afraid. Afraid it slipped. It slipped. That's all. Oh, my. I'm afraid I cut my hand. <gasps> Uh, no, no, don't, can't, don't be upset. It's only a slight no, cramp, see? No. Uh, Lucy's awake and we can... Can't, what's wrong? <laughs> Minna, oh, I, your hand. I must leave at once, Doctor. Sorry, I cannot stay. Something I just remembered. No, 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 it's all right. I will see myself now. Oh. What in the world? But can't... Minna, what happened? Minna? I dropped the bottle of wine and cut my hand. Yes, I, I, I see you did, but... I uh... dropped the bottle because... Because I couldn't see him in the mirror. Couldn't see? Who, what mirror? This mirror over the table. It reflects the whole room. Well, of course it does, but... John, John, I picked up the bottle to pour Count Dracula a drink, and I yes. looked into the mirror, and he was standing where you are now, and I couldn't see him in the mirror. What? He was there where you're standing... But he wasn't reflected in the glass. Linda, you're not making sense. And you're trembling. John, I'm scared. Of what? How can you ask? I look in the mirror and didn't see someone who should have been reflected in it. Is something going wrong with my eyes or my brain, John? Oh, what? Minna, easy, easy. I don't want another patient on my hands. But, John, I... An optical illusion, something like that. Our eyes play tricks on us sometimes. Now, come on. Let's get a bandage for that cut, and then we'll go up and see Lucy. I believe, John, it must have been. It had to be a trick my eyes had played. What else? Well, we got a bandage for the cut on my hand, and then John took me to Lucy's room. I can't find words to describe the shock I felt when I saw her. She was white as new-fallen snow, and so thin. She almost seemed transparent. She's dying. That was my first thought. She's dying, and nothing can save her. And I know she read the thoughts in my face. I could see the sudden fear in her eyes. I am dying. Minna. Oh, you mustn't even think that, Lucy. You do. I? It was in your face when you looked at me. I read your thoughts. She's dying, you thought. And nothing can save her. I am. And nothing can save me. Oh, John can save you. And he will. He hasn't so far. Oh, you mustn't despair, Lucy. Despair, Minna? I don't have the strength to despair. You better go now, Minna. Go? Lucy, dear, I haven't seen you in nearly a year. We haven't even started to tell each other everything that's happened. Later. Since... Uh, not, not now. I'm, I'm tired. I want to sleep. Oh, well, in that case, I'll come back later. No, uh, not till tomorrow. All right, whatever you say. But I'll just look in on you later. No, I... Lucy. You... All right, all right, then. But stop upsetting oh, yourself. Oh, go, go quickly. Oh, good Lord. At the window. It's, it's nothing. Go, Minna, it's nothing. Nothing? It's that bat. That huge bat that followed my car. Oh, oh, I beg of you. Lucy, the thing is trying to get in. Look, it's clawing at the window. Is that locked? Is that window yes, locked? Yes, it's locked. But locks uh, are useless against Count Dracula. Oh, good Lord. Mirrors do not reflect my image, Miss Harker. Nor the locks keep me out. You, you, you were that bad. As the wolves you hear are not wolves, but like myself, vampires. Vampires? The dead who live by night. The dead undead. No, this, this can't be happening. It's a dream. It's a nightmare. That's what it will seem like when you wake up. Huh? Yes, you're going to sleep now. And yet not sleep. You will remember all you see in here, but when you wake in, it will seem like a dream. A dream you'll tell no one, not even Professor Van Helsing. Because you will not want to look foolish. 
You'll be ashamed to tell it for fear he will think you a silly young woman. I... Enough. <sighs> sleep. Did I sleep? Did I dream? No. My sleep was a hypnotic trance into which he had placed me. And what I dreamed was reality. There in the moonlight that streamed through the window, I saw Dracula raise his arms and call. Lucy. Lucy, my dearest love, come to me. Come, my darling. I... I... I can't. Too weak, my lover. I'm too weak. Then I shall come to you. Embrace you. Kiss you. And now the strangest thing of all happened to me. As I watched what then took place, my love for my friend Lucy, my fears for her, made me feel as she must have felt so poignantly, so deeply that, yes... I became Lucy. I watched Dracula as he approached my bed. There was a deliberate voluptuousness in him which I found both thrilling and repulsive. Lower and lower went his head as the lips went below the range of my mouth and chin and seemed about to fasten on my throat. I could feel the hot breath on my neck then the skin of my throat began to tingle. I could feel the soft, shivering touch of his lips on the supersensitive skin of my throat, and then two hard dents of two sharp teeth just touching and pausing there. I closed my eyes in a languorous ecstasy, and I waited. I waited with a beating heart. And then horror overcame me. And I sank into unconsciousness. I promise that the horror you have just experienced is nothing compared to what is to come. Think twice before you return with me shortly with Act Two. Hi. Goldilocks, Ms. Goldilocks, if you please, and I'm a professional taste tester. Here at my taste test laboratory, that's TTL for short, <laughs> I taste test everything from porridge to diet drinks. Actually, there's not that much taste testing in porridge these days. There used to be once upon a time. I mean, that's how this Ms. got into the biz. <laughs> but lately, it's been diet drinks. I mean, with so many diet drinks going sugar-free, I've been really busy conducting taste tests. A rather unbearable assignment, to be sure. But then I discovered sugar-free diet 7-Up. Fresh, natural, delicious. My only problem is that sugar-free diet 7-Up tastes so good that it broke my Goldilocks diet drink taste meter Well, sugar-free diet 7-Up certainly has my seal of approval. This one's just right. What's for dinner? Hey, ma'am, what you got? It's time to get ready for the great outdoors, and your ShopRite supermarket has everything you'll need for cookout dinners and fun in the sun. And for this week's dinners, ShopRite is featuring whole grade A frying chickens, just 37 cents a pound. Roasting chickens, up to four pounds, 47 cents a pound. Choice beef rib steaks, $1.19 a pound. ShopRite franks, 89 cents a pound. Get all your outdoor cooking equipment and many great food values at your ShopRite supermarket. She loves the family. She wants the best. She does all that she can do. She lets ShopRite do the rest. Hey, Ma, what's for dinner? ShopRite has the answer. This is WOR New York, an RKO General Station, your station for Mystery Theater. I thought it must have been a dream, a nightmare, 
For nothing so vile and revolting could be real. But though I tried during the next day or two to persuade myself it was only a dream, there were signs, warnings all about me that told me I was lying to myself. There was the nightly howling of the wolves, the screeching of that huge bat around the house. And yes, the scarf that Lucy kept wrapped round her throat. It's such a hot afternoon. How can you bear to wear that scarf around your throat? Hot? I feel cold. But, Lucy, you're perspiring. Your forehead is damp. All I want to do is sleep. I'm so tired. I'm so deathly tired. I'll leave you for a while, then. I'll look in on you later to make sure you're all right. Oh. Sleep well. Minna? Yes, dear? If I'm asleep when you come back... Promise me you won't remove this scarf from around my throat. Very well. You won't even touch it. Promise? I promise. Later that afternoon, toward evening, Professor Van Helsing arrived from Holland. When John introduced me to him, he stared at me suddenly and hard, his eyes boring into me from behind his thick lens glasses. You are frightened, Miss Harker? Why? Frightened? Maybe really? she hasn't recovered from that optical illusion the other night. Optical illusion? Yes, you see that mirror over the table there? Yes. Well, we had a visitor, Count Dracula, a new neighbor, Carfax, a few miles from here, and Minna had the illusion that she couldn't see his reflection in the mirror. My eyes must have played a trick on me, Professor. Yes. Uh, this Count Dracula, John, he's... Uh... New here, you say? Yes, he arrived from Hungary about six weeks ago. I see. Take me to see your fiancée, John. Oh, uh, she's sleeping, Lucy. Well, sleeping. We'd right better now. wake her up. Uh, what is it? You seem suddenly concerned. I am. Take me to Lucy at once. <laughs> now, wake her, John. All right. Gently. Very gently. Lucy? Lucy, dear. Come on, wake up. Uh, here, here, here. Let me. Hmm. Pulse weak, very weak. Eyes. Oh, she's not asleep. She's in a coma. What is her blood type? Oh. So is mine. Prepare for a transfusion, John. I will be the donor. And hurry, man, hurry. Yes, yes, of course. Meanwhile, I shall have a look under this scarf. No, no, she didn't want the scarf removed. I'm sure she didn't, Miss Harker, but we're going to remove it. Aha. Uh -huh. As I thought. What? What is it? Yes, Professor, what? Look. Look. There are two... Two little holes. Wounds. As if she'd been bitten by a large snake. No. Not a snake. Well, what then? What? We must be quick with the transfusion. Very quick. And pray God. Pray God, both of you, that I have not arrived too late. <laughs> was too late. The transfusion revived Lucy a little when we'd made her as comfortable as we could. The three of us, Professor Van Helsing, John and I, went back down to the living room. And it was here that Professor Van Helsing told us the truth. The truth that made John Seward cry out. Vampire? You say we are dealing with a vampire? Professor, have you gone out of your mind? My dear John, I don't blame you. Blame me? I should hope not. You ask me to believe me, a doctor, a man of medical science? <laughs> science? Uh, there's more to this world than science. But, Professor, a vampire? I can't believe that there's a vampire. I tell you that witches exist. That warlocks exist. That vampires exist. And we are dealing with one here. But if, if what you say is true... It is, it is. Ask her. Ask Miss Harker. Me? Uh, you had an experience in this house that you are concealing. You choose to think it was a dream. Well, when did it happen, child? Last night? No. The night before. Where? In Lucy's bedroom. Minna, what happened? I... I dreamed... No, it was no dream. All right, then. I saw... Oh, heaven, protect me. I saw... You needn't tell me. No need to put you through that. 
I would if I didn't know who our vampire is. But I do know. Who? The man whose reflection she could not see in that mirror. Your new neighbor, Count Dracula. I don't believe you. I cannot believe you. If you can't believe me, at least trust me. Oh, I'll answer that. Wait. Yes, Professor. Uh, if that should be Count Dracula, you did say that he calls about this time each evening, John. Yes. Say nothing, do nothing to give away the fact that we are unto him. Oh, this is nonsense, sheer do nonsense. Do I not tell you? You may answer the door now, Miss Harker. Yes. Good evening, Miss Harker. Count Dracula? Uh, come in. And how is Miss West Enra today? Not too well, I'm afraid. She had to have another transfusion. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that, John. Very sorry to hear that. Thank you, Count. I do not believe I have met this gentleman. Oh, uh, I'm sorry. No, you, you haven't. Uh, let me present my old friend and teacher, Professor Abraham Van Helsing. Uh, Professor, this is Count Dracula. How do you do, Professor? How do you do, Count? But I wished only to inquire about your fiancé, John. I'm sorry indeed to hear she is no better. If there is anything I can do... Thank you. Meeting you, Professor, has been a pleasure. Good night. Oh, um, Count. Yes? Uh, Mrs. Westenra keeps asking me to do this, and I keep forgetting. Uh, there is a custom in the Westenra family to ask visitors to sign the visitor's book. Ah, charming old world custom. It's gone. right here. If you'll just wait a second, I'll, I'll get it, and um, then you can sign it. <clears throat> is something wrong? It is a Bible. Well, well, yes. Why do you back away from me? Or are you backing away from the book? The holy book? I must go. No, no, you'll stay and face this book. You know. You know. John, you fool. You shouldn't have done this. I had to. I had to have proof. I will make you pay for this. You shall pay. Oh, no. Not now. Now that I have found out what you are. Oh, no, John, John. You think because you discovered my secret you can stop me? Fool. You've only delivered yourself into my hands. I meant to make Lucy one of mine, and that was all. But now you shall become mine, and you... Not I. Yes, and you... No, I beg you. I shall have you all, but first... Lucy, I shall take her. Take her. Now. She is mine. She is no longer of this world, but of mine. I leave you. Look! Look, he turned into a bat. The bat! And he flew right through the wall. John! Oh. John, why did you do this? Why, after I warned you... I, I had to know one way or the other. I had to know. There's only one way to finish a vampire. Oh, the first thing you must do is find out where he sleeps during the day. <coughs> Lucy! <coughs> Professor, quickly. <coughs> Professor! There is no hurry now. And he said he meant to make her his own. He had already done so. It was true. Lucy was dead. We went to her bedroom and found her. Dead. I felt as if I'd been stabbed to the heart. We buried her, my dearest friend, in the West End Revolt at Hillingham Cemetery, not far from town. Lucy is gone. Dead? No. No, not dead. Not dead? dead, Professor. She has become the undead. She has become a vampire. Oh, what are you saying? Oh, John, listen to me. Believe in me. You didn't believe before. Believe now. Yes, yes, yes. I believe you. Go on. Go on. John, you, you, you feel you've been through hell. I must tell you that you have been through only the anteroom to hell. What do you mean? Now, listen to me. Listen carefully. There is only one way in which a vampire can find peace, can be changed from the undead to the dead. What you must do, terrible as it will be, will release her soul from the horrifying bondage in which it finds itself. Her soul and Dracula's. Dracula's? Do you think a vampire wants to be a vampire? Oh, no, no. A vampire's soul is chained, pinioned, held mercilessly to this earth by Satan himself. And we, we who believe in God, are the only ones who can free them. It is our duty to destroy them. Well, then let's destroy them. We shall, if you have the nerve to do what, what must be done. 
I have the nerve. Professor, you frighten me. I mean to, in order to prepare you. But no matter how well I prepare you, when it comes to doing what must be done, you, your sanity could snap like, like that. So first I will ask you both to take as much time as you need to, to think, to ask yourselves, how much did you, do you really love Lucy Westenra? And be sure, be positive beyond all doubt that your love for her is greater than the hell that lies ahead. Lies ahead for you and you this very night. I'll be back shortly with Act Three. When you drink beer... Do you tilt the glass for long, hearty swallows? Or just tip it and sip it? Well, sipping's the thing for wine. But Budweiser beer is a hearty drink, brewed for zest and character. The best way to enjoy Bud is to drink it. Not chug a lug, just man-sized beer drinker swallows. That's when that famous Budweiser taste, smoothness, and drinkability really come through. Smoothness and drinkability that come only from natural carbonation and exclusive beechwood aging. Smoothness and drinkability, too good for any half-hearted sipping. So drink up. You'll see that brewing beer right does make a difference. And that when you say Budweiser, you've said it all. Anheuser-Busch, St. Louis. I thought I knew what horror was until I read it. I changed my mind. You will, too. I'm ready, Professor. I knew you would be, John. We'll wait now for Miss Harker. No, no, there's no need to wait. I love Lucy enough. More than enough. She was my dearest friend. Is your dearest friend. For she is not yet dead. She is as yet the dead undead. It's nearly sundown. Let us go to the cemetery at once. The cemetery? It will be dark by the time we get there. She will have left her coffin. Left it? Well, like Count Dracula, she cannot go on living, or let me say, being the undead without drinking human blood. To find it, she must, of course, leave her coffin. The instant the sun goes down tonight, she will be on the prowl for little children. Children? Yes, children are innocent, gullible, naive, make easier victims. And the inexperienced vampire must uh, practice. Yes, she, she will be seeking children. Oh, it's revolting. Revolting? Well, that is only a word to you at the moment. In a short time, it will be reality. Do you really think you can bear what, what is to come? I can. I must. Good. Uh, I have uh, preparations to make. So do you, the two of you. Dress warmly. Warmly? But it's hot out. Child, there is no chill like a graveyard chill. We drove to Hillingham Cemetery in John's car. I'd never been in a cemetery at night. How many people have? I found it a very unsettling experience, to say the least. It was a moonlit night, the moonlight spilling like milk over the gravestones, which in turn threw... Long black shadows. An owl hooted. And dogs barked. Or I couldn't help thinking, were they wolves? And then we reached the Westenra vault. The vault where we'd put Lucy's coffin that afternoon. Now what do we do, Professor? We go into the vault. Why? Uh, and how? I have the key to the vault. How did you get it? I asked the undertaker for it, or rather told him to give it to me. He assumed I was a member of the family. Well, you need not come with me. Not now. But why shouldn't we come? I wish to save you as much shock as I can. She will not be there in the coffin. It will be a shock for you to find it empty. Now, on the other hand, it will be less a shock than what is to follow. Yes, it will prepare you. Come then. Now, I shall open the coffin now. If she... If she isn't in it, 
How could she have got out? I could tell you, but it is better that you see for yourself later. Now, this won't take long. I need only unscrew the top part. There. Well, now to lift off the top of the lid. Oh. Yes. Empty. She's gone. Where? Gone where in God's name? Where? In search of the life-giving blood, John. In search of a small child. Oh, it's horrible. It's horrible. John. Yes? Come. We go outside the vault. <laughs> now to lock the door. Now, that's most important. And now, what I must do will take a little time. Yes, make yourselves as comfortable as you can. <laughs> make ourselves comfortable. Professor, what must you do? Well, I have here a paste made of garlic, flour, and water. Uh, I must seal off every crevice with it. Seal all around the door so Lucy cannot get back into the vault, into her coffin. She could? Through the crevices, yes. How do you think she got out of the coffin? I can't believe... Yes, yes, yes. It is unbelievable. But it is so. Now, forgive me. I must get to work. I can't express in words how fresh and clean the night air seemed when we came out of the tomb. How sweet to breathe the fresh air that held no taint of death or decay. John was silent, and so was I. As for Professor Van Helsing, he was very busy sealing the door. Ten o'clock. I hope both of you took my advice, dressed warmly. We have a long wait ahead of us. How much longer, Professor? I'm chilled to the bone. Uh, everything depends on how long it takes her to find a small child. Uh, nearly two o'clock. Has been gone several hours. Soon now, I think. Shh. What? She comes. Where? See there? Amidst the headstones? Yes, a woman. Dressed in white. Lucy. Shh. Shh. Make no move, no noise. Oh. You see, she is. Carrying something in her arms. A child. I feel sick. Control yourself. Ah, there. Yes, she's coming toward the vault. <gasps> See, she draws back. Uh, the mixture I used repels her. <gasps> Why are we doing this? Why are you keeping her out of the vault, her coffin? Because I hope. Ah, yes. Yes, she is leaving, hurrying away from along the headstones. Come, we, we must follow. Follow? Follow where? To Dracula, I hope. Unless I'm mistaken, she's going to him for help. Oh, hurry, hurry. We must keep her Go in on. sight. No, wait. What is it? She is heading for for that tomb. Dracula must be there. Good. Now watch. Huh? See, now she's putting the child down on the ground. And now I'm... Where? Where is she? Where she? She's vanished. She simply slipped into the tomb through the crevice around the door. Oh, wait here. Yes. What's he doing? He's picking up the child, I think. Yes. See, he, he's coming back now. Here, Miss Harker. You take the child. Keep it warm. Oh, this poor thing. Poor little thing. Look, it doesn't move. It doesn't make a sound. It's lifeless. No. No, only in a trance. It will recover. But remember, when I ask you to do what must be done, remember that we have saved not only this child, but God knows how many others. I'll remember. Good. And now we will return to her tomb and wait till dawn. Till dawn? She will return to the tomb then. She has no choice. Dracula cannot help her. She must sleep in her own coffin before daybreak. How do you feel, Miss Harker? I'm all right, thank you. John? I'm okay. It's almost dawn. Why doesn't she come? Soon, soon now. Uh, how's the child? Still asleep, if it is only sleep. It is, it is. 
It will not come to its senses until daybreak. Now, prepare yourselves for... In a very short time, now Lucy should... Ah, there, there. Yes, she's, she's coming. And this time she'll be able to enter the tomb. Could you remove the garlic mixture? This time I want her to enter the tomb and her coffin. It will be there that you will do what, what must be done. Oh, there, there she is. Oh, heaven help me. She is as beautiful as she always was. Now hold on to yourself. She, she isn't dead. She can't be dead. Lucy! Lucy, my darling! John! No, come back! Lucy! John, my dearest, come to me, John! Come to me! I have never seen anything so horrible. And God save me from ever seeing it again. Lucy's eyes shone with an unholy light and her face became wreathed with a voluptuous smile as she advanced toward John with outstretched arms. Come to me, dearest. My arms are hungry for you. Come, and we can rest together in the tomb. Come, my lover. Come. And John suddenly opened wide his arms and started running to her and she to him when Van Helsing rushed forward between them. And he raised something he held in his hand up against her face. It was a crucifix. With a cry of rage and Ah! agony, Lucy flung herself away from John and toward the tomb, and she was gone. John? John, are you all right? The Lord help me. The Lord help me. And he shall come into the tomb. It's time. Now, first, let me put the bag I brought over here. And now I will remove the coffin lid again. Professor, is this really Lucy's body or some kind of demon in her shape? Oh, she's hideous. Yes. Yes, your friend who was so sweet and pure is now a foul thing. But if you can do what you must do, you will see her once again as she was. Whatever it is, we'll do it. This wooden stake I have bought. Yes. This pointed stake. You must drive it through Lucy's heart with this hammer. Oh, no. And when that is done, cut off her head with this surgical knife. Uh, I, I, I don't... You, I don't... You must do it. For her sake, John, for the sake of the woman you loved. All right. Give me the stake. And the hammer. John took the stake in his left hand. The hammer in his right. I saw him tremble as he placed the point of the stake over Lucy's heart. Saw the point dig into her white flesh. And then I could see him gather all his strength, all his self-control. He raised the hammer high above his head and looked at Van Helsing. Yes. Now, John struck with all his might. The thing in the coffin writhed and a hideous blood-curdling screech came from the opened lips. The body shook and twisted in wild contortions. John never faltered. He struck, and he struck again, driving the stake deeper, deeper. His blood from the pierced heart welled and spurted up around it. And then the writhing and quivering of the body became less. The teeth stopped champing, and the thing lay still. (laughs) It was over. Is that enough, Professor? Enough. I... I think I'm... I think I'm going to... I've got uh, you. There. Now go outside, get some air. No. Both of you go. You look faint too, Miss Parker. I must steal her head. I... No, no. I have... You have done all that can be asked of you. No more. I will sever the head. Now go now, but before you do, 
Look at your beloved Lucy for the last time. There, in the coffin, lay no longer the foul thing we dreaded. But Lucy, as we had seen her in life, her face as beautiful and pure as it had been then. You will want to know that later on, Professor Van Helsing freed Count Dracula from his earthly bondage. And in so doing, brought his bloody career to an end. Unhappily, I must add that Count Dracula was only one vampire among... Uh, how many? I don't know. Hope I never find out. Hope you don't either. I'll be back shortly. Dear Thomas's, your new Thomas's onion English muffins are so delicious, my husband insists on them at every meal. It's embarrassing when we go to a Chinese restaurant. Dear Thomas's, for years I've been buying bagels and bialis with my Sunday Times. Last Sunday I bought the Times and your new Thomas's onion English muffins. Not bad, Thomas's. Dear Thomas's, since serving sandwiches on your new onion English muffins, I've become very popular with the boys. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Thomas's new onion English muffins. Here, 45, please, and don't spare the horses. Yes, sir. In 1880, when a cab had four legs and took 12 minutes to cross Manhattan, Samuel Bath Thomas was baking bread, every bit as delicious as his original English muffins. Here, 45, and move it. Today, cabs have 300 horses, but still take 12 minutes to cross town. And Thomas's is still baking breads, every bit as delicious as their English muffins. Thomas's protein, whole wheat, and white bread. Thomas's promises. Our cast included Mercedes McCambridge, Paul Hecht, Stefan Schnabel, Michael Wager, and Marion Seldes. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Anheuser-Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams... by the CBS Radio Network. This is Mary Helen McPhillips. I hope you'll join me tomorrow morning at 10.15. I have great fun in store for you. My guest is Henry Pleasance, the famous, very well-known, serious music critic. But tomorrow, he's going to be talking about how great popular singers are and just why they are. And we'll hear little bits of some of their singing. That's tomorrow morning at 10.15. Lewis in the Mutual Broadcasting System studios in Washington, D.C. Now, my commentary. President Nixon got a six-day delay today in his fight against the Watergate subpoena, and a panel of experts said it will present another report on Saturday regarding that now-famous 18-and-a-half-minute gap in one of the crucial White House Watergate tapes. A sweeping subpoena issued against the president by the Watergate special prosecutor, Leon Jaworski, had been due this morning, but U.S. District Court Judge John Sirica gave attorneys additional time to file briefs and to set a hearing date after the White House petitioned the court to quash the subpoena. In a brief session with attorneys in the Watergate cover-up case and White House attorneys, Judge Sirica gave them until next Monday to file answers to the White House motion. He set a hearing for next Wednesday. In a similar struggle last fall, you recall, Judge Sirica rejected White House claims of executive privilege. Back then, he ordered the president to turn over several tape recordings of presidential conversations, and he was upheld by the U.S. Court of Appeals here in Washington. But also, as you recall, the president eventually turned over the tapes without appealing the case to the Supreme Court. There were strong indications from both sides this time, however, that the final showdown may come in the high court. Meanwhile, two members of the panel of tape recording experts said that they are going to present their report to Judge Sirica on Saturday. That panel has been studying the cause of the gap, studying it since last November. In its interim report, issued in January, the same panel said that the gap had been caused by a process of erasing and re-recording at least five, possibly nine times. 
but it did not address itself to whether the erasure and re-recording was deliberate or accidental. Judge Sarika said that the meeting Saturday with Dr. Richard Bolt, a former professor at MIT and a second unnamed member of the panel, would be held in the judge's chambers. The judge said details of the report will not be made public at that time, but that further proceedings in connection with the report will be decided at the meeting. The panel was chosen jointly by the White House and by Special Prosecutor Leon Jaworski. After the gap in the tape was made known in a hearing before Judge Sirica, who recommended that the Watergate grand jury investigate the incident. The gap is in one of nine tapes that were originally subpoenaed by the special prosecutor's office last year. The blank section is at the beginning of a conversation between the president and then White House Chief of Staff H.R. Haldeman, the date June 20th, 1972. That, of course, was just three days after the break-in at the Democratic Party headquarters in the Watergate office building here in the nation's capital. At the White House today, Deputy White House Press Secretary Gerald Warren said that the House Judiciary Committee, which is considering impeachment of the president, got, in Warren's words, the full story of the Watergate issue when the president turned over some 1,200 pages of edited transcripts of taped White House conversations on Tuesday. Warren commented in response to a question about the committee's vote last night to inform the president that it feels he has failed to comply with its subpoena, which it asked for the tapes themselves rather than for the edited transcripts. Warren said that the White House feels the committee members have been given the facts on which they can move ahead. He also stuck by the president's offer to allow committee chairman Peter Rodino, the New Jersey Democrat, and the ranking Republican member, Michigan Republican Representative Edward Hutchinson, but no other committee, no staff members, to listen to the tapes in private and to verify the accuracy of the transcripts. Warren today commented, we feel that we have made a very fair, full, and responsible offer. From sources in the Senate came reports, meanwhile, that Alexander Haig, currently the White House Chief of Staff, today refused to answer questions before the Senate Watergate Committee, saying that he'd been instructed to invoke executive privilege by President Nixon himself. At an executive session of the panel, Haig presented a letter from the president saying, quote, it would be wholly inappropriate for the committee to examine you about your activities as chief of staff or about information that has come to you in that position. The president's letter invoked both executive privilege and attorney-client privilege in ordering Haig not to cooperate with the committee's probe of the Watergate issue. Meanwhile, Vice President Gerald Ford said today that after reading some of the newly released Watergate transcripts, he is, in his words, convinced beyond any doubt that President Nixon is innocent of any wrongdoing. However, Ford said he believes the president could have been a little more forceful in trying to get to the bottom of the Watergate issue a little faster. In a brief meeting with reporters of the Justice Department, Assistant Attorney General Henry Peterson today defended his conduct of the initial Watergate investigation and declared, I am not a whore. The White House edited transcript showed Peterson regularly informing the president about the progress of the investigations, sometimes even advising him about ways to deal with top presidential aides who were implicated in the scandal. Peterson today said, I walked through a minefield and came out clean. In another Watergate impeachment development, the Judiciary Committee approved by voice, voice vote live television coverage of its impeachment proceedings, so long as it does not interfere with those proceedings. Presidential Counselor Dean Burt said the White House had no objections to live television coverage. However, he repeated the White House view that whatever is done should be handed, spe handled speedily. Burt said in a White House meeting with newsmen, time is becoming critical in this thing. It's not the right thing to continue the pre proceedings into the autumn election campaigns. Former milk producer lobbyist Bob Lilly is quoted in court papers as saying that his boss told him that campaign donations were pledged to President Nixon in conjunction with the 1971 price support increase. That statement is the first to be attributed to a dairy cooperative official alleging any link between the president's order to raise federal milk price supports in 1971 and the dairyman's promise of up to $2 million in campaign donations. In a White House statement last January, the president specifically denied that he ordered prices increased in return for that campaign money. He did concede that traditional political considerations did play a part in his decision to overrule the Agriculture Department's desire to keep prices steady. The House Judiciary Committee is investigating the milk price matter as part of its impeachment inquiry, and the Watergate Special Prosecution Force is also looking into it. 
And the White House has declined requests for numerous tapes and documents relating to that price support matter. Lilly's statement actually surfaced as part of subpoenaed papers made public in connection with the Justice Department's antitrust suit against the nation's largest dairy farmer cooperative, Associated Milk Producers Incorporated. He was interviewed by former American Bar Association President Edward Wright last December 27th and 28th as part of his investigation into the milk producers' political activities, which he conducted for the co-op's board of directors. A judge delayed today his decision on a motion by defense attorneys in the John Ehrlichman perjury case to move the trial out of Los Angeles because of excess publicity. Superior Court Judge Gordon Ringer ordered a recess until the next mail delivery at the request of defense attorneys who are waiting for newspaper clippings to arrive from San Diego County. The defense team has claimed that the former presidential advisor could get a more fair trial in the San Diego area because publicity there has been more favorable to Ehrlichman. They said the clippings are needed to support that claim. Syrian leaders seem to be confident that when Secretary of State Henry Kissinger arrives there on Friday, he may be carrying a significant Israeli concession that could pave the way for negotiations on separating forces on the Golan Heights. A high-ranking source in Damascus said the talks will be complicated, but we are convinced Washington realizes what is at stake and Kissinger will not come with an empty briefcase. Although the secretary has appealed to both sides for restraint while he tries to work out an agreement, official sources in Damascus say that Syria's president has adopted a Viet Cong-style strategy, a strategy of fighting while negotiating. Diplomats also note a new Syrian desire to cooperate and maybe even compromise, a desire that has been promoted by, first, a growing belief that U.S. mediation efforts are sincere, secondly, the the lure of U.S. monetary aid and Western technology for a long-hoped-for economic rebirth of Syria, thirdly, President Nixon's foreign aid package that gave Egypt $250 million dollars, also includes provisions for $100 million that could possibly go to Syria. Also, Israeli cabinet changes that have prompted some Syrian hopes that the Israelis may be more amenable than before to Secretary Kissinger's persuasive powers. And finally, the closing gap between Soviet and U.S. efforts in the Middle East. The Soviet Union had encouraged Syrian militancy to counter Kissinger's dominant role in Mideast diplomacy and its waning influence in Egypt... But Kissinger's conciliatory talks with Soviet Foreign Minister Andrei Gromyko in Geneva have apparently resulted in new U.S.-Soviet pledges to try to work together insofar as the Middle East is concerned. The Senate here today passed and sent to President Nixon a compromise bill which creates a new Federal Energy Office. The bill passed 236 to 9 by the House of Representatives back on Monday. It won in the Senate by a voice vote. Energy-related functions now spread over numerous federal offices. These would be centered in the new agency and would have extensive authority to require information from energy companies and to even issue subpoenas if necessary. President Nixon is expected to formally nominate John Sawhill, now FEO administrator, to head up the new formal agency. The nominee would be subject to Senate confirmation. The bill authorizes $475 million for the agency to operate until June 30th, 1976. From the Mutual Studios in Washington, I'm Fulton Lewis, and that's the top of the news as it looks from here. Now the Mystery Theater. Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. Welcome to the world of terrifying imagination. In 1843, a Dr. James Braid of Manchester developed the art of being able to produce trance sleep. Of course, he was not the first. That honor belonged to Friedrich Anton Mesmer. But Dr. Braid did coin the name of this both beneficial yet potentially disastrous parascience, hypnotism. In the skilled hands of a doctor or a psychiatrist, it can be profoundly beneficial. But in the hands of an amateur or someone unscrupulous, it can be murderously dangerous. That's it, Marge. 
Just keep your eyes on the coin as it goes back and forth, back and forth. You're getting sleepy, so sleepy. Your eyelids are heavy. You can't hold them up. You've got to sleep, sleep, sleep. She... She's under, Mark. They're putting me on, Jeff. She's fake. No, no, she's under, all right. She's a hypnotist's dream. Very suggestible. Look, I'll prove it to you. What's this? Hey, don't hold it there. Just long enough to show she doesn't react. You could have burned her. <laughs> oh, come on. You think I'd do anything to hurt your sister? Well, now that you've got her under, what are you going to do? What would you like her to do? Jeff asked me. What would you like her to do? Well, I would have liked her to murder my father. I wondered how Jeff would have reacted if I'd said that out loud. It almost came out anyway, since it's all I think of these days. How to murder, destroy, wipe out my father. <laughs> mystery drama, Murder with Malice, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Ian Martin and stars Marsha Rod and Ira Lewis. It is sponsored in part by New Sugar-Free Diet 7-Up and Buick Motor Division. I'll be back shortly with Act One. When you feel like having a cold Budweiser, do you automatically reach for a glass? Well, sure, Bud's a great beer any way you drink it. But without a glass, you're really missing something. Now, take that wonderful Budweiser head of foam, for instance. Those bubbles, tiny though they are, still amount to something pretty special at the top of your glass. Taste appeal and eye appeal. Two results of exclusive beechwood aging and natural carbonation. It takes a lot longer to brew Budweiser that way. But brewing beer right does make a difference that you can taste. That's why when you say Budweiser, you've really said it all. Anheuser-Busch, St. Louis. <laughs> North Jersey is certainly getting a higher yield this season, especially with Suburban Savings Special High Yield Savings Certificate that you can raise for fun and profit. All you have to do is plant a modest $2,500 minimum in Suburban's limited issue 7.50% savings certificate. Then put your certificate in a nice safe place. Suburban takes care of the rest by compounding interest continuously from day of deposit paid quarterly. You'll get a nice healthy 7.90% effective annual yield on your 7.50% savings certificate when you let it grow from four to ten years. Early withdrawal prior to maturity is, of course, subject to a substantial penalty. So for a nice, healthy 7.90% annual effective yield, grow Suburban's 7.50% savings certificate for fun and profit at any Suburban savings office in northern New Jersey. Principles of Mental Physiology, Carpenter wrote, The method of producing this state consists in the maintenance of a fixed gaze on a bright object placed somewhat above the line of sight. A light behind the subject shining on the bright object, a coin, a jewel, a small mirror, is very helpful, and a darkened room. Once the subject is in the trance, he or she is open to post-hypnotic suggestion. Luckily for our peace of mind and their father's health, Marge is a subject, and not the bloodthirsty Mark. Ever since I can remember, I've hated my father and feared him. But never more so than these last two years since he killed my mother. I'd like to kill him, but I haven't the guts. Well, what, Mark? Huh? Well, what do you, what do you mean, what? What do you want me to ask Marge to do? 
<laughs> Don't tell me I put you into a trance, too. No, no, I... Look, what, uh... What sort of thing can I ask? Anything within reason. I mean, she won't do anything to hurt herself, or to hurt someone else, or steal, or anything that goes against her natural instincts. Uh, let's keep it simple. You know what you ought to ask her to do? What? Marry you. She's got a chance to shake this scene and have some kind of decent life of her own and get away from that monster upstairs and and she won't take it. She loves her father. That murdering... Hey, come on, take it easy, well, Mark. He killed my mother. It was a car accident. He was going 90 and he was drunk when they crashed. It's a miracle anyone came out of it alive. It's a pity it had to be him. He got off lucky. Lucky? A shattered pelvis? Condemned to drag himself around on canes for the rest of his life? I hope he never knows a moment when he's not in pain. Hey, Mark. Come on, let's knock it off. I want to bring Marge out of the trance. Well, wait a minute. We've got a bet going here. You claimed you could uh, prove post-hypnotic suggestion, didn't you? Yeah. Well, suppose you... Damn that grandfather clock. Drives me crazy. Old man's pride and joy hasn't missed a chime since the day he was born. Did it wake March? No, no. She'll stay under till I bring her out of it. What were you going to say before? Well, suppose you... Were to tell Marge to hit up the old man for $5,000 tomorrow at breakfast, would she do it? Well, she might if if she thought it was justified. Well, tell her... Tell her I needed to pay off some debts. Do you? What's the difference? She won't get it? No, Mark, I'm sorry. No, no go. Now, if you want Marge to try to get money for you, you ask her directly. When she's fully conscious. Like I figured the two of you are just putting me on. Oh, no. No, I'll prove that to you. Marge? Marge? Yes? I want you to do something for me tomorrow morning. All right. What time's breakfast? Nine on the dot. Another of the old man's fetishes. Okay. Now, Marge, I want you to come down and be at the breakfast table at two minutes to nine tomorrow morning. Then, when the clock strikes nine, on the last chime, no matter what's going on, you will say, Hickory dickory dock. The mouse ran up the clock. The clock struck nine, and I feel fine. Hickory dickory dock. And you won't remember you said it. Will you do that? Yes. I won't forget. No. Now, you've been having a nice rest. But it's time to wake up and feel refreshed and relaxed. You will wake up when I say now. Now. Mm. Mm. I feel as if I... What are you staring at? The two of you. Jeff, did it work? Mm-hmm. <laughs> you, you really put me under? For about ten minutes. Oh, that's scary. You know, why, if you can make me draw a blank like that, you can make me do anything. Oh, no, don't worry. I couldn't make you do anything you didn't really want to. I should hope not. Where did you learn this handy little parlor trick? <laughs> well, I once took uh, some courses in parapsychology. Do you feel relaxed, Marge? Hmm. Is your headache gone? I have to admit I do. And no headache. I really feel as if I'd had a, a whole night's sleep. You're a master magician. No, anyone can do what I did, provided he has the right subject hmm. and that person is willing. Not that I'd advise it, though. It's, it's a dangerous thing to fool around with. But, uh... Your friend uses it in his practice. Dr. Frank. Oh, yeah. Occasionally, if it's indicated. Actually, he's relatively conservative for a psychiatrist. I don't need him. Well, honey, I'd like to see you get rid of those headaches. I'm not a candidate for the couch yet. Well, I guess I'll hit the sack. Mm. Thanks for the fun and games. Good night. Good night, little brother. Good night, Mark. Little brother? Hmm. Didn't you ever know? I was the first twin to arrive. <laughs> it's only one of Mark's resentments. He's the one who really needs analysis. Marge, Mark's problems are his own. Yours are something I want to see solved. I, I don't know why you waste your time with me. If I had any sense in this mixed-up noodle of mine, I'd, I'd marry you, have four children, and live happily ever after. But I, I just can't. Because you feel yourself tied to your father. I can't leave him alone, Jeff. I love him. I think... 
For your sake, Jeff, you'd, you'd better forget me. Will you do me one favor first? Will you just go to see Dr. Frank for a few visits? You think I'm that bad off? Well, Marge, you've... You've been a... You've been pretty mixed up ever since the accident. I know. Okay, Jeff. Maybe you're right. Let me think about it, and maybe I'll call your Dr. Frank tomorrow. Tomorrow? What is it, Jeff? Uh, nothing. It, it, it isn't important. It... It'd be more complicated to undo than to do now. I'll... I'll call you then and explain. Morning, Mark. Morning, Dad. You're surprisingly early. Yeah, I, um... Uh, I wanted to ask you something. If it's money, no. Dad, I'm in... bad trouble. Well, then dig yourself out. Dad... Mom left me money that will come to me when I'm 30. Why can't and I? very wise of her. Maybe in another six years, you'll be able to handle it instead of gambling it away. It wasn't Mom's decision. You talked her into it. I most certainly did. Look, you don't understand. I'm... I'm mixed up with some very hard guys. If I don't pay them all... Oh, these... don't talk nonsense. They'll wait for their money. Good morning, Marjorie. Good morning, Dad. Mark, am I late? No, dear, it's just two minutes to nine. Sit down, have your orange juice. I'll pour the coffee first. You sound very chipper. Yes, I had a wonderful sleep last night. Relaxed as a kitten. I wish I could say the same. Well, that's what comes of having a guilty conscience. And what about yours? I wanted to shout at him as I pushed my chair from the table violently and went to the sideboard. I was seething with hate at his smug self-righteousness. Guilty conscience. If he only knew how guilty, how much I wanted him dead. Serving breakfast plates for Marge and me gave me time to regain control. Then the clock began to strike nine. And my mood improved. A small revenge, but if Jeff's trick worked... At least I'd see the pompous old ass look foolish for once. What time did Jeff Henderson leave last night? I think I'm old enough not to have to answer questions like that. Well, I think I have the right to ask any questions I want to in my house. Because I want to know if you're thinking again of marrying Jeff. Hickory dickory dock. The mouse ran up the clock. The clock struck nine and I feel fine. Hickory dickory dock. What? What? What, 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 what did you just say, Marjorie? Me? I didn't say anything. I just asked you a perfectly reasonable question, and you replied with a silly nursery rhyme. Nursery rhyme? Dad, I, I don't know what you're talking about. I didn't... She doesn't know. She said it. Keep out of this, Mark. It was post-hypnotic suggestion. It was what? <laughs> Marge had one of her bad headaches, and Jeff thought he could cure it by hypnosis. And he did. But what's this about... Hypnosis? Marge, I must say I didn't think you'd be this foolish. I don't want Jeff Henderson in this house again. Dad, I'm the one the trick was played on. Where's your sense of humor? I haven't had any sense of humor since I lost your mother. No, 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 don't help me. I don't need anyone I can manage by myself. I don't expect it from my son... And I don't ask it from you, Marge. Dad, I... No, let him go, Marge. He's only looking for sympathy. Why do you have to be so hard on him, Mark? Because I hate him. I always have. Mark, he's our father. I love him. Well, maybe we're not... What do they call us? Uh, Enzygotic twins, after all, huh? I mean, I guess we came from two different eggs because the only thing I want him to be is dead. <laughs> I think maybe we both need psychiatrists. <laughs> I'll get it, Williams. Yes? Are you Mark Prentice? Yes. Well, open up, fella. Let me in. Oh, now, you don't want to see artillery, do you? Benny? Yeah. He sent me. What do you want? Oh, boy. Benny must be going soft. He lets you into him for 15 big ones. Now, look, look. 
I'm going to pay him. <laughs> oh, I know you're going to pay him. But when? Like, uh, what's on account? I... I haven't got anything right now, but... Benny knows that I come into my own money when I'm 30. You got two weeks, fella. Two. For all account. Otherwise, a couple of broken legs, a little treatment around kidneys, you carry the rest of your life. And we'd still be waiting for the payment. You get the message. I'm scared. And I've never been so scared in my life. And I'm caught. They mean business. And I'll never change my father's mind. I'm going to have to kill him. But how? How? Not exactly the all-American family, the Prentices. But then, where murder is contemplated, and where in fact it may be done, you don't expect to find very normal people. Especially where the murder is premeditated. I'll return shortly with Act Two. Oh, somebody's been drinking my sugar-free Diet 7-Up, and it's all gone. Oh, actually, I saved a little. Oh, a bear! Hiya, Goldie, what's brewing? That's Miss Goldilocks to you. Oh, come on, kid. You mean you don't remember me, the cottage, the three chairs, the porridge? <gasps> Baby bear! In the fur. Been a long time, Goldie. But just call me B.B. You drank all the sugar-free Diet 7-Up, and I have to conduct another diet drink taste test today. Well, yeah, I saw the sign on the door, a professional taste tester. Huh? But how can I conduct my taste test now? Why bother? I tried those other diet drinks, too. You'll notice there's still plenty of them around. Why not ask me? Well, okay, B.B. Tell me. Why did you drink all the sugar-free Diet 7-Up? I like the taste. Light, fresh, natural, sugar-free Diet 7-Up is definitely unbearably delicious. Mm Mm-hmm. Hey, Mom, what's for dinner? Hey, Mom, what you got? What's for dinner? Check ShopRite's low price on first-cut choice beef chuck steaks, just 57 cents a pound. Fresh ground beef chuck, any size package, 89 cents a pound. Shoprite hamburger rolls in packages of eight, just three for one dollar. Mohawk five-pound canned ham will serve a crowd for just four ninety-nine. Save on fresh red plums, three pounds for one dollar. Hotel bar butter, seventy-nine cents a pound. For every meal you serve, you'll get a lot more for a little less at Shoprite. She loves the family. She wants the best. She does all that she can do. She lets shop right do the rest. Hey, my, what's for dinner? Shop right has the answer. This is WOR New York, an RKO General Station, your station for Mystery Theater. Almost two weeks have passed. And Mark has not been able to take any action towards solving his problems. Marge, at least under Jeff's urging, has had several sessions with Dr. Frank. And Harvey Prentice has continued to be himself. Domineering, selfish, callous to any problems but his own. Mark? Yeah, Dad. What is it? Where the devil is Marjorie? I think she's with a psychiatrist. What does she need with a psychiatrist? You'll have to ask her that. Oh, not again. I trust she's not going to be late for dinner this time. Search me. Well, when she comes in, I'm in the study. Oh, by the way, I see you appear to be all in one piece. No bruises, no damage. (laughs) Did you pay off your debts? No. I told you nothing would happen. I've got two days left to come up with the money. Look, Dad. No. Not from me. Do you know that I'm scared to go out of the house? Has it ever occurred to you that you should and get a job? That's the way to pay your debts off. I couldn't pay my debts off with any job I can get. Perhaps you should have thought of that before you ran them up. Oh, it's easy to hate my father. 
And even the fact of murdering him would not be all that hard. It's just how to do it without being found out. It never occurred to me that my sister might provide the answer. Marge! Jeff, what are you doing here? I knew you had an appointment with Dr. Frank. I have the car, so I thought I'd wait and drive you home. I don't feel like talking, Jeff. Marge, I haven't seen you in almost two weeks. You you won't even answer my phone calls. Are you mad at me? Not exactly. Is it that silly stunt I pulled with that post-hypnotic suggestion? No, no. It's it's ever since that evening. I know. All right, all right. Let's get in the car and you can drive me home. Sure. I'm so mixed up, Jeff. I... Oh, I wish you'd never suggested Dr. Frank. Oh, now, wait a minute. He's a good guy. Not for my money, he isn't. I know you meant well, but... But what? Jeff, I... Well, I'm not good for you. Mark and I are all... All screwed up somehow. The whole family. We're Jonas. Keep away from us. Marge, nothing you can say... Why won't you listen to me? I don't want to see you anymore. I can't. There's... There's nothing to explain, and I... Such a headache. Well, maybe maybe I ought to stay and give you another hypnotic treatment. No, no, no. Nobody else is getting inside my head anymore but me. Please, let's just make this goodbye. I don't want to see you again. Marge! Marge, wait a minute! Hey, Marge. What goes? It's nothing. Just leave me alone. Okay. Play it your way. Oh, I'm sorry, Mark. I, I, I didn't mean to snap. It's just the top of my head's blowing off. Mm. I'm not going near that psychiatrist again. Oh, it's the panic. The things he keeps saying. I think he's the crazy one. How come? Well, I'm not going to go through all the double talk about the id and the super ego and the ego, but what he finally got around to saying was that I was jealous of Mother. And because Dad put her first... I I hated him and wanted him dead. Well, he's got the wrong twin. But how could he say such a thing to me when I, I literally gave up Jeff to take care of Dad? Search me. I mean, honestly, I thought that an Oedipus complex was strictly from the ancient Greeks and for doctors talking to each other. Can you imagine me supposed to hate my father? How could you hate Dad when you dropped everything to take care of him ever since Mom died? See, that's... That's because I'm supposed to have a fixation. And it's only guilt that holds me back from destroying him. What? He says that, that deep down in my subconscious or whatever, I, I, I really want to commit murder. You sure you know what you're saying? I know what Dr. Frank said. That I'll never get rid of my headaches till I get rid of my guilt feelings. Mm. And to get rid of those, I'll have to kill him. Dad? That's right. Well, there's a quicker way to get rid of headaches than that. How? Well, get old uh, Jeff back to hypnotize you again. No. Jeff and I are through. I I told him that tonight. Well, if uh, you really want to get rid of a headache, I could have a shot at the uh, hypnosis route. Uh, Jeff said anyone could do it. No, no, thanks. I'm taking my headache to bed. I won't be down for dinner. Of course, I didn't have the idea right then. But some instinct was nudging me that somewhere, somehow, there was a way out for me. But before I could follow the thought through, the phone rang. Yeah, hello? Mark. Look, I'm working on it. I think I've got a way to... to Man to... says you got the day after tomorrow. And then you have time. Well, maybe I, I could raise a... a... You better raise it off, though. Because that's why Uncle Benny's calling it in. Or... Or the deep six. Hey, mister. Mister. <sighs> Who's on the phone, Mark? <sighs> Someone... For me, Dad. Did I ask his sister come in? Oh, yeah. 
Yeah, a few minutes ago. Well, did you tell her I wanted to see her in the study? No. Damn it, face me when I talk. Why not? Because she didn't want to see you. She wasn't feeling well. She went up to bed. Before dinner? She said she didn't feel like eating. And neither do I. Well, what's the matter with you? I'm scared, Dad. That's what's the matter. I'm scared so bad I'm sick. Why? That was some hard guy on the phone. Benny's man. Who's Benny? The man I owe money to. Look, you've got to let me have it. No. You don't understand. If I don't come up with it the day after tomorrow, they could kill me. Don't be ridiculous. All I'm asking is to give me my part of the money that Mom left. Marge got hers. Marjorie could be trusted. You cannot. Please. I'm not your mother, Mark. You haven't got her around to bail you out anymore the way she used to. This time it's your problem and no one else's. The only way you'll ever get any money out of me beyond living expenses is over my dead body. The only way I ever wanted it from him. Over his dead body. And suddenly, at last, I could see the way to do it. Dinner was eaten in stony silence. Just the two of us. After it, my father went back to the study for coffee and brandy. I sneaked upstairs to my father's bedroom, which had been my mother's, too, and searched quickly through her drawers to find what I wanted. The rest was waiting till my father was safely in bed for the night and then moving quietly along the upstairs corridor to my sister's room. Who is it? Mark. May I come in? I suppose so. I knew you were up. I saw the light under the door. Dad came by to say goodnight an hour or so ago. I couldn't get back to sleep. What time is it? The witching hour. Midnight. Uh, mind if I sit on the other bed for a moment? It's all right. Is my bed light in your eyes? No, 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 no. It's just fine. How's the headache? Oh, splitting. <laughs> I wish I had some magic remedy. I'd just like to go to sleep tonight and never wake up again. No, you don't mean that. I do tonight. What's that swinging in your hand? <laughs> That's a memento from better days. Remember, it's the... Uh, it's, uh, Mom's tick-tock watch. Oh, I haven't seen that in years. It's still so shiny. Where'd you get it? Oh, well, I've had it a while. Remember how when we were kids, she used to put us to sleep with it? <laughs> the tick-tock watch. Tick-tock, tick-tock, back and mm. forth. <laughs> My eyes used to get glued to it. Mm. Tick-tock, <laughs> tick-tock. Back and mm. forth, back and forth, till I began to get so sleepy, mm -hmm. so sleepy. So sleepy. Mm -hmm. Sleep, Marge. Sleep. Keep your eyes on the watch. <sighs> yeah, your eyelids are getting heavy. Heavy. So heavy. You've got to sleep. 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 Marge. Marge. I can't believe it. She can't feel the flame. Marge, you're asleep. But you can hear me. Yes, I hear you. Who am I? You're Mark. Am I your brother? Yes. Your twin? Yes. Do you know our father? Yes. How do I feel about him? You... hate him. How do you feel about him? Marge, I asked you. How do you feel about him? I... I hate him, too. Would you like to kill him? Yes. 
I've always wanted to. I want to kill him. I could hardly believe my luck. And just in time to save my neck. The perfect weapon for the perfect murder. My sister. But did I dare to use it? To hurt her instead of being hurt myself? What would they do to her? What would happen to her if I did what I was planning? And would it even work? What were the odds on the biggest gamble I would ever take in my life? A girl helpless under an hypnotic spell. At the mercy of the agent who wove that spell. Her twin brother. Himself at the mercy of passions beyond his control. Eaten up with hate. Tortured by fear. Hesitating to make an unconscionable gamble with her life to save his own. I'll return shortly with Act Three. I'd like to describe a car to you. See what you think of it. First of all, it's small. Second, it's got a six-cylinder engine, a pretty handy asset these days. Third, it's a Buick. Now, in spite of the fact that it's small, this car can seat six easily. It's got a 21-gallon fuel tank, which gives it great range. And it weighs several hundred pounds more than most imports, which in a small car is good. Now, what does it look like? Well, that's pretty tough to handle on radio. I'd hesitate to call it glamorous, and it sure isn't homely. I think handsome would be fair, and it offers some pretty attractive styling and trim options. The interior is definitely its strong suit. Now, if that sounds like a little more than your average small car, then I've described it properly. Because remember, this small car is a Buick. The car is called Apollo, Buick Apollo, and it's about as much small car as you'll find on the road today. See for yourself at your Buick Opal dealer. One of the ten best newspapers in America... Easily the nation's best suburban newspaper, becoming a paper of national influence. These words are from a recent issue of Time magazine. The newspaper described is Newsday, the Long Island newspaper. On the basis of editorial excellence, Time magazine selected the ten newspapers in America that stand out above the rest. One of them was Newsday. Because, as Time noted, Newsday combines solid local coverage with ambitious national and international undertakings. And because Newsday meets Time's other criteria for excellence, it's entertaining and informative. It conducts extended investigations and offers a range of different opinions in its editorial pages. Have Newsday delivered right to your door with no service charge and see why it's one of the ten best papers in America. Newsday. Long Island's own newspaper. Marge lies still, her eyes wide open, but unseeing. Alongside, her brother Mark sits, his mother's watch still swinging its pendulum arc in his hand, unnoticed as he wrestles with the conscience which holds him back from this ultimate gamble. The gamble? Can anyone under hypnotic influence be induced to commit murder? If she killed, they'd never do anything to her. There's a whole history. The encephalitis she had as a kid, the nervous breakdown after Mom died. She's going to a psychiatrist now. Sure, I can get her off. Temporary insanity. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. Only will it work. What was it Jeff said? She won't do anything to hurt herself, or to hurt someone else, or steal, or do anything that goes against her natural instincts. Natural instincts. What does that mean? Doesn't it mean what we really feel deep inside, even if we don't know about it? Gamble. But the odds aren't bad. It's Mark, Marge. Can you hear me? I hear you. Remember a couple of weeks ago when Jeff was here and we got off on the hypnosis kick? Yes, I remember. And what started it? I don't know. I think 
Yes. Talking about being kids. Remember how even then Jeff was into the uh, psychic bit? Yes. The funny cards and guessing <laughs> and trying to reach each other's minds. And who was the best? We were. Why? Because we're twins. Twins go together. Remember how we always liked the same things? Mm. Mocha ice cream and rare hamburger, buttermilk, crazy things nobody else liked. We liked. Just like we hated. What did we hate? You know. Coffee, half and half, and uh, hot dogs without relish, and hmm. people who lie or cheat or murder. Murder? Like Dad. He killed Mother, didn't he? There was, there was an accident. He was too drunk to drive the car. Didn't you hate him after the accident? I don't know. Don't you hate him now? I... Yes, I hate him. Would you like to see him dead? Would I? I would. And we're twins, remember? Yes, twins. We always think alike, right? We always think alike. I want to kill him. Don't you? I want to kill him. Then listen. Tomorrow night he'll go to bed early... He'll be fast asleep by 10 o'clock, you understand? Fast asleep by 10 o'clock. I can promise you that. I won't be here. But when the grandfather clock strikes 10, you're going to go to the dining room, right? When it strikes 10, I go to the dining room. In the sideboard drawer. You know which one. His dad's carving knife. The one he keeps honed to a razor's edge with the sharp point, remember? I remember. The carving knife. Right. And then go to his bedroom and plunge it into his chest. Um, Listen to me, Marge. You'll be doing what you always wanted to do. Uh, You'll never have headaches anymore because the guilt will be gone. Uh, You'll be destroying him just as you've always wanted to do. Killing what you hate, uh, what I hate. Killing all the hate in our hearts. You understand? When the clock strikes ten tomorrow night, I am to get the carving knife and take it upstairs and plunge it into Dad until he is dead. And when you wake up in the morning, you won't remember any of this. I didn't sleep much that night, and next day was an endless nightmare. By the time dinner was over, I was a wreck. But the real strain was just beginning. No, it was no sweat to slip the barbiturate in Dad's coffee and later to help him up to bed half comatose and get him settled snoring for the night. It was after the clock chimed 8.30 that I finally left the house to establish my own alibi. Stopping carefully, I might add, on the way out to make sure the uh, clock was wound, although my father was usually infallible in seeing that it never ran down. And then I left the house. Hey, Mark. I'm sorry I'm a little late. Oh, just glad you're here. Have you eaten? Oh, yeah. You? Oh, long time ago. I I, uh, I ordered some setups. Uh, scotch okay with you? Uh, one drink. Just thought we might uh, have a talk together. What time is it? Around five or so to nine. Well, what do you want to talk about? Uh, March. <laughs> well, that's my favorite subject. You aren't the bearer of good news by any chance. Good news? Well, that she's changed her mind about me and I might have some kind of a chance with her. Oh, that's something we might discuss, Jeff. Let's, uh, let's have another drink first. Where was I? Don't you think you should go a little easy on the drinking, Mark? Hey, if I want to get drunk, I'll get drunk. Not with me, Buster. All right, okay, so I'm sober. Where was I? Well, you were trying to explain something about your sister, which is the only reason you're holding me. Oh, oh yeah, March, yeah. You know, you don't stand a, a chance as long as Dad's around. Yeah, I'm aware of that problem. Well, su- supposing it suddenly didn't exist anymore, supposing there wasn't my father. Well, if that's your only question for the evening, maybe we ought to order another drink. Mark. Mark. Huh? Come what? on. What? Come on, I paid up. Let's get out of here. No, 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 I can't. What, what, what time? What time is it? It's after 10 o'clock. How much? <laughs> it's five, ten minutes after ten. That's not long enough. I gotta stay here a while. 
Okay, suit yourself. I'm going home. Hey, we haven't finished talking. As far as I'm concerned, we have. I, I want to I wanna tell you about Marge. Look, whatever you had to tell me about Marge, if you ever had, it's too late for you to make any sense tonight. Either you come with me now and I'll drop you home, or stay. Get as stoned as you want. I've got to stay. Just a little longer. Doesn't matter anymore. My hands, my feet, everything seemed like lead from the moment ten o'clock had passed. Before, I had been fired up, nervously tensed, hard put to act normal. Now the drinks meant nothing. I wanted to call it all back. I stumbled to my feet. I rushed out of the bar. In the cab, back to the house, I had all sorts of fantasies. Sometimes when the clock got overwound, it would stop. If it hadn't struck ten, maybe my father was still alive. And the other fear, how did I expect my amateur hypnosis would work? In the house, empty. I was conscious of the echo of its size for the first time. Through the hall, up the big staircase... Down the hall to my father's room. Everything seemed to echo. Carefully, I opened the door to my father's room and listened. No sound. I went in. I looked at my father where he lay. Lit by a lamp on the far wall over the dressing table. The first thing I was conscious of was that he was breathing. When I saw the carving knife on the floor, it was instinctive to pick it up. It was bright silver and stainless steel, glittering in the corner lamp. There was no trace of blood. He wasn't dead. And I knew I would have to do this by myself. By myself. There never had been any other way. So I came to the bed. Lifting the knife up high to drive it home. And suddenly his eyes were open. Looking at me. Recognizing what was about to happen. In one convulsive shrug towards me. His eyes glazed over. But in that last moment he said. You always wanted me dead. Dead. So. Strike. Strike for all the good it will do you. So he's dead, as you wanted him to be. I don't have to listen to you. Oh, yes, you'd better listen to me. What you tried to do to your sister is beyond belief. She hated my father as much as I did. Your thumbnail psychology is about as successful as what you know about hypnotism. Oh, you put Marge to the acid test, and your hypnotic suggestion worked just as you planned it, up till the last moment. How do you know? Because your sister ran to me for help. At the last moment, she couldn't force herself to turn against love. Not for this one man, or me, or you... But just the fact that she was human and normal. And hate was no part of her. But love was. So she dropped the knife and ran to you. Well, you dropped it too, didn't you? When it came to the test, you could no more strike than Marge. Could you? I'll never know. He died before I had the chance. A massive stroke had caused my father's death before I had a chance to kill him. But if I wasn't guilty in fact, I certainly was in intention. And to achieve his death, I would have tried anything within my power. I was lucky to get off scot-free, I thought. And I direct that my entire estate be left to my beloved daughter Marjorie, subject to all the provisions to protect it and her from my son Mark. To whom, with all my heart, I leave nothing. Not one cent. As attorney for the estate, Mark, I'm going to make sure your father gets his wish. Oh, sure, big deal. You figure to marry the heiress. I figure to protect Marge from you 
as long as I live. If I thought I could wring your neck by myself and get away with it, I'd be happy to do it. Luckily, I don't have to worry. No dough, brother. Not a penny. Go pay your debts. Can one be hypnotized and led to kill? Certainly not from tonight's story. And highly doubtful, if not impossible, no matter who the subject might be. But just in case, I hope we have all learned that it is nothing to meddle with for the uninformed. Like all special areas in life, it should be used by the expert, only in cases of special need. It was some time before Marge and Jeff were married. But once they were, the shadows and cobwebs were wiped away. Mark was only a dark memory that would disintegrate in time as thoroughly as his corporal self, trapped in his cement boots in the shifting muck of the river bottom where he lies. Who sows the wind must reap the whirlwind. Our cast included Marcia Rod, Nick Pryor, Ira Lewis, and Stotts Cotsworth. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Anheuser Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. The preceding Mystery Theater program was furnished by the CBS Radio Network. I'm Fulton Lewis in the Mutual Broadcasting System studios in Washington, D.C. Now, my commentary. U.S. District Court Judge John Sarika today delayed proceedings on a White House motion to quash a special prosecutor's subpoena for more presidential tapes, in the judge's words, for the purpose of facilitating discussions leading to a possible compliance. Judge Sarika's brief announcement came after Special White House Counsel James St. Clair entered the judge's chambers, saying that he would ask for a delay in hopes of working out such a compromise. The judge postponed until Friday of this week the deadline for the special prosecutor's office to answer a motion from White House lawyer James St. Clair to quash a subpoena for 64 presidential conversations. St. Clair, you recall, went into court last week with a motion to stop the subpoena, and Judge Sirica originally had set today as the deadline for the prosecutor's response. The judge also delayed a hearing on St. Clair's motion originally scheduled for Wednesday until a week from today, next Monday. Before entering a conference with the other lawyers and Judge Sirica, Attorney St. Clair said that he had asked for a five-day delay to permit the special prosecutor and myself to see whether we can come to some accommodation. In filing his motion last week to quash the subpoena, St. Clair had indicated that the dispute over release of the tapes to the prosecutor might be carried all the way to the Supreme Court. In that filing, there was a formal claim of privilege signed personally by President Nixon, declaring that the conversations that were being sought are confidential conversations, quote, between a president and his close advisors, and it would be inconsistent with the public interest to produce those tapes. About 20 of the conversations in question, the, question, the conversations that have been demanded by Leon Jaworski, the special prosecutor, were among the talks for which the White House released transcripts last week. For those, the president said no claim of privilege was asserted. The Jaworski subpoenas were for conversations that started on June 20th of 1972. They span a period of time that finally ended on June 4th of 1973. The earliest date is just three days after the famous Watergate break-in at the Democratic Party National Headquarters. That was June 17th of 1972. The June 4th date 
is the day on which President Nixon listened to some of the Watergate tape recordings. The counsel of the president, J. Fred Buzzhart, testified before one of the Watergate grand juries today, but he refused to tell what that questioning was all about. He appeared before Watergate grand jury number three, which is investigating, among other things, the 18-and-a-half-minute gap in one of the key White House tapes. In his White House role, attorney Buzzhart had overall custody of the tapes at one point last year, and he testified extensively during a court hearing into the causes of the now-famous 18-and-a-half-minute gap and about two other tape recordings that the White House said never existed. There have been some reports in recent weeks that Buzz Hart still had a major say in just what recordings the president would yield to the special Watergate prosecutor and to the House Judiciary Committee, even though James St. Clair, of course, is now said to handle all Watergate legal matters for the president. The White House indicated today that the president's Watergate counsel, St. Clair, may not fight against the granting of immunity for administration witnesses that are called before the House Judiciary Committee. Press Secretary Ronald Siegler told reporters at a briefing that St. Clair told him earlier today that there appeared to be no problem in granting of immunity. Siegler added that the White House does not have a fixed position on that subject. He noted that it would be up to the committee to determine the question of immunity for witnesses who could tell what they know about Watergate-related matters. Michigan Republican Representative Edward Hutchinson, the ranking minority member of the Judiciary Panel, has already been quoted as saying that he would oppose granting immunity to any witnesses who testify before his committee during its impeachment inquiry. Asked if there has been any effect on the White House staff since the president released the transcripts of a number of White House conversations last week, Ziegler today replied, over the past month, there has been a hesitancy to make extensive notes or to put anything down on paper. Ziegler said the problem had not yet reached serious proportions, but he said it might if there were a breakdown in the principle of executive privilege. The president issued the transcripts in response to the Judiciary Committee's formal subpoena for the tapes of 42 presidential conversations. Herbert Kalmbach has testified of a midnight meeting at which he said a top dairy cooperative official was told that milk prices would be increased and that the White House wanted confirmation of a $2 million campaign pledge Kalmbach, of course, is a former campaign fundraiser for President Nixon. He has said in secret testimony that the session took place on March 24, 1971, in his suite at the Madison Hotel here in Washington. Milk price supports were increased just the following day. The White House has said that the president's milk price order was not in any way influenced by the promise of campaign contributions from the dairy cooperative. The alleged meeting, which took place after a Republican fundraising dinner attended by dozens of dairy cooperative officials, included Kalmbach, Marie Chotner, and Harold Nelson, or at least so goes the Kalmbach testimony. Chotner had quit three weeks earlier as the president's special counsel and had just entered private law practice where he was receiving a retainer of $57,000 a year paid by the nation's largest dairy cooperative, the Associated Milk Producers Incorporated, Nelson was the chief executive officer of that cooperative. According to the testimony, Kalmbach swore that Chotner told Nelson that John Ehrlichman, who was the president's chief domestic advisor at that time, wanted Nelson to reaffirm the milk producer's promise of $2 million in light of a in milk, uh, milk price increase that the president had just directed. Kalmbach said that Nelson agreed. The next day, the administration made its public announcement of the price increase of 27 cents per hundred weight, which added hundreds of millions of dollars to the income of dairy farmers around the nation. Kalmbach's testimony was given about six weeks ago to two investigators for the Senate Watergate Committee, Alan Weitz and David Dorson. They said that this testimony, along with other unspecified evidence, provides the basis for a letter which lawyers for the House Judiciary Committee sent to the White House back on April 19th. That letter intended to state facts showing the impeachment investigators' need for 45 presidential tape recordings about the milk fund affair was made public just last Friday. It said, among other things, that on March 24th, 1971, quote, Mr. Murray Chotner stated to several dairymen that Mr. Ehrlichman expected the dairy industry to reaffirm its $2 million commitment in light of a forthcoming increase in milk price supports. The White House has rebutted by saying that the president was aware of the dairyman's $2 million promise, 
because his aide, Charles Colson, had told him about it back in 1970. Colson has been identified as the main contact in the White House for Nelson and, indeed, for other dairy cooperative officials. The White House, though, has vigorously denied that the president's decision to raise prices was in any way influenced by that promise of money. He was influenced, the White House has declared, by traditional political considerations, including pressure from Democrats on Capitol Hill, Democrats who themselves wanted a price increase. Secretary of State Henry Kissinger and Soviet Foreign Minister Andrei Gromyko have arranged to meet tomorrow on the island of Cyprus, the purpose to discuss their search for an end to the Middle East war insofar as the current hostilities on the Israeli-Syrian front are concerned. Plans for that meeting were announced in Moscow and by a State Department spokesman traveling with Kissinger. Ambassador Robert McCloskey said that Kissinger and Gromyko will also confer on other East-West topics, including chances for a new treaty limiting offensive nuclear weapons. Theater. Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. Fear, it may be said, is a malignancy which, once the seed is sown in the human soul, spreads like a voracious and all-consuming fungus throughout the psyche, smothering it at last in death. No one knew this better than the justly celebrated author Robert Louis Stevenson. No one has ever expressed it more vividly, more frighteningly, than he, in his story, The Suicide Club. Our mystery drama, The Suicide Club, was especially adapted from the Robert Louis Stevenson classic for the Mystery Theater by George Lothar and stars Barry Nelson. What is it? What is it within most of us, perhaps all of us, that compels us to do this or that? What drives the alcoholic to take that first drink he knows will lead to drunkenness and almost certainly eventual death? What spurs a compulsive gambler to bet again and again, aware always that in the end it can only bring him to ruin? That was a question Victor Harris often asked himself, but could never answer, until a certain fatal night when he met a man who called himself John Smith. Well, your health, Mr. Harris. Yours, Mr. Smith, I think you said. <laughs> as good a name as the other. So why did you invite me for this drink, Mr. Smith? It isn't customary, you know. More often than not, the strangers one meets at poker games remain strangers. Why? You interest me, Mr. Harris. In fact, you intrigue me. Oh. The last hand we played, everyone else had dropped out, leaving just you and me. I admired the way you played. I admired your nerve. More than anything else, I admired your coolness. Your indifference when you lost. $37,000, Mr. Harris. $37,000. Your admiration is misplaced. Cool, indifferent, why not? $37,000 is nothing to me. I'm a millionaire, Mr. Smith. Oh, are you? Several times over. Well, then, losing that much would mean little to you, if anything at all. Where's the thrill in winning or losing? There isn't any. Not for me. Not anymore. Then what point is there in play? None. None whatever. Gambling of any kind bores me. But I go on because... Well, Mr. Smith, I'm what is called a compulsive gambler. I see. What would you say if I were to tell you that I can change your boredom into a thrill the like of which you have never experienced before? There's a price tag, of course. What is the nature of this thrill that you're talking about? I'm talking about what might be called the Supreme Gamble, Mr. Harris. The Supreme Gamble? Yes. 
That sounds like a matter of life and death. It does, doesn't it? Is it? You're a gambler, Mr. Harris, and a compulsive gambler at that. I think you'll be willing to gamble an hour or two of your time to find out. Here's my card. I'll be expecting you at this address tomorrow night. 7.30 sharp. Suppose I don't show. Why, then, you'll never know what the supreme gamble is. And you'll go on being bored. Yes? My name's Harris. Victor Harris. I believe Mr. Smith is expecting me. Yes, he is. Come in. This way, Mr. Harris. Mr. Victor Harris, sir. Thank you, Lucas. Good to see you again, Mr. Harris. We'll join you in a few moments, Lucas. This, Mr. Harris, is the game room. In this room, every night, Saturday and Sunday accepted, the Supreme Gamble takes place. But what is the Supreme Gamble? First, Tell me what you see. Why, a room. Large room, tastefully and expensively decorated in 18th century style. And that large round table covered with a green cloth looks like a card table. That's what it is. And the people in evening dress, men in black tie, women gown, all drinking champagne. Their faces. Look at their faces. Look closely. Well, what do you see? Why, their faces, they're all of them excited about something I can see. Yes, they they all look as if, well, as if they're expecting something very exciting to happen at any moment. They are. But not at any moment. Not until eight sharp. What happens at eight sharp? (laughs) That you'll find out at eight sharp. In the meantime, let me introduce you to one or two members of our club. Oh? It's a club? Yes. A very select club, Mr. Harris. Oh, Mr. Malthus, may I introduce Mr. Harris, a new member? How do you do? How do you do? Correction, though, I'm not a new member yet. (laughs) He will be, Mr. Malthus. He will be. Uh, See you a minute, Director. Of course, Lucas. Uh, Excuse me, gentlemen. Lucas called Mr. Smith director. Yes. We all do. He's the director of our little club. I see. Uh, Mr. Malthus, what kind of club is this? You don't know? No. Then why are you here? To tell you the truth, I'm not exactly sure, except... Well, Mr. Smith, your director, promises I'll experience the thrill of my life, the supreme gamble, he calls it. (laughs) It is that, Mr. Harris. These people, you, you're here because you like to gamble. Oh, no. No, no, not at all. I don't in the least like to gamble. No, I'm here because I'm a coward. A coward? What do you mean? Just that. I'm a coward. I'm afraid of... Well, I see you two have become acquainted. But I'll take our new guest away from you now, Malthus. I see Iris Lorne sitting all by herself as usual. Come along, Harris. I'll introduce you. You Wish me luck tonight, Director. I do indeed, Malthus. I do indeed. Iris, let me introduce our latest member, Mr. Victor Harris. I'm not a member, Mr. Smith. Director... Call me director from now on. No offense, but I'll call you what I please until I am a member. If I am... I doubt that you will be, Mr. Harris. Why, Iris, what do you mean? Just what I say. He doesn't look like one of (laughs) us. Oh, but he is. In a different way, for a different reason. I'll leave you two together. I've got to prepare a fresh deck of cards. Uh... I don't think I got your last name, Miss, uh, Mrs. Miss uh, Iris Lorne. 
Well, you said that I don't look like one of you. You don't. Where's the difference? Your eyes. In your eyes. <laughs> that seems to puzzle you, Mr. Harris. Look into my eyes. Look deep. What do you see? Sadness. Yes. Great sadness. The sadness of... Of... Death. Death? I'm dead, Mr. Harris. I've been dead for years. Oh, I'm afraid I don't uh, understand. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, your attention. It is time. Gather around the table, please. Our director will now deal the cards. <laughs> to Mr. Cranes, the two of hearts. To Mr. Shaw, the Eight of Diamonds. Mrs. Harper receives the Four of Clubs. Next card to Mr. Burke, the Nine of Spades. Miss Russell, this time. Next card to Mr. Wolfson. The Ace of Spades. Oh. Oh, this is a yeah. Since Mr. Morley has already drawn the Ace of Clubs, the game is ended. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mr. Wilson, Mr. Morley, I will see you both in my office as soon as I've completed my business with Mr. Harris. This way, Mr. Harris. Oh, Lucas. Champagne all around as usual. Yes, director. Well, sit down, Mr. Harris. Drink? Thanks, no. Just tell me, what's this all about? Have you ever thought of committing suicide? No, I've never thought seriously of suicide. Well, many do, you know. Think of it seriously, that is. And some of these, quite a few, do take their own lives. But you'd be amazed, Mr. Harris at how many people there are in the world who want to kill themselves. In fact, yearn to kill themselves, but haven't the nerve to do it. So, we do it for them. You, to put it more aptly, we arrange it for them once they become members of the club. The suicide club, we call it. Think of the gamble, Mr. Harris. The supreme gamble of your life. Think of the thrill of each night, staking your life on the turn of a card. Not a momentary thrill, but one that will make each day worth living because it may be your last. The ace of spades. The ace of clubs. Simple. Whoever in each nightly deal receives the ace of spades is killed. Everything, of course, is arranged to make his or her death appear accidental. The ace of spades. The person killed. The ace of clubs. The one who does the killing. Then one is the victim. The other is murderer. Huh. You spoke uh, of a fee. Unnecessary evil, I'm afraid. The club's overhead is high. Extremely high. Accordingly, so is the fee. Which is? Half your estate. Half of what you own. Half? That may sound unreasonable to you at first, but it all balances out, you see. What I mean is, there are members of the Suicide Club who have large estates, vast wealth. But at the other extreme, there are some who have virtually no estate, no money at all. Miss Lorne, for example. Iris, you met her. Practically penniless. She was quite well-to-do when she joined some time ago, but luck, the cards, has been against her. And in the meantime, she has spent everything she had on her habit. Drugs. She's a... She's a drug addict. Which is why she wants to die. It's the only solution to her problem. What a shame. She's so lovely. Her life could be so worth living. But isn't. Not anymore. Well, now, Mr. Harris. I promised you the greatest thrill you've ever had. 
I promise to cure your boredom with life for the remainder of your life. I'm ready to keep that promise with, as I said last night, the supreme gamble. Sign here. I, uh... Yes? I, I'd like to think it over. You I... know what your decision will be. You're a compulsive gambler, Mr. Harris. Whether you join the suicide club now or later, you will join. I know it. You know it. To be bored is to be dead, as you so well know. Why not live a little? Why not sign? Now? Why not? Yes. Why not? Compulsion, psychiatrists say, is another word for decision. Deep in the very core of his being, a person has made a decision that gambling, drinking, whatever may be ruining his life, is somehow necessary to his happiness. Bored, weary of a life of compulsive gambling which has lost its stimulation, Victor Harris, wealthy man about town, has joined the Suicide Club. Other members have joined because they want to end their jaded lives, but cannot bring themselves to do so. And so, it must be done for them. Victor's reason is different. A gambler who cannot stop himself from gambling, he has decided to take the supreme gamble. His life on the turn of a card. Your first night, Harris. Bon chance. Good luck. I'm not uh, quite sure how to take that, Mr. Uh, beg pardon? Director. I'm staking my life on the turn of a card. I grant you I'm, I'm a compulsive gambler, but my life? I wasn't quite prepared for anything like that when I came here for the first time last night. I hope you're prepared now. We play in less than five minutes. Why not wander about, become better acquainted with your fellow members? I'll do that. Oh, and by the way, it's customary for new members to order champagne for everyone. Oh, well, I'll be more than glad to. Uh... Lucas, champagne all around. On Mr. Harris. Yes, Director. See you at the table, Harris. Yes. Miss Lorne. May I join you? Oh, Mr. Harris. Please do. So, you did join. Yeah, even though you said that I wouldn't. I didn't say that. I said that you shouldn't. But even when I said it, you had no choice. No choice? <laughs> Once you accept our director's invitation to pay this place a visit, you've had it. There's no turning back. No way. Why not? You'll find out I did. What do you mean? He doesn't run this place for kicks. Or maybe he does, in a way. But what he's really after is your money. And according to the grapevine, oh, <laughs> we have one here, too. You've got plenty. Well, according to the grapevine, you have none. You're penniless. Now, yes. I was worth well over a hundred thousand when I joined almost six months ago. And? Oh, well, a lot of it. I don't know how much. I, I don't keep count. Went for heroin. Well, of course you know I'm on dope. Yes. And I'm sorry. You? Sorry? <laughs> for me? You're hooked as badly as I am. On gambling, they say. I'm afraid that's the truth. A habit. You can't kick. Just as I can't kick mine. Look, Miss Lorne, Iris, if I may. I made a decision to join the suicide club last night. I can make the decision to leave it, too. Can you? Well, of course I can. Why do you say... Uh... <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, your attention. It is time. Gather around the table, please. Our director will now deal the cards. 
tray of spades to Mr. Dowling. For you, Mrs. Cranes, the four of clubs. For Mr. Malthus. For Mr. Malthus, the ace of spades. Oh. I've won at last. Mr. I've won. I've won. Mr. Malthus, remember the club rules. Control, Mr. Malthus. But Control. I've won. This will be my last night on earth. After all this time, my last night. Mr. Malthus. I beg pardon, Director. I truly beg pardon. Let us go on. Mr. Robinson, eight of diamonds. Miss Feitson, two of spades. Mr. Whalen, nine of hearts. Mr. Harris? Ah, Mr. Harris, your first supreme gamble. Yes. What card shall it be, do you think? Here it lies on top of the deck. What shall it be? Well, it can't be the ace of spades. True. Well, what is it? I don't know. I haven't looked. Enjoy yourself, Mr. Harris. Feel. Feel the excitement of not knowing. Live. Live the supreme thrill of wondering. What is this next card? Turn it. Why don't I put it aside and draw the others? Turn that card. As you wish. It's a club, Mr. Harris. The ace of clubs. Oh, Mr. Malthus, Mr. Harris, you will join me in my office in five minutes. I'm no murderer. You wanted a thrill. You're about to find, I'm afraid. Be seated, please. You there, Mr. Malthus. Yes. <clears throat> Mr. Harris, here. Uh, when shall it be, Director? When is my moment to come? How shall it be done? And where? Patience, Mr. Malthus. Patience. Your uh, suicide will take place tonight at approximately 10.30. Is that satisfactory? Oh, yes. Yes, indeed. Good. Now, here are your instructions and a map to go along with them. This straight line represents the Uptown Express platform of the IRT subway at 42nd Street. Yes. This arrow indicates the direction from which the Uptown Express train will come into mm -hmm, the station. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. At 10.30 tonight, you are to stand at precisely this spot that I've marked with an X. <laughs> X marks the spot. Mm, yes. Now, the platform will be filled with the after-theater crowd. You will take up your position at this spot and stand at the very edge of the platform. Clear? Very. Goodbye, Mr. Malthus. And Godspeed. Goodbye. And thank you for all you've done. And now, Mr. Harris? I have no intention of going through with this. I'm no murderer. Of course not. When you push Malthus in front of that train... You'll not be murdering him. You'll be doing him a service. Like all our members, he wants to die. But he hasn't the nerve to kill himself. You will simply be doing it for him. And that, as I see it, is not murder. I see it differently. That's too bad, Mr. Harris. I'm sorry, but frankly, there's nothing you can do about it. Oh, I think there is. I'm resigning from your club right now. Goodbye. Mr. Harris, no one resigns from the Suicide Club. No one ever has. No one ever will. I couldn't possibly run that risk. You have my assurance that I'd never say a word about... Assurance. Assurances. What are assurances to me? No, Mr. Harris, there's only one assurance you can give me that I can possibly accept. Your death. Or, more properly, your suicide. This is... Madness. Perhaps. But if it is, it's only another form of madness, Mr. Harris. Like, say, uh, compulsive gambling. Well, I won't argue with you further. No, you won't. I've had enough of your argument. You know what you have to do tonight. 
You know where and when. Do it. I... Do it, Mr. Harris. For if you don't, I promise you'll wish you had. And as you already know, I keep the promises I make. Mr. Malthus. Mr. Malthus? What? Mr. Harris, you're just in time. The express will be along in a minute or two. Listen to me. We really shouldn't be seen talking together. Just stand behind me, and when the right moment comes... Listen to me. I'm not going to kill you. You're not? I can't. Well, you must. I can't do it either. Why do you think you're here? To save you if I can. Well, save me. You don't want to do this. You don't really want to take your life. You're crazy. Of course I want to do it. But I can't. I haven't the nerve. You must do it. You must. No. No, we'll go somewhere and talk. Talk? The, tr- the train. You can see the lights far down in the tunnel. It's coming. It's coming. Oh, you will do it, won't you? I can't. I've got to get away from here. I've got to get away. Victor? Victor Harris. Harris. What are you doing here? I followed you. Why? Because I had this feeling. <laughs> on the nerve to do it himself. No, Mr. Harris, I didn't. You? Lucas, you shoved him? The director figured you'd lose your nerve. It happens sometimes, and when it does, <laughs> I take over. Well, see you, and you, Miss Lauren, at the club tomorrow night. Eight sharp, as usual. You got it wrong, Lucas. You won't see me tomorrow night or any other night. You got it wrong, Mr. Harris. If you don't show up tomorrow night, there won't be any other night. Not for you or Miss Lauren. As Victor Harris watches Lucas vanish quickly into the crowd, surely he begins to realize what his compulsion to gamble has brought him to. To what? Why, to certain death, wouldn't you say? I would. You. Yes. You, listening to my voice, are Victor Harris. Or, depending on gender, Iris Lorne. If you are Victor, you join the Suicide Club for a thrill. If you are Iris... You joined because you were sick of life and wanted someone to do for you what you could not do for yourself. Commit suicide. Kill you. But whether you are Victor or Iris, you begin to wonder if you've made a mistake. A fatal mistake. Now that it's too late. And so now, Victor, Iris, you are in a secluded cocktail lounge. Iris, I... I don't understand. What more can I say? I've made it plain enough. I followed you, Victor, because I... I couldn't bring myself to believe you'd kill Mr. Malthus. And intended to stop me if I tried. Now, that, that's what I... I don't understand. Why did you intend to stop me? Well? You won't believe me. Try me. I love you. <laughs> I told you you wouldn't believe me. Well, it is a, a little hard to believe. We, we only met last night. In fact, we we haven't spent much more than, well, 20 minutes at most in each other's company. Well, how long does it take to fall in love? I, uh, I don't know. I do. I found out when I met you last night. You don't believe me, do you? I, I believe you mean what you say, but... But uh, what? Look, we're both compulsive personalities. With me, it's gambling. With you, drugs. That means neither of us is totally in control of ourselves. I love you, Victor Harris. It's as simple as that. And that's all there is. I love you. Well, I... I'm honored. And flattered. Iris, I mean that. I... But I... I'm afraid I don't feel the same way about you. Oh, that's all right? No. No. It isn't all right. I wish... 
I wish. Oh, well, what's the sense of talking about what I wish or don't wish or anything? We're in trouble, Iris. Real trouble. And what we'd better start talking about is how to get ourselves out of it if we can. Do you think we can? We can sure try. We'd better try. It's that or death. Waiter? Check, please. What are you going to do? The only thing I can do. Go to the police. Well, Lieutenant, that's the whole story. Mm-hmm. You don't sound as if you believed us, Lieutenant. Tell me something, Miss Long. How long you been mainlining? Mainlining? You know what I mean? It's written all over you. Your eyes, the nose twitching, the long sleeve dress. Pull up that sleeve and let's have a look. It's no need. It's true. Okay. What about you? Me? What are you on? Uppers, downers, mescaline? I'm not on anything. I'm no drug addict. Look, Lieutenant. Sounds like a pipe dream. A suicide club. Now, Mr. Harris, I've heard some far-out stories, but yours is... It's out of space. I see. In other words, you don't intend to do anything. We'll uh, check it out, but a word of advice? Yes? You and her. Kick the habit and try to get your feet back down on Earth. Huh? Oh, We've got to go to my place. Oh, we're staying right here in this church till I oh. figure out our next move. I've got to have the fix. I'm going out of my skull. It's that bad. Oh, you, you just don't know. Vic, I've been almost 24 hours without one. We've been running all day. Central Park, Radio City Music Hall, now this... Church. We couldn't go to my place or yours. The director, Lucas, they're sure to be looking for us. I can't stand it. I can't. You don't have to, Miss Law. What? Lucas. Right here in the pew behind you, Mr. Harris. Here, Miss Law. It's just the skin pop, but it'll hold you to eat. Oh, give it to me. Give it to me. Uh... Oh, no. Something I... wrong? Not in a church. I won't. Not in a church. <laughs> Suit yourself. Let's go. The director is waiting. You heard me, you two. Come on, Iris. And Iris. Yeah. Good girl. Mr. Harrison, Miss Lorne, director. Come in, come in. I was a bit worried about you two. Going to the police, revealing all about our intimate little club. How do you know that we... Had a visit today from a Lieutenant McPhee. He didn't mention you by name, but I have reason to suspect you know him. Big fellow, 6'2", shoulders like an ox. And not very bright, I'm afraid. Not very bright at all. Lucas showed him about. I couldn't be bothered. Lucas, tell them what happened. Nothing happened. I showed him around... Just a private residence. What else? As you say, what else? Well, now, champagne for you, Mr. Harris. And this for you, Miss Lorne. I don't want your champagne. And she doesn't want that. Do you, Iris? Why not? Why shouldn't I? I'm dying for it. Then here, my dear. Iris, no. Oh, Vic. Iris, no. Please. I can't help it. I'm all alone. I've been alone and I need... I need something to comfort me. Come here. Into my arms. Come. Come. I'll comfort you, my darling. I'll comfort you. Well, well, how touching. How all together. I don't think I've ever seen anything like this since the, since the suicide club opened. Have you, Lucas? No. No, I haven't. However, life must go on, or to be precise, death. And it is time for our evening ritual. Come, Miss Lorne, Mr. Harris. Our little game of cards awaits us. For 
uh, Mr. Dowling, the five of diamonds. Mr. Whalen, the nine of hearts. Mrs. Lawton, the ace of diamonds. Mr. Whalen, the deuce of spades. For Miss Lorne, Iris, the ace of clubs. Oh, oh Victor. Daddy. Oh. For Miss Fightson, oh. the eight of hearts. Mr. Hanson, the ten of hearts. For Mr. Harris, the ace of spades. Oh. Oh. That ends the play for this evening. Miss Lorne and Mr. Harris will join me in my office, please. Victor, I feel sick. I think, I think I'm going to say... Miss Lorne, wait. Where are you going? To the powder room, you fool. She's sick. Mrs. Lawton, do what you can for her. In my office, Mr. Harris. Well, now, Mr. Harris. It appears that Dame Fortune has frowned on you tonight. Regrettably, you have just experienced the final gambling thrill of your young life. You arranged it, didn't you? We, you felt it. Now, now. Manners, Mr. Harris. No name-calling, please. Smith, you're not going through with this. Oh, yes? I don't intend to die tonight or any other night for a long, long time. I'm resigning from this insanity you call a club. And so is Miss Lorne. You know, really, if I hadn't the slightest idea you were going to be this wearisome, I'd not have let you join in the first place. I have already told you that we have but one form of resignation from the suicide club. Death. Well, let me just tell you... Enough. Your instructions are to leave here immediately and return to that elegant penthouse apartment of yours. (laughs) Go to your apartment and stay there. And, oh, yes, if you have any idea of seeking help, such as going to the police or anything of that nature, don't. You will be very closely watched from the moment you leave. And any attempt to disobey my orders will result not only in your death, but Iris Lawrence as well. Oh, Victor, what can we do? Your instructions. Just, just how are you to kill me? Kill you? I could never kill you, you know that. But... What instructions? Just to come here and wait. That was all. That settles it. They're going to kill us both. What makes you think? I was followed until I got here. The first thing I did was to call the police or try to. The phone's dead. I had a gun in my desk drawer. It's gone. They'd been here and they didn't miss a trick. And now just telling you to wait. All right, we're trapped. Oh, dear Lord. Hang on now. We're going to the police. Oh, we'll never get there. I was followed here, just as you were. They're watching our every move. We can give it a try. It's a gamble. Oh, Victor. But... Got... I just lost. God, what are we going to do? What can we do? We won't answer. No, we... That won't do any good. They've got a key. I'm sure. Now, look. Look, there's just one chance. You answer the door. I'll stand behind it. Well, Lord knows, I'm not much when it comes to fighting, but I can try. Go ahead. Open it. Thank you, Miss Lorne. (laughs) I was just about to use my key. Okay, I come in? I can't stop you, Lucas. No, you can't. And how about you coming out from behind the door, Mr. Harris? (laughs) Wouldn't have done you any good anyhow. You're no match for me. It might have been worth a try. The director has given me his orders, and I'm here to carry them out. Everything can be done fast and easy if you cooperate. And if we don't, don't give me a hard time, Mr. Harris, please. You got the ace of spades tonight. Miss Lorne got the ace of clubs. Following the club rules, Miss Lorne kills you. And this time we make sure it looks like suicide. I won't do it. I won't do it. You'll do it. Or there's going to be one little change, one little difference tonight. After you kill Mr. Harris, <laughs> after he commits suicide, you might say, you're going to commit suicide, too. What do you mean? Let's all go into the kitchen and find out. Why the kitchen? That's where the stove is. The gas stove. Oh, no. Oh, no. Move, no. Miss Lorne. Look, Lucas, look, you're being stupid. One suicide, the police will buy that. 
But two... You never heard of a suicide pact between lovers? <laughs> says so right here. See? What? That's the suicide note you're leaving. See, it's typed, but signed, Iris Lawrence. Victor Harris. Their signatures. How did they forge them? The contracts we signed. Just put the note on the table there, hmm? Uh, no, no, no. Don't just toss it there. Fold it neatly and... Oh, oh you... Oh. One chomp at the back of the neck. Oh. He'll be out a long time. In fact, he won't be coming back. Oh. And now, Miss Lorne, turn on the gas. No! Miss Lorne... I won't do it. I can't... <laughs> Let's see now. Drag her into his arms. Put his arm around her. Like so. Good. All we need now is the gas. again with the oxygen. Hmm. Okay, Mr. Harris, snap uh, out of it. Uh, uh, Come on now. What? 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 Breathe deep. Come on now. Deep. Ah, boy. That's the way. Iris. She's coming around fine. Going to be okay, just like you. Lieutenant McPhee, is that? Yeah. Well, how did you... <laughs> I'm not as dumb as I look or act, Mr. Harris. I kind of put it on, you know, an act. Throw a lot of characters off their guard that way. Smith didn't fool you. No, I fooled him. When that guy Lucas took me on a tour of the house, I saw a lot more than he thought I saw. Well, what could you have seen? That big round table in the middle of the room. Oh, there was a vase of flowers on it and like that, but... There's a circle worn in the rug around the table, and nobody admires flowers that much, Mr. Harris. Oh, and oh, yeah, I uh, checked the sanitation boys and heard about the dozens and dozens of empty champagne bottles they picked up three times a week. All that, plus the accidental death of Mr. Malthus, as you described it. Oh, sure, I checked on that, of course. Well... It all added up. You, uh... You had us followed. You and the lady have been tailed practically since you left headquarters. Uh, uh, okay, Eddie. She's had enough. Uh, uh, Come on, little lady. Uh, Come on. Come on now. What? Oh, Victor. Iris. Oh. Iris. She's going to be okay. Oh. Well, by the way, Mr. Harris, you'll be glad to know we got a confession out of Lucas and Smith. That's the end of the Suicide Club. Oh, it's the end of something else, too. Yeah? What? My compulsive gambling. I'll never make another bet as long as I live. Victor Harris never did gamble again. The Suicide Club cured him of that. And, oh yes, it cured Iris Lorne of drug addiction. Although I'm not so sure it wasn't having someone to live for, someone to love. They're married now. Victor never had a chance. Comes to that, what man has? Our cast included Barry Nelson, Marion Seldes, John Barragray, Dan Ockle, and Lloyd Batista. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. Preceding mystery theater program is furnished by the CBS Radio Network. This is W.O.R. New York and RKO General Station. It's 8 o'clock. Here's John Scott with the news. Tune in to nostalgia. Tune in to now. Golden Radio Hour.